Volume One of the Mysterious Island Shipwrecked in the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter One The Hurricane of 1865. Cries in the Air. A Balloon Caught by a Water Spout. Only the Sea in Sight five passengers what took place in the basket land ahead the end are we going up again no on the contrary we're going down worse than that mr smith we are falling for god's sake throw over all the ballast the last sack is empty and the balloon rises again no i hear the splashing waves the sea is under us it is not five hundred feet off then a strong clear voice shouted overboard with all we have and god help us such were the words which rang through the air above the vast wilderness of the pacific toward four o'clock in the afternoon on the twenty third of march eighteen sixty five doubtless no one has forgotten that terrible northeast gale which vented its fury during the equinox of that year it was a hurricane lasting without intermission from the eighteenth to the twenty sixth of march covering a space of eighteen hundred miles drawn obliquely to the equator between the thirty-five degrees of north latitude and forty degrees south it occasioned immense destruction both in america and europe and asia cities in ruins forests uprooted shores devastated by the mountains of water hurled upon them hundreds of shipwrecks large tracts of territory desolated by the water spouts which destroyed everything in their path thousands of persons crushed to the earth or engulfed in the sea such were the witnesses to its fury left behind by this terrible hurricane it surpassed in disaster those storms which ravaged havana and guadalupe in eighteen ten and eighteen twenty five while these catastrophes were taking place upon the land and the sea a scene not less thrilling was enacting in the disordered heavens a balloon caught in the whirl of a column of air borne like a ball on the summit of a water-spout spinning around as in some aerial whirlpool rushed through space with a velocity of ninety miles per hour below the balloon dimly visible through the dense vapour mingled with spray which spread over the ocean swung a basket containing five persons from whence came this aerial traveller the sport of the awful tempest evidently it could not have been launched during the storm and the storm had been raging five days its symptoms manifesting themselves on the eighteenth it must therefore have come from a great distance as it could not have traversed less than two thousand miles in twenty-four hours the passengers indeed had been unable to determine the course traversed as they had nothing with which to calculate their position and it was a necessary effect that though borne along in the midst of this tempest they were unconscious of its violence they were whirled and spun about and carried up and down without any sense of motion their vision could not penetrate the thick fog massed together under the balloon around them everything was obscure the clouds were so dense that they could not tell the day from the night no reflection of light no sound from the habitations of men no roaring of the ocean had penetrated that profound obscurity in which they were suspended during their passage through the upper air only on their rapid descent had they become conscious of the danger threatening them by the waves meanwhile the balloon disencumbered of the heavy articles such as munitions arms and provisions had risen to a height of four thousand five hundred feet and the passengers having discovered that the sea was beneath them and realizing that the dangers above were less formidable than those below did not hesitate to throw overboard everything no matter how necessary at the same time endeavouring to lose none of that fluid the soul of the apparatus which sustained them above the abyss the night passed in the midst of dangers that would have proved fatal to souls less courageous and with the coming of day the hurricane showed signs of abatement at dawn the emptied clouds rose high into the heavens and in a few hours more the whirlwind had spent its force the wind from a hurricane had subsided into what sailors would call a three-reef breeze toward eleven o'clock the lower strata of the air had lightened visibly the atmosphere exhaled that humidity which is noticeable after the passage of great meteors 
it did not seem as if the storm had moved westward but rather as if it was ended perhaps it had flowed off in electric sheets after the whirlwind had spent itself as in the case with the typhoon in the indian ocean now however it became evident that the balloon was again sinking slowly but surely it seemed also as if it was gradually collapsing and that its envelope was lengthening and passing from a spherical into an oval form it held fifty thousand cubic feet of gas and therefore whether soaring to a great height or moving along horizontally it was able to maintain itself for a long time in the air in this emergency the voyagers threw overboard the remaining articles which weighted down the balloon the few provisions they had kept and everything they had in their pockets while one of the party hoisted himself into the ring to which was fastened the cords of the net and endeavoured to closely tie the lower end of the balloon but it was evident that the gas was escaping and that the voyagers could no longer keep the balloon afloat they were lost there was no land not even an island visible beneath them the wide expanse of ocean offered no point of rest nothing upon which they could cast anchor it was a vast sea on which the waves were surging with incomparable violence it was the limitless ocean limitless even to them from their commanding height it was a liquid plain lashed and beaten by the hurricane until it seemed like a circuit of tossing billows covered with a network of foam not even a ship was in sight in order therefore to save themselves from being swallowed up by the waves it was necessary to arrest this downward movement let it cost what it might and it was evidently to the accomplishment of this that the party were directing their efforts but in spite of all they could do the balloon continued to descend though at the same time moving rapidly along with the wind toward the southwest it was a terrible situation this of these unfortunate men no longer masters of the balloon their efforts availed them nothing the envelope collapsed more and more and the gas continued to escape faster and faster they fell until at one o'clock they were not more than six hundred feet above the sea the gas poured out of a rent in the silk by lightening the basket of everything the party had been able to continue their suspension in the air for several hours but now the inevitable catastrophe could only be delayed and unless some land appeared before nightfall voyagers balloon and basket must disappear beneath the waves it was evident that these men were strong and able to face death not a murmur escaped their lips they were determined to struggle to the last second to retard their fall and they tried their last expedient the basket constructed of willow osiers could not float and they had no means of supporting it on the surface of the water it was two o'clock and the balloon was only four hundred feet above the waves then the voice was heard the voice of a man whose heart knew no fear responded to by others not less strong everything is thrown out no we have ten thousand francs in gold a heavy bag fell into the sea does the balloon rise a little but it will soon fall again is there nothing else we could get rid of not a thing yes there is there is the basket catch hold of the net then and let it go the cords which attached the basket to the hoop were cut and the balloon as the former fell into the sea rose again two thousand feet this was indeed the last means of lightening the apparatus the five passengers had clambered into the net around the hoop and clinging to its meshes looked into the abyss below every one knows the statical sensibility of a balloon it is only necessary to relieve it of the lightest object in order to have it rise the apparatus floating in the air acts like a mathematical balance one can readily understand then that when disencumbered of every weight relatively great its upward movement will be sudden and considerable it was thus in the present instance but after remaining poised for a moment at its height the balloon began to descend it was impossible to repair the rent through which the gas was rushing and the men having done everything they could do must look to god for succor at four o'clock when the balloon was only five hundred feet above the sea the loud barking of a dog holding itself crouched beside its master in the meshes of the net was heard top has seen something cried one and immediately afterwards another shouted land land the balloon which the wind had continued to carry towards the southwest had since dawn passed over a distance of several hundred miles 
and a high land began to be distinguishable in this direction but it was still thirty miles to leeward and even supposing they did not drift it would take a full hour to reach it an hour before that time could pass would not the balloon be emptied of what gas remained this was the momentous question the party distinctly saw that solid point which they must reach at all hazards they did not know whether it was an island or a continent as they were uninformed to what part of the world the tempest had hurried them but they knew that this land whether inhabited or deserted must be reached at four o'clock it was plain that the balloon could not sustain itself much longer it grazed the surface of the sea and the crests of the higher waves several times lapped the base of the net making it heavier and like a bird with a shot in its wing could only half sustain itself a half hour later and the land was scarcely a mile distant but the balloon exhausted flabby hanging in wrinkles with only a little gas remaining in its upper portion unable to sustain the weight of those clinging to the net was plunging them into the sea which lashed them with its furious billows perhaps by this means it would reach the shore but when only two cables length away four voices joined in a terrible cry the balloon though seemingly unable to rise again after having been struck by a tremendous wave made a bound into the air as if it had been suddenly lightened of some of its weight it rose fifteen hundred feet and encountering a sort of eddy in the air instead of being carried directly to land it was drawn along in a direction nearly parallel thereto in a minute or two however it reapproached the shore in an oblique direction and fell upon the sand above the reach of the breakers the passengers assisting each other hastened to disengage themselves from the meshes of the net and the balloon relieved of their weight was caught up by the wind and like a wounded bird recovering for an instant disappeared into space the basket had contained five passengers and a dog and but only four had been thrown upon the shore the fifth one then had been washed off by the great wave which had struck the net and it was owing to this accident that the lighted balloon had been able to rise for the last time before falling upon the land scarcely had the four castaways felt the ground beneath their feet than all thinking of the one who was lost cried perhaps he is trying to swim ashore save him let us save him End of chapter one Chapter Two of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Two. An episode of the rebellion. The engineer Cyrus Smith. Gideon Spilett. The Negro Neb. The sailor Pencroff. The youth Herbert an unexpected proposal rendezvous at ten o'clock p m departure in the storm they were neither professional aeronauts nor amateurs in aerial navigation whom the storm had thrown upon this coast they were prisoners of war whose audacity had suggested this extraordinary manner of escape a hundred times they would have perished a hundred times their torn balloon would have precipitated them into the abyss had not providence preserved them for a strange destiny and on the twentieth of march after having flown from richmond besieged by the troops of general ulysses grant they found themselves seven thousand miles from the virginia capital the principal stronghold of the secessionists during that terrible war their aerial voyage had lasted five days let us see by what curious circumstances this escape of prisoners was effected an escape which resulted in the catastrophe which we have seen this same year in the month of february eighteen sixty five in one of those surprises by which general grant though in vain endeavored to take richmond many of his officers were captured by the enemy and confined within the city one of the most distinguished of those taken was a federal staff officer named cyrus smith cyrus smith was a native of massachusetts an engineer by profession and a scientist of the first order to whom the government had given during the war the direction of the railways which played such a great strategic part during the war a true yankee thin bony lean about forty-five years old with streaks of gray appearing in his close-cut hair and heavy moustache 
he had one of those fine classical heads that seem as if made to be copied upon medals bright eyes a serious mouth and the air of a practised officer he was one of these engineers who began of his own wish with the pick and shovel as there are generals who have preferred to rise from the ranks thus while possessing inventive genius he had acquired manual dexterity and his muscles showed remarkable firmness he was as much a man of action as of study he moved without effort under the influence of a strong vitality and his sanguine temperament defied all misfortunes highly educated practical clear-headed this temperament was superb and always retaining his presence of mind he combined in the highest degree the three conditions whose union regulates the energy of men activity of body strength of will and determination his motto might have been that of william of orange in the seventeenth century i can undertake without hope and persevere through failure cyrus smith was also the personification of courage he had been in every battle of the war after having begun under general grant with the illinois volunteers he had fought at paducah at belmont at pittsburg landing at the siege of corinth at port gibson at the black river at chattanooga at the wilderness upon the potomac everywhere with bravery a soldier worthy of the general who said i never counted my dead and a hundred times cyrus smith would have been among the number of those whom the terrible grant did not count but in these combats though he never spared himself fortune always favored him until the time he was wounded and taken prisoner at the siege of richmond at the same time with cyrus smith another important personage fell into the power of the southerners this was no other than the honorable gideon spilett reporter to the new york herald who had been detailed to follow the fortunes of the war with the armies of the south gideon spilett was of the race of astonishing chroniclers english or american such as stanley and the like who shrink from nothing in their endeavor to obtain exact information and to transmit it to their journal in the quickest manner the journals of the united states such as the new york herald are true powers and their delegates are persons of importance gideon spilett belonged in the first rank of these representatives a man of great merit energetic prompt and ready full of ideas having been all over the world soldier and artist vehement in counsel resolute in action thinking nothing of pain fatigue or danger when seeking information first for himself and afterwards for his journal a master of recondite information of the unpublished the unknown the impossible he was one of those cool observers who write amid the cannon balls reporting under the bullets and to whom all perils are welcome he also had been in all the battles in the front rank revolver in one hand and notebook in the other his pencil never trembling in the midst of a cannonade he did not tire the wires by incessant telegraphing like those who speak when they have nothing to say but each of his messages was short condensed clear and to the purpose for the rest he did not lack humor it was he who after the affair of black river wishing at any price to keep his place at the telegraph wicket in order to announce the result kept telegraphing for two hours the first chapters of the bible it cost the new york herald two thousand dollars but the new york herald had the first news gideon spilett was tall he was forty years old or more sandy colored whiskers encircled his face his eyes were clear lively and quick moving it was the eye of a man who was accustomed to take in everything at a glance strongly built he was tempered by all climates as a bar of steel is tempered by cold weather for ten years gideon spilett had been connected with the new york herald which he had enriched with his notes and his drawings as he wielded the pencil as well as the pen when captured he was making a description and a sketch of the battle the last words written in his notebook were these a southerner is aiming at me and and gideon spilett was missed so following the invariable custom he escaped unscratched cyrus smith and gideon spilett who knew each other only by reputation were both taken to richmond the engineer recovered rapidly from his wound and it was during his convalescence that he met the reporter the two soon learned to appreciate each other soon their one aim was to rejoin the army of grant and fight again in the ranks for the preservation of the union the two americans had decided to avail themselves of any chance 
but although free to go and come within the city richmond was so closely guarded that an escape might be deemed impossible during this time cyrus smith was rejoined by a devoted servant this man was a negro born upon the engineer's estate of slave parents whom smith an abolitionist by conviction had long since freed the negro though free had no desire to leave his master for whom he would have given his life he was a man of thirty years vigorous agile adroit intelligent quick and self-possessed sometimes ingenious always smiling ready and honest he was named nebuchadnezzar but he answered to the nickname of neb when neb learned that his master had been taken prisoner he left massachusetts without waiting a moment arrived before richmond and by a ruse after having risked his life twenty times he was able to get within the besieged city the pleasure of cyrus smith on seeing again his servant and the joy of neb in finding his master cannot be expressed but while he had been able to get into richmond it was much more difficult to get out as the watch kept upon the federal prisoners was very strict it would require an extraordinary opportunity in order to attempt an escape with any chance of success and that occasion not only did not present itself but it was difficult to make meanwhile grant continued his energetic operations the victory of petersburg had been vigorously contested his forces reunited to those of butler had not as yet obtained any result before richmond and nothing indicated an early release to the prisoners the reporter whose tiresome captivity gave him no item worthy of note grew impatient he had but one idea to get out of richmond at any risk many times indeed he tried the experiment and was stopped by obstacles insurmountable meanwhile the siege continued and as the prisoners were anxious to escape in order to join the army of grant so there were certain of the besieged no less desirous to be free to join the army of the secessionists and among these was a certain jonathan foster who was a violent southerner in truth the confederates were no more able to get out of the city than the federal prisoners as the army of grant invested it around the mayor of richmond had not for some time been able to communicate with general lee and it was of the highest importance to make the latter aware of the situation of the city in order to hasten the march of the rescuing army this jonathan foster had conceived the idea of passing over the lines of the besiegers in a balloon and arriving by this means in the confederate camp the mayor authorized the undertaking a balloon was made and placed at the disposal of foster and five of his companions they were provided with arms as they might have to defend themselves in descending and food in case their aerial voyage should be prolonged the departure of the balloon had been fixed for the eighteenth of march it was to start in the night and with a moderate breeze from the northeast the party expected to arrive at the quarters of general lee in a few hours but the wind from the northeast was not a mere breeze on the morning of the eighteenth there was every symptom of a storm and soon the tempest broke forth making it necessary for forster to defer his departure as it was impossible to risk the balloon and those whom it would carry to the fury of the elements the balloon inflated in the great square of richmond was all ready waiting for the first lull in the storm and throughout the city there was great vexation at the settled bad weather the night of the nineteenth and twentieth passed but in the morning the storm was only developed in intensity and the departure was impossible on this day cyrus smith was accosted in one of the streets of richmond by a man whom he did not know it was a sailor named pencroff aged from thirty-five to forty years strongly built much sunburned his eyes bright and glittering but with a good countenance this Pencroff was a Yankee who had sailed every sea and who had experienced every kind of extraordinary adventure that a two-legged being without wings could encounter. It is needless to say that he was of an adventurous nature, ready to dare anything and to be astonished at nothing. Pencroff, in the early part of this year, had come to Richmond on business, having with him Herbert Brown of New Jersey, a lad fifteen years old the son of pencroff's captain and an orphan whom he loved as his own child not having left the city at the beginning of the siege he found himself to his great displeasure blocked 
he also had but one idea to get out he knew the reputation of the engineer and he knew with what impatience that determined man chuffed at his restraint he did not therefore hesitate to address him without ceremony mr smith have you had enough of richmond the engineer looked fixedly at the man who spoke thus and who added in a low voice mr smith do you want to escape how answered the engineer quickly and it was evidently an inconsiderate reply for he had not yet examined the man who spoke mr smith do you want to escape who are you he demanded in a cold voice pencroff made himself known sufficient replied smith and but what means do you propose to escape by this idle balloon which is doing nothing and seems to me all ready to take us the sailor had no need to finish his sentence the engineer had understood all in a word he seized pencroff by the arm and hurried him to his house there the sailor explained his project which in truth was simple enough they risked only their lives in carrying it out the storm was at its height it is true but a skilful and daring engineer like smith would know well how to manage a balloon he himself would not have hesitated to have started had he known how with herbert of course he had seen many storms and he thought nothing of them cyrus smith listened to the sailor without saying a word but with glistening eyes this was the opportunity and he was not the man to let it escape him the project was very dangerous but it could be accomplished during the night in spite of the guards they might reach the balloon creep into the basket and then cut the lines which held it certainly they risked being shot but on the other hand they might succeed and but for this tempest but without this tempest the balloon would have been gone and the long-sought opportunity would not have been present i am not alone said smith at length how many would you want to take demanded the sailor two my friend spilett and my man nab that would be three replied pencroff and with herbert and myself five well the balloon can carry six very well we will go said the engineer this we pledged the reporter who was not a man to retreat and who when the project was told him approved of it heartily what astonished him was that so simple a plan had not already occurred to himself as to neb he followed his master whenever his master wanted to go to-night then said pencroff to-night at ten o'clock replied smith and pray heaven that this storm does not abate before we get off pencroff took leave of the engineer and returned to his lodging where he found young herbert brown this brave boy knew the plans of the sailor and he was not without a certain anxiety as to the result of the proposal to the engineer we see therefore five persons determined to throw themselves into the vortex of the storm the storm did not abate and neither jonathan foster nor his companions dreamed of confronting it in the frail basket the journey would be terrible the engineer feared but one thing that the balloon held to the ground and beaten down under the wind would be torn into a thousand pieces during many hours he wandered about the nearly deserted square watching the apparatus pencroff his hands in his pockets yawning like a man who is unable to kill time did the same but in reality he also feared that the balloon would be torn to pieces or break from its moorings and be carried off evening arrived and the night closed in dark and threatening thick masses of fog passed like clouds low down over the earth rain mingled with snow fell the weather was cold a sort of mist enveloped richmond it seemed as if in the face of this terrible tempest a truce had been agreed upon between the besiegers and the besieged and the cannon were silent before the heavy detonations of the storm the streets of the city were deserted it had not even seemed necessary in such weather to guard the square in which swung the balloon everything favoured the departure of the prisoners but this voyage in the midst of the excited elements bad weather said pencroff holding his head which the wind was trying to take off firmly to his head but pshaw it can't last all the same at half past nine cyrus smith and his companions glided by different routes to the square which the gas lights extinguished by the wind left in profound darkness they could not see even the huge balloon as it lay pressed over against the ground besides the bags of ballast which held the cords of the net the basket was held down by a strong cable passed through a ring fastened in the pavement and the ends brought back on board the five prisoners came together at the basket 
they had not been discovered, and such was the darkness that they could not see each other. Without saying a word, four of them took their places in the basket, while Pencroff, under the direction of the engineer, unfastened successively the bundles of ballast. It took but a few moments, and then the sailor joined his companions. The only thing that then held the balloon was the loop of the cable, and Cyrus Smith had but to give the word for them to let it slip. At that moment a dog leaped with a bound into the basket. It was Top, the dog of the engineer, who, having broken his chain, had followed his master. Cyrus Smith, fearing to add to the weight, wanted to send the poor brood back. But Pencroff said, Pshaw, it is but one more, and at the same time threw overboard two bags of sand. Then, slipping the cable, the balloon, shooting off in an oblique direction, disappeared, after having dashed its basket against two chimneys, which it demolished in its rush. Then the storm burst upon them with frightful violence. The engineer did not dare to descend through the night, and when day dawned all sight of the earth was hidden by the mists. It was not until five days later that the breaking of the clouds enabled them to see the vast sea extending below them, lashed by the winds into a terrific fury. We have seen how, of these five men who started on the 20th of March, four were thrown, four days later, on a desert coast, more than six thousand miles from this country, and the one who was missing, the one to whose rescue the four survivors had hurried, was their leader, Cyrus Smith. End of chapter 2chapter three of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter three five o'clock in the afternoon the lost one the despair of neb search to the northward the island a night of anguish the fog of the morning, Neb swimming, side of the land, fording the channel. The engineer, on the giving way of the net, had been swept away by a wave. His dog had disappeared at the same time. The faithful animal had, of its own accord, sprung to the rescue of its master. Forward! cried the reporter, and all four, forgetting weakness and fatigue, began their search. Poor Neb wept with grief and despair at the thought of having lost all that he loved in the world. Not more than two minutes had passed between the moment that Smith had disappeared and the instant of his companion's landing. They were, therefore, hopeful of being in time to rescue him. "'Hunt! Hunt for him!' cried Neb. "'Yes, Neb, and we will find him,' replied Spilett. "'Alive?' "'Alive.' "'Can he swim?' demanded Pencroff. "'Oh, yes!' responded Neb, and besides, Top is with him. The sailor, looking at the roaring sea, shook his head. It was at a point northward from this shore, and about half a mile from the place where the castaways had landed, that the engineer had disappeared, and if he had come ashore at the nearest point, it was at least that distance from where they were now. It was nearly six o'clock. The fog had risen and made the night very dark. The castaways followed northward along the shore of that land upon which chance had thrown them, a land unknown, whose geographical situation they could not guess. They walked upon a sandy soil, mixed with stones, seemingly destitute of any kind of vegetation. The ground, very uneven, seemed in certain places to be riddled with small holes, making the march very painful. From these holes great, heavy flying birds rushed forth and were lost in the darkness. Others, more active, rose in flocks and fled away like the clouds. The sailor thought he recognized gulls and sea mews, whose sharp cries were audible above the raging of the sea. From time to time the castaways would stop and call, listening for an answering voice from the ocean. They thought, too, that if they were near the place where the engineer had been, washed ashore, and he had been unable to make any response, that, at least, the barking of the dog top would have been heard but no sound was distinguishable above the roaring of the waves and the thud of the surf then the little party would resume their march searching all the windings of the shore after a walk of twenty minutes the four castaways were suddenly stopped by a foaming line of breakers 
they found themselves upon the extremity of a sharp point upon which the sea broke with fury this is a promontory said a sailor it will be necessary to turn back keeping to the right in order to gain the main land but if he is there cried neb pointing towards the ocean whose enormous waves showed white through the gloom well let us call again and all together uniting their voices uttered a vigorous cry but without response they waited for a lull then tried once more and again there was no answer then the castaways turned back following the opposite side of the promontory over ground equally sandy and rocky however pencroff observed that the shore was bolder that the land rose somewhat and he thought that it might gradually slope up to the high hill which was dimly visible through the darkness the birds were less numerous on this shore the sea also seemed less surging and tempestuous and it was noticeable that the agitation of the waves was subsiding they hardly heard the sound of the surf and doubtless this side of the promontory formed a semicircular bay protected by its sharp point from the long roll of the sea but by following this direction they were walking towards the south which was going away from the place where smith would have landed after a tramp of a mile and a half the shore presented no other curve which would permit of a return towards the north it was evident that this promontory the point of which they had turned must be joined to the mainland the castaways although much fatigued pushed on courageously hoping each moment to find a sudden turn which would take them in the desired direction what then was their disappointment when after having walked nearly two miles they found themselves again arrested by the sea upon a high promontory of slippery rocks we are on an island exclaimed pencroff and we have measured it from end to end the words of the sailor were true the castaways had been thrown not upon a continent but upon an island not more than two miles long and of inconsiderable breadth this desert island covered with stones without vegetation desolate refuge of sea birds did it belong to a more important archipelago they could not tell the party in the balloon when from their basket they saw the land through the clouds had not been able to determine its size but pencroff with the eyes of a sailor accustomed to piercing the gloom thought at the moment that he could distinguish in the west confused masses resembling a high coast but at this time they were unable on account of the obscurity to determine to what system whether simple or complex their isle belonged they were unable to get off as the sea surrounded them and it was necessary to wait until the next day to search for the engineer who alas had made no cry to signal his presence the silence of cyrus proves nothing said the reporter he may have fainted or be wounded and unable to reply but we will not despair the reporter then suggested the idea of lighting a fire upon the point of the island which would serve as a signal for the engineer but they searched in vain for wood or dry branches sand and stone were all they found one can understand the grief of neb and his companions who were strongly attached to their brave comrade it was too evident that they could not help him now and that they must wait till day the engineer had escaped and was already safe upon the land or he was lost for ever the hours were long and dreadful the cold was intense and the castaways suffered keenly but they did not realize it they did not think of sleep thinking only of their chief hoping wishing to hope they moved back and forth upon this arid island constantly returning to the northern end where they would be closest to the place of the catastrophe they listened they shouted they tried to catch some coal and as a lull would come or the roar of the surf fall with the waves their hallows must have sounded far into the distance once the cry of neb was answered by an echo and herbert made pencroff notice it saying that proves that there is land not far to the west the sailor nodded he knew his eyes could not deceive him he thought he had seen land and it must be there but this distant echo was the only answer to the cries of neb and the silence about the island remained unbroken meanwhile the sky was clearing slowly towards midnight some stars shone out and had the engineer been there with his companions he would have noticed that these stars did not belong to the northern hemisphere the pole star was not visible in this new horizon 
the constellations in the zenith were not such as they had been accustomed to see from north america and the southern cross shone resplendent in the heavens the night passed and towards five o'clock in the morning the middle heavens began to brighten though the horizon remained obscure until with the first rays of day a fog rose from the sea so dense that the eye could scarcely penetrate twenty paces into its depth and separate it into great heavy moving masses this was unfortunate as the castaways were unable to distinguish anything about them while the gaze of neb and the reporter were directed towards the sea the sailor and herbert searched for the land in the west but they could see nothing never mind said pencroff if i do not see the land i feel that it is there just as sure as that we are not in richmond but the fog which was nothing more than a morning mist soon rose a clear sun warmed the upper air its heat penetrating to the surface of the island at half past six three quarters of an hour after sunrise the mist was nearly gone though still thick overhead it dissolved below and soon all the island appeared as from a cloud then the sea appeared limitless towards the east but bounded on the west by a high and abrupt coast yes the land was there there safety was at least provisionally assured the island and the mainland were separated by a channel half a mile wide through which rushed a strong current into this current one of the party without saying a word or consulting with his companions precipitated himself it was neb he was anxious to be upon that coast and to be pushing forward towards the north no one could keep him back pencroff called to him in vain the reporter prepared to follow but the sailor ran to him exclaiming are you determined to cross this channel i am replied spilett well then listen to me a moment nab can rescue his master alone if we throw ourselves into the channel we are in danger of being carried out to sea by this strong current now if i am not mistaken it is caused by the ebb you see the tide is going out have patience until low water and then we may ford it you are right answered the reporter we will keep together as much as possible meantime neb was swimming vigorously in a diagonal direction against the current his black shoulders were seen rising with each stroke he was drawn backward with swiftness but he was gaining towards the other shore it took him more than half an hour to cross the half mile which separated the isle from the mainland and when he reached the other side it was at a place a long distance from the point opposite to that which he had left neb having landed at the base of a high rocky wall clambered quickly up its side and running disappeared behind the point projecting into the sea about the same height as the northern end of the island neb's companions had watched with anxiety his daring attempt and when he was out of sight they fixed their eyes upon that land from which they were going to demand refuge they ate some of the shellfish which they found upon the sand it was a poor meal but then it was better than nothing the opposite coast formed an immense bay terminated to the south by a sharp point bare of all vegetation and having a most forbidding aspect this point at its junction with the shore was abutted by high granite rocks towards the north on the contrary the bay widened with a shore more rounded extending from the southwest to the northeast and ending in a narrow cape between these two points the distance must have been about eight miles a half mile from the shore the island like an enormous whale lay upon the sea its width could not have been greater than a quarter of a mile before the island the shore began with a sandy beach strewn with black rocks at this moment beginning to appear above the receding tide beyond this rose like a curtain a perpendicular granite wall at least three hundred feet high and terminated by a rugged edge this extended for about three miles ending abruptly on the right in a smooth face as if cut by the hand of man to the left on the contrary above the promontory this kind of irregular cliff composed of heaped-up rocks and glistening in the light sank and gradually mingled with the rocks of the southern point upon the upper level of the coast not a tree was visible it was a table-land as barren though not as extensive as that around cape town or at the cape of good hope at least so it appeared from the islet to the right however and back of the smooth face of rock some verdure appeared the confused massing of large trees was easily distinguishable extending far as the eye could see 
This verdure gladdened the sight tired by the rough face of granite. Finally, back off and above the plateau, distant towards the southwest about seven miles, shone a white summit, reflecting the sun's rays. It was the snowy cap of some lofty mountain. But the sight of the broken rocks, heaped together on the left, would have proved to a geologist their volcanic origin, as they were incontestably the result of igneous action. Gideon Spilett, Pencroff, and Herbert looked earnestly upon this land where they were to live, perhaps for long years, upon which, if out of the track of ships, they might have to die. Well, demanded Herbert, what do you think of it, Pencroff? Well, replied the sailor, there's good and bad in it, as with everything else, but we shall soon see for look what i told you in three hours we can cross and once over there we will see what we can do towards finding mr smith pencroff was not wrong in his predictions three hours later at low tide the greater part of the sandy bed of the channel was bare a narrow strip of water easily crossed was all that separated the island from the shore and at ten o'clock spilett and his two companions stripped of their clothing which they carried in packages on their heads waded through the water which was nowhere more than five feet deep herbert where the water was too deep swam like a fish acquitting himself well and all arrived without difficulty at the other shore there having dried themselves in the sun they put on their clothes which had not touched the water and took counsel together End of chapter three Chapter Four of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Four. The Litovones. The Mouth of the River. The Chimneys. Continuation of the Search. The Forest of Evergreens. Getting Firewood waiting for the tide, on top of the cliff, the timber float, the return to the coast. Presently the reporter told the sailor to wait just where he was until he should come back, and without losing a moment he walked back along the coast in the direction which Neb had taken some hours before, and disappeared quickly around a turn in the shore. Herbert wished to go with him. Stay, my boy said the sailor we must pitch our camp for the night and try to find something to eat more satisfying than shellfish our friends will need food when they come back i am ready pencroff said herbert good said the sailor let us set to work methodically we are tired cold and hungry we need shelter fire and food there is plenty of wood in the forest and we can get eggs from the nests but we must find a house well said herbert i will look for a cave in these rocks and i shall certainly find some hole in which we can stow ourselves right said pencroff let us start at once they walked along the base of the rocky wall on the strand left bare by the receding waves but instead of going northwards they turned to the south pencroff had noticed some hundreds of feet below the place where they had been thrown ashore a narrow inlet in the coast which he thought might be the mouth of a river or of a brook now it was important to pitch the camp in the neighborhood of fresh water in that part of the island too smith might be found the rock rose three hundred feet smooth and massive it was a sturdy wall of the hardest granite never corroded by the waves and even at its base there was no cleft which might serve as a temporary abode above the summit hovered a host of aquatic birds mainly of the web-footed tribe with long narrow pointed beaks swift and noisy they cared little for the unaccustomed presence of men a shot into the midst of the flock would have brought down a dozen but neither pencroff nor herbert had a gun besides gulls and sea-mews are barely eatable and their eggs have a very disagreeable flavour meanwhile herbert who was now to the left soon noticed some rocks thickly strewn with seaweed which would evidently be submerged again in a few hours on them lay hosts of bivalves not to be disdained by hungry men herbert called to pencroff who came running to him ah they are mussels said the sailor now we can spare the eggs they are not mussels said herbert examining the mollusks carefully these are lithodomes can we eat them said pencroff certainly then let us eat some lithodomes the sailor could rely on herbert who was versed in natural history and very fond of it 
he owed his acquaintance with this study in great part to his father who had entered him in the classes of the best professors in boston where the child's industry and intelligence had endeared him to all these lithodomes were oblong shellfish adhering in clusters to the rocks they belonged to that species of boring mollusks which can perforate a hole in the hardest stone and whose shell has the peculiarity of being rounded at both ends pencroff and herbert made a good meal of these lithodomes which lay gaping in the sun they tasted like oysters with a peppery flavour which left no desire for condiments of any kind their hunger was allayed for the moment but their thirst was increased by the spicy flavour of the mollusks the thing now was to find fresh water which was not likely to fail them in the region so undulating pencroff and herbert after having taken the precaution to fill their pockets and handkerchiefs with lithodomes regained the foot of the hill two hundred feet further on they reached the inlet through which as pencroff had surmised a little river was flowing with full current here the rocky wall seemed to have been torn asunder by some volcanic convulsion at its base lay a little creek running at an acute angle the water in this place was one hundred feet across while the banks on either side were scarcely twenty feet broad the river buried itself at once between the two walls of granite which began to decline as one went upstream here is water said pencroff and over there is wood well herbert now we only want the house the river water was clear the sailor knew that as the tide was now low there would be no influx from the sea and the water would be fresh when this important point had been settled herbert looked for some cave which might give them shelter but it was in vain everywhere the wall was smooth flat and perpendicular however over at the mouth of the watercourse and above high water mark the detritus had formed not a grotto but a pile of enormous rocks such as are often met with in granite countries and which are called chimneys pencroff and herbert went down between the rocks into those sandy corridors lighted only by the huge cracks between the masses of granite some of which only kept their equilibrium by a miracle but with the light the wind came in and with the wind the piercing cold of the outer air still the sailor thought that by stopping up some of these openings with a mixture of stones and sand the chimneys might be rendered habitable their plan resembled the typographical sign of ampersand and by cutting off the upper curve of the sign through which the south and the west wind rushed in they could succeed without doubt in utilizing its lower portion this is just what we want said pencroff and if we ever see mr smith again he will know how to take advantage of this labyrinth we shall see him again pencroff said herbert and when he comes back he must find here a home that is tolerably comfortable we can make this so if we can build a fireplace in the left corridor with an opening for the smoke that we can do my boy answered the sailor and these chimneys will just serve our purpose but first we must get together some firing wood will be useful too in blocking up these great holes through which the wind whistles so shrilly herbert and pencroff left the chimneys and turning the angle walked up the left bank of the river whose current was strong enough to bring down a quantities of dead wood the return tide which had already begun would certainly carry it in the ebb to a great distance why not utilize this flux and reflux thought the sailor in the carriage of heavy timber after a quarter of an hour's walk the two reached the elbow which the river made in turning to the left from this point onward it flowed through a forest of magnificent trees which had preserved their verdure in spite of the season for they belonged to that green cone-bearing family indigenous everywhere from the poles to the tropics especially conspicuous were the diodara so numerous in the himalayas with their pungent perfume among them were clusters of pines with tall trunks and spreading parasols of green the ground was strewn with fallen branches so dry as to crackle under their feet good said the sailor i may not know the name of these trees but i know that they belong to the genus firewood and that's the main thing for us it was an easy matter to gather the firewood they did not need even to strip the trees plenty of dead branches lay at their feet this dry wood would burn rapidly and they would need a large supply how could two men carry such a load to the chimneys herbert asked the question my boy said the sailor there's a way to do everything if we had a car or a boat it would be too easy we have the river suggested herbert exactly said pencroft the river shall be our road and our carrier too 
Timber floats were not invented for nothing. But our carrier is going in the wrong direction, said Herbert, since the tide is coming up from the sea. We have only to wait for the turn of tide, answered the sailor. Let us get our float ready. They walked towards the river, each carrying a heavy load of wood tied up in fagots. On the bank, too, lay quantities of dead boughs, among grass which the foot of man had probably never pressed before. Pencroff began to get ready his float. In an eddy caused by an angle of the shore, which broke the flow of the current, they set afloat the larger pieces of wood, bound together by liana stems, so as to form a sort of raft. On this raft they piled the rest of the wood, which would have been a load for twenty men. In an hour their work was finished, and the float was moored to the bank to wait for the turn of the tide. Pencroff and Herbert resolved to spend the meantime in gaining a more extended view of the country from the higher plateau. Two hundred feet behind the angle of the river, the wall terminating in irregular masses of rocks, sloped away gently to the edge of the forest. The two easily climbed this natural staircase, soon attained the summit, and posted themselves at the angle overlooking the mouth of the river. Their first look was at that ocean over which they had been so frightfully swept. They beheld with emotion the northern part of the coast, the scene of the catastrophe, and of Smith's disappearance. They hoped to see on the surface some wreck of the balloon to which a man might cling. But the sea was a watery desert, the coast too was desolate neither neb nor the reporter could be seen something tells me said the herbert that a person so energetic as mr smith would not let himself be drowned like an ordinary man he must have got to the shore don't you think so pencroff the sailor shook his head sadly he never thought to see smith again but he left herbert a hope no doubt said he our engineer could save himself where any one else would perish meanwhile he took a careful observation of the coast Beneath his eyes stretched out the sandy beach, bounded, upon the right of the river mouth, by lines of breakers. The rocks, which still were visible above the water, were like groups of amphibious monsters lying in the surf. Beyond them the sea sparkled in the rays of the sun. A narrow point terminated the southern horizon, and it was impossible to tell whether the land stretched further in that direction, or whether it trended southeast and southwest, so as to make an elongated peninsula. At the northern end of the bay, the outline of the coast was continued to a great distance. There the shore was low and flat, without rocks, but covered by great sandbanks, left by the receding tide. When Pencroff and Herbert walked back towards the west, their looks fell on the snow-capped mountain, which rose six or seven miles away. Masses of tree trunks, with patches of evergreens, extended from its first declivities to within two miles of the coast then from the edge of this forest to the coast stretched a plateau strewn at random with clumps of trees on the left shore through the glades the water of the little river which seemed to have returned in its sinuous course to the mountains which gave it birth are we upon an island muttered the sailor it is big enough at all events said the boy an island's an island no matter how big said pencroff but this important question could not yet be decided the country itself isle or continent seemed fertile picturesque and diversified in its products for that they must be grateful they returned along the southern ridge of the granite plateau outlined by a fringe of fantastic rocks in whose cavities lived hundreds of birds a whole flock of them soared aloft as herbert jumped over the rocks ah cried he these are neither gulls nor seamews what are they said pencroff they look for all the world like pigeons so they are said herbert but they are wild pigeons or rock pigeons i know them by the two black bands on the wings the white rump and the ash blue feathers the rock pigeon is good to eat and its eggs ought to be delicious and if they have left a few in their nests we will let them hatch into an omelette said pencroff gaily but what will you make your omelette in asked herbert in your hat i'm not quite conjurer enough for that said sailor we must fall back on eggs in the shell and i will undertake to despatch the hardest pencroff and the boy examined carefully the cavities of the granite and succeeded in discovering eggs in some of them some dozens were collected in the sailor's handkerchief and high tide approaching the two went down again to the watercourse it was one o'clock when they arrived at the elbow of the river and the tide was already on the turn pencroff had no intention of letting his timber float at random nor did he wish to get on and steer it 
but a sailor is never troubled in a matter of ropes and cordage and pencroff quickly twisted from the dry liana a rope several fathoms long this was fastened behind the raft and the sailor held it in his hand while herbert kept the float in the current by pushing it off from the shore with a long pole this expedient proved an entire success an enormous load of wood kept well in the current the banks were sheer and there was no fear lest the float should ground before two o'clock they reached the mouth of the stream a few feet from the chimneys End of chapter 4chapter five of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr Nater. the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter five arranging the chimneys the important question of fire the match box search over the shore return of the reporter and neb one match the crackling fire the fish supper the first night on land the first care of pencroff after the raft had been unloaded was to make the chimneys habitable by stopping up these passages traversed by the draughts of air sand stones twisted branches and mud hermetically sealed the galleries of the ampersand open to the southerly winds and shut out its upper curve one narrow winding passage opening on the side was arranged to carry out the smoke and to quicken the draught of the fire the chimneys were thus divided into three or four chambers if these dark dens which would hardly have contained a beast might be so called but they were dry and one could stand up in them or at least in the principal one which was in the centre the floor was covered with sand and everything considered they could establish themselves in this place while waiting for one better while working herbert and pencroff chatted together perhaps said the boy our companions will have found a better place than ours it is possible answered the sailor but until we know don't let us stop better have two strings to one's bow than have none at all oh repeated herbert if they can only find mr smith and bring him back with them how thankful we will be yes murmured pencroff he was a good man was said herbert do you think we shall not see him again heaven forbid replied the sailor the work of division was rapidly accomplished and pencroff declared himself satisfied now said he our friends may return and they will find a good enough shelter nothing remained but to fix the fireplace and to prepare the meal which in truth was a task easy and simple enough large flat stones were placed at the mouth of the first gallery to the left where the smoke passage had been made and this chimney was made so narrow that but little heat would escape up the flue and the cavern would be comfortably warmed the stock of wood was piled up in one of the chambers and the sailor placed some logs and broken branches upon the stones he was occupied in arranging them when herbert asked him if he had some matches certainly replied pencroff and moreover fortunately for without matches or tinder we would indeed be in trouble could not we always make fire as the savages do replied herbert by rubbing two bits of dry wood together just try it my boy some time and see if you do anything more than put your arms out of joint nevertheless it is often done in the islands of the pacific i don't say that it's not replied pencroff but the savages must have a way of their own or use a certain kind of wood as more than once i have wanted to get fire in that way and have never yet been able to for my part i prefer matches and by the way where are mine pencroff who was an habitual smoker felt in his vest for the box which he was never without but not finding it he searched the pockets of his trousers and to his profound amazement it was not there this is an awkward business said he looking at herbert my box must have fallen from my pocket and i can't find it but you herbert have you nothing no steel not anything with which we can make fire not a thing pencroff the sailor followed by the boy walked out rubbing his forehead on the sand among the rocks by the bank of river both of them searched with the utmost care but without result the box was of copper and had it been there they must have seen it pencroff asked herbert did you not throw it out of the basket i took good care not to said the sailor but when one has been knocked around as we have been so small a thing could easily have been lost even my pipe is gone the confounded box where can it be 
well the tide is out let us run to the place where we landed said herbert it was little likely that they would find this box which the sea would have rolled among the pebbles at high water nevertheless it would do no harm to search they therefore went quickly to the place where they had first landed some two hundred paces from the chimneys there among the pebbles in the hollows of the rocks they made minute search but in vain if the box had fallen here it must have been carried out by the waves as the tide went down the sailor peered into every crevice but without success it was a serious loss and for the time irreparable pencroff did not conceal his chagrin he frowned but did not speak and herbert tried to console him by saying that most probably the matches would have been so wetted as to be useless no my boy answered the sailor they were in tightly closing metal box but now what are we to do we will certainly find means of procuring fire said herbert mr smith or mr spilett will not be as helpless as we are yes but in the meantime we are without it said pencroff and our companions will find but a very sorry meal on their return but said herbert hopefully it is not possible that they will have neither tinder nor matches i doubt it answered the sailor shaking his head in the first place neither neb nor mr smith smoke and then i am afraid mr spilett has more likely kept his notebook than his matchbox herbert did not answer this loss was evidently serious nevertheless the lad thought surely that they could make a fire in some way or other but pencroff more experienced although a man not easily discouraged knew differently at any rate there was but one thing to do to wait until the return of nab and the reporter it was necessary to give up the repast of cooked eggs which they had wished to prepare and a diet of raw flesh did not seem to be either for themselves or for the others an agreeable prospect before returning to the chimneys the companions in case they failed of a fire gathered a fresh lot of lithodomes and then silently took the road to their dwellings pencroff his eyes fixed upon the ground still searched in every direction for the lost box they followed again up the left bank of the river from its mouth to the angle where the raft had been built they returned to the upper plateau and went in every direction searching in the tall grass on the edge of the forest but in vain it was five o'clock when they returned again to the chimneys and it was needless to say that the passages were searched in their darkest recesses before all hope was given up towards six o'clock just as the sun was disappearing behind the highlands in the west herbert who was walking back and forth upon the shore announced the return of nab and of gideon spilett they came back alone and the lad felt his heart sink the sailor had not then been wrong in his presentiments they had been unable to find the engineer the reporter when he came up seated himself upon a rock without speaking fainting from fatigue half dead with hunger he was unable to utter a word as to neb his reddened eyes showed how he had been weeping and the fresh tears which he was unable to restrain indicated but too clearly that he had lost all hope the reporter at length gave the story of their search neb and he had followed the coast for more than eight miles and consequently far beyond the point where the balloon had made the plunge which was followed by the disappearance of the engineer and top the shore was deserted not a recently turned stone not a trace upon the sand not a footprint was upon all that part of the shore it was evident that nobody inhabited that portion of the island the sea was as deserted as the land and it was there at some hundreds of feet from shore that the engineer had found his grave at that moment neb raised his head and in a voice which showed how he still struggled against despair exclaimed no he is not dead it is impossible it might happen to you or me but never to him he is a man who can get out of anything then his strength failing him he murmured but i am used up herbert ran to him and cried neb we will find him god will give him back to us but you you must be famishing do eat something and while speaking the lad offered the poor negro a handful of shellfish a meagre and insufficient nourishment enough but neb though he had eaten nothing for hours refused them poor fellow deprived of his master he wished no longer to live as to gideon spilett he devoured the mollusks and then laid down upon the sand at the foot of a rock he was exhausted but calm herbert approaching him took his hand mr spilett said he we have discovered a shelter where you will be more comfortable the night is coming on so come and rest there to-morrow we will see the reporter rose and guided by the lad proceeded towards the chimneys 
as he did so pencroff came up to him and in an off-hand way asked him if by chance he had a match with him the reporter stopped felt in his pockets and finding none said i had some but i must have thrown them away then the sailor called neb and asked him the same question receiving a like answer curse it cried the sailor unable to restrain the word the reporter heard it and going to him said have you no matches not one and of course no fire ah cried neb if he was here my master he could soon make one the four castaways stood still and looked anxious at one another herbert was the first to break the silence by saying mr spilett you are a smoker you always have matches about you perhaps you have not searched thoroughly look again a single match will be enough the reporter rummaged the pockets of his trousers his vest and coat and to the great joy of pencroff as well as to his own surprise felt a little sliver of wood caught in the lining of his vest he could feel it from the outside but his fingers were unable to disengage it if this should prove a match and only one it was extremely necessary not to rub off the phosphorus let me try said the lad and very adroitly without breaking it he drew out this little bit of wood this precious trifle which to these poor men was of such great importance it was uninjured one match cried pencroff why it is as good as if we had a whole shipload he took it and followed by his companions regained the chimneys this tiny bit of wood which in civilized lands is wasted with indifference as valueless it was necessary here to use with the utmost care the sailor having assured himself that it was dry said we must have some paper here is some answered spilett who after a little hesitation had torn a leaf from his notebook pencroff took the bit of paper and knelt down before the fireplace where some handfuls of grass leaves and dry moss had been placed under the fagots in such a way that the air could freely circulate and make the dry wood readily ignite then pencroff shaping the paper into a cone as pipe smokers do in the wind placed it among the moss taking then a slightly rough stone and wiping it carefully with beating hard and suspended breath he gave the match a little rub the first stroke produced no effect as pencroff fearing to break off the phosphorus had not rubbed hard enough oh i won't be able to do it said he my hand shakes the match will miss i can't do it i don't want to try and rising he besought herbert to undertake it certainly the boy had never in his life been so affected his heart beat furiously prometheus about to steal the fire from heaven could not have been more excited nevertheless he did not hesitate but rubbed the stone with a quick stroke a little sputtering was heard and a light blue flame sprang out and produced a pungent smoke herbert gently turned the match so as to feed the flame and then slid it under the paper cone in a few seconds the paper took fire and then the moss kindled an instant later the dry wood crackled and a joyous blaze fanned by the breath of the sailor shone out from the darkness at length cried pencroff rising i was never so excited in my life it was evident that the fire did well in the fireplace of flat stones the smoke readily ascended through its passage the chimney drew and an agreeable warmth quickly made itself felt as to the fire it would be necessary to take care that it should not go out and always to keep some embers among the cinders but it was only a matter of care and attention as the wood was plenty and the supply could always be renewed in good time pencroff began at once to utilize the fire by preparing something more nourishing than a dish of lithodomes two dozen eggs were brought by herbert and the reporter seated in a corner watched these proceedings without speaking a triple thought held possession of his mind did cyrus still live if alive where was he if he had survived his plunge why was it that he had found no means of making his existence known as to neb he roamed the sand like one distracted pencroff who knew fifty-two ways of cooking eggs had no choice at this time he contented himself with placing them in the hot cinders and letting them cook slowly in a few minutes the operation was finished and the sailor invited the reporter to take part in the supper this was the first meal of the castaways upon this unknown coast the hard eggs were excellent and as the egg contains all the elements necessary for men's nourishment these poor men found them sufficient and felt their strength reviving unfortunately one was absent from this repast if the five prisoners who had escaped from richmond had all been there 
under those piled-up rocks before that bright and crackling fire upon that dry sand their happiness would have been complete but the most ingenious as well as the most learned he who was undoubtedly their chief cyrus smith alas was missing and his body had not even obtained burial thus passed the twenty fifth of march the night was come outside they heard the whistling of the wind the monotonous thud of the surf and the grinding of the pebbles on the beach the reporter had retired to a dark corner after having briefly noted the events of the day the first sight of this new land the loss of the engineer the exploration of the shore the incident of the matches etc and overcome by fatigue he was enabled to find some rest in sleep herbert fell asleep at once the sailor dozing with one eye open passed the night by the fire on which he kept heaping fuel one only of the castaways did not rest in the chimneys it was the inconsolable the despairing neb who during the whole night and in spite of his companion's effort to make him take some rest wandered upon the sand calling his master End of chapter five Chapter Six of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Six. The Castaways' Inventory. No Effects. The Chart Linen. An Expedition into the Forest. The Flora of the Woods. The Flight of the Jacamar. Tracks of Wild Beasts the curucus the heathcock line fishing extraordinary the inventory of the castaways can be promptly taken thrown upon a desert island they had nothing but the clothes they wore in the balloon we must add spilett's watch and notebook which he had kept by some inadvertence but there were no firearms and no tools not even a pocket-knife everything had been thrown overboard to lighten the balloon every necessity of life was wanting yet if cyrus smith had been with them his practical science and inventive genius would have saved them from despair but alas they could hope to see him no more the castaways could rely on providence only and on their own right hands and first should they settle down on this strip of coast without an effect to discover whether it was an island or a continent inhabited or desert it was an urgent question for all their measures would depend upon its solution however it seemed to pencroff better to wait a few days before undertaking an exploration they must try to procure more satisfying food than eggs and shellfish and repair their strength exhausted by fatigue and by the inclemency of the weather the chimneys would serve as a house for a while their fire was lit and it would be very easy to keep alive some embers for the time being there were plenty of eggs and shellfish they might even be able to kill with a stick or a stone some of the numerous pigeons which fluttered among the rocks they might find fruit trees in the neighboring forest and they had plenty of fresh water it was decided then to wait a few days at the chimneys and to prepare for an expedition either along the coast or into the interior of the country this plan was especially agreeable to neb who was in no hurry to abandon that part of the coast which had been the scene of the catastrophe he could not and would not believe that smith was dead until the waves should have thrown up the engineer's body until neb should have seen with his eyes and handled with his hands his master's corpse he believed him alive it was an illusion which the sailor had not the heart to destroy and there was no use in talking to neb he was like the dog who would not leave his master's tomb and his grief was such that he would probably soon follow him upon the morning on the twenty sixth of march at daybreak neb started along the coast northward to the spot where the sea had doubtless closed over the unfortunate engineer for breakfast that morning they had only eggs and lithodomes seasoned with salt which herbert had found in the cavities of the rock when the meal was over they divided forces the reporter stayed behind to keep up the fire and in the very improbable case of neb's needing him to go to his assistance herbert and pencroff went into the forest we will go hunting herbert said the sailor we shall find ammunition on our way and we will cut our guns in the forest but before starting herbert suggested that as they had no tinder they must replace it by burnt linen they were very sorry to sacrifice a piece of handkerchief 
but the need was urgent and a piece of pencroff's large check handkerchief was soon converted into a charred rug and put away in the central chamber in a little cavity of the rock sheltered from wind and dampness by this time it was nine o'clock the weather was threatening and the breeze blew from the southeast herbert and pencroff as they left the chimneys cast a glance at the smoke which curled upwards from amid the rocks then they walked up the left bank of the river when they reached the forest pencroff broke from the first tree two thick branches which he made into cudgels and whose points herbert blunted against the rock what would he not give for a knife then the hunters walked on in the high grass along the bank of the river which after its turn to the southwest gradually narrowed running between high banks and overarched by interlacing trees pencroff not to lose his way determined to follow the course of the stream which would bring him back to his point of departure but the bank offered many obstacles here trees whose flexible branches bent over to the brink of the current there thorns and lianas which they had to break with their sticks herbert often glided between the broken stumps with the agility of a young cat and disappeared in the copse but pencroff called him back at once begging him not to wander away meanwhile the sailor carefully observed the character and peculiarities of the region on this left bank the surface was flat rising insensibly towards the interior sometimes it was moist and swampy indicating the existence of a subterranean network of little streams emptying themselves into the river sometimes too a brook ran across the copse which they crossed without trouble the opposite bank was more undulating and the valley through whose bottom flowed the river was more clearly defined the hill covered with trees rising in terraces intercepted the vision along this right bank they could hardly have walked for the descent was steep and the trees which bent over the water were only sustained by their roots it is needless to say that both forest and shore seemed a virgin wilderness they saw fresh traces of animals whose species was unknown to them some seemed to them the tracks of dangerous wild beasts but nowhere was there the mark of an axe or a tree trunk or the ashes of a fire or the imprint of a foot they should no doubt have been glad that it was so for on this land in the mid-pacific the presence of man was a thing more to be dreaded than desired they hardly spoke so great were the difficulties of the route after an hour's walk they had but just compassed a mile hitherto their hunting had been fruitless birds were singing and flying to and fro under the trees but they showed an instinctive fear of their enemy man herbert descried among them in a swampy part of the forest a bird with narrow and elongated beak in shape something like a kingfisher from which it was distinguished by its harsh and lustrous plumage that must be a jacamar said herbert trying to get within range of the bird it would be a good chance to taste jacamar answered the sailor if that fellow would only let himself be roasted in a moment a stone adroitly aimed by the boy struck the bird on the wing but the jacamar took to its legs and disappeared in a minute what a muff am i said herbert not at all said the sailor it was a good shot a great many would have missed the bird don't be discouraged we'll catch him again some day the wood opened as the hunters went on and the trees grew to a vast height but none had edible fruits pencroff sought in vain for some of those precious palm trees which lend themselves so wonderfully to the needs of mankind and which grow from forty degrees north latitude to thirty five degrees south but this forest was composed only of conifers such as the deodars already recognized by herbert the douglas pines which grow on the northeast coast of america and magnificent fir trees one hundred and fifty feet high among their branches was fluttering a flock of birds with small bodies and long glittering tails herbert picked up some of the feathers which lay scattered on the ground and looked at them carefully these are curucus said he i would rather have a guinea hen or a heathcock said pencroff but still if they are good to eat they are good to eat said herbert their meat is delicious besides i think we can easily get at them with our sticks slipping through the grass they reached the foot of a tree whose lower branches were covered with the little birds who were snapping at the flying insects their feathered claws clutched tight the twigs on which they were sitting then the hunters rose to their feet and using their sticks like a scythe they mowed down whole rows of curucus of whom one hundred and five were knocked over before the stupid birds thought of escape 
good said pencroff this is just the sort of game for hunters like us we could catch them in our hands they skewered the kurukus on a switch like field larks and continued to explore the object of the expedition was of course to bring back as much game as possible to the chimneys so far it had not been altogether attained they looked about everywhere and were enraged to see animals escaping through the high grass if they had only had top but top most likely had perished with his master about three o'clock they entered a wood full of juniper trees at whose aromatic berries flocks of birds were picking suddenly they heard a sound like the blast of a trumpet it was the note of those gallinaceae called tetras in the united states soon they saw several pairs of them with brownish yellow plumage and brown tails pencroff determined to capture one of these birds for they were as big as hens and their meat as delicious as a pullet but they would not let him come near them at last after several unsuccessful attempts he said well since we can't kill them on the wing we must take them with a line like a carp cried the wandering herbert like a carp answered the sailor gravely pencroff had found in the grass half a dozen tetras nests with two or three eggs in each he was very careful not to touch these nests whose owners would certainly return to them around these he proposed to draw his lines not as a snare but with hook and bait he took herbert to some distance from the nests and there made ready his singular apparatus with the care of a true disciple of isaac walton herbert watched the work with a natural interest but without much faith in its success the lines were made of small lianas tied together from fifteen to twenty feet long and stout thorns with bent points broken from a thicket of dwarf acacias and fastened to the ends of the lianas served as hooks and the great red worms which crawled at their feet made excellent bait this done pencroff walking stealthily through the grass placed one end of his hook and line close to the nests of the tetras then he stole back took the other end in his hand and hid himself with herbert behind a large tree herbert it must be said was not sanguine of success a good half hour passed but as the sailor had foreseen several pairs of tetras returned to their nests they hopped about pecking the ground and little suspecting the presence of the hunters who had taken care to station themselves to the leeward of the galina herbert held his breath with excitement while pencroff with dilated eyes open mouth and lips parted as if to taste a morsel of tetras scarcely breathed meanwhile the galina walked heedlessly among the hooks pencroff then gave little jerks which moved the bait up and down as if the worms were still alive how much more intense was his excitement than the fisherman's who cannot see the approach of his prey the jerks soon aroused the attention of the galina who began to peck at the bait three of the greediest swallowed hook and bait together suddenly with a quick jerk pencroff pulled in his line and the flapping of wings showed that the birds were taken hurrah cried he springing upon the game of which he was master in a moment herbert clapped his hands it was the first time he had seen birds taken with a line but the modest sailor said that it was not his first attempt and moreover that the merit of the invention was not his and at any rate said he in our present situation we must hope for many such contrivances the tetras were tied together by the feet and pencroff happy that they were not returning empty-handed and perceiving that the day was ending thought it best to return home their route was indicated by the river and following it downward by six o'clock tired out by their excursion herbert and pencroff re-entered the chimneys End of chapter six Chapter Seven of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Seven. Neb has not yet returned. The reflections of the reporter. The supper. Prospect of a bad night. The storm is frightful. They go out into the night struggle with the rain and wind gideon spilett stood motionless upon the shore his arms crossed gazing on the sea whose horizon was darkened towards the east by a huge black cloud mounting rapidly into the horizon the wind already strong was freshening the heavens had an angry look and the first symptoms of a heavy blow were manifesting themselves 
Herbert went into the chimneys, and Pencroff walked towards the reporter, who was too absorbed to notice his approach. "'We will have a bad night, Mr. Spilett,' said the sailor. "'Wind and rain enough for Mother Carey's chickens.' The reporter, turning and perceiving Pencroff, asked the question, "'How far off from the shore do you think was the basket when it was struck by the sea that carried away our companion?' The sailor had not expected this question. He reflected an instant before answering, Two cables' lengths or more. How much is a cable's length? demanded Spilett. About one hundred and twenty fathoms or six hundred feet. Then, said the reporter, Cyrus Smith would have disappeared not more than one thousand two hundred feet from the shore. Not more than that. And his dog too? Yes. What astonishes me, said the reporter, admitting that our companion and top have perished, is the fact that neither the body of the dog nor of his master has been cast upon the shore. This is not astonishing with so heavy a sea, replied the sailor. Moreover, it is quite possible that there are currents which have carried them further up the coast. Then it is really your opinion that our companion has been drowned? asked once more the reporter. That is my opinion. And my opinion, Pencroff, said Spilett, with all the respect for your experience, is that in this absolute disappearance of both Cyrus and Top, living or dead, there is something inexplicable and incredible. I wish I could think as you do, sir, responded Pencroff, but unhappily I cannot. After thus speaking, the sailor returned to the chimneys. A good fire was burning in the fireplace. Herbert had just thrown on a fresh armful of wood, and its flames lit up the dark recesses of the corridor. Pencroff began at once to busy himself about dinner. It seemed expedient to provide something substantial, as all stood in need of nourishment. So two tetras were quickly plucked, spitted upon a stick, and placed to roast before a blazing fire. The kurukus were reserved for the next day. At seven o'clock Neb was still absent, and Pencroff began to be alarmed about him. He feared that he might have met with some accident in this unknown land, or that the poor fellow had been drawn by despair to some rash act. Herbert, on the contrary, argued that Neb's absence was owing to some fresh discovery which had induced him to prolong his researches. And anything new must be to Cyrus Smith's advantage. Why had not Neb come back if some hope was not detaining him? Perhaps he had found some sign or footprint which had put him upon the track. Perhaps at this moment he was following the trail. Perhaps already he was beside his master. Thus the lad spoke and reasoned, unchecked by his companions. The reporter nodded approval, but Pencroff thought it more probable that Neb, in his search, had pushed on so far that he had not been able to return. Meantime Herbert, excited by vague presentiments, manifested a desire to go to meet Neb. But Pencroff showed him that it would be useless in the darkness and storm to attempt to find traces of the negro, and that the better course was to wait. If, by morning, Neb had not returned, Pencroff would not hesitate joining the lad in a search for him. Gideon Spilett concurred with the sailor in his opinion that they had better remain together, and Herbert, though tearfully, gave up the project. The reporter could not help embracing the generous lad. The storm began. A furious gust of wind passed over the coast from the southeast. They heard the sea which was out roaring upon the reef. The whirlwind drove the rain in clouds along the shore. The sand, stirred up by the wind, mingled with the rain, and the air was filled with mineral as well as aqueous dust. Between the mouth of the river and the cliff's face the wind whirled about as in a maelstrom, and finding no other outlet than the narrow valley through which ran the stream, it rushed through this with irresistible violence. Often, too, the smoke from the chimney, driven back down its narrow vent, filled the corridors and rendered them uninhabitable. Therefore, when the tetras were cooked, Pencroff let the fire smolder, only preserving some clear embers among the ashes. At eight o'clock Neb had not returned, but they could not help admitting that now the tempest alone was sufficient to account for his non-appearance, and that, probably, he had sought refuge in some cavern, waiting the end of the storm, or at least daybreak. As to going to meet him under present circumstances, that was simply impossible. The birds were all they had for supper, but the party found them excellent eating. Pencroff and Herbert, their appetite sharpened by their long walk, devoured them. Then each one retired to his corner, and Herbert, lying beside the sailor, extended before the fireplace, was soon asleep. Outside, as the night advanced, the storm developed formidable proportions. 
it was a hurricane equal to that which had carried the prisoners from richmond such tempests pregnant with catastrophes spreading terror over a vast area their fury withstood by no obstacle are frequent during the equinox we can understand how a coast facing the east and exposed to the full fury of the storm was attacked with a violence perfectly indescribable happily the heap of rocks forming the chimneys was composed of solid enormous blocks of granite though some of them imperfectly balanced seemed to tremble upon their foundations pencroff placing his hand against the walls could feel their rapid vibrations but he said to himself with reason that there was no real danger and that the impoverished retreat would not tumble about their ears nevertheless he heard the sound of rocks torn from the top of the plateau by the gusts crashing upon the shore and some falling perpendicularly struck the chimneys and flew off into fragments twice the sailor rose and went to the opening of the corridor to look abroad but there was no danger from these inconsiderable showers of stones and he returned to his place before the fire where the embers glowed among the ashes in spite of the fury and fracas of the tempest herbert slept profoundly and at length sleep took possession of pencroff whose sailor life had accustomed him to such demonstrations gideon spilett who was kept awake by anxiety reproached himself for not having accompanied neb we have seen that he had not given up all hope and the presentiments which had disturbed herbert had affected him also his thoughts were fixed upon neb why had not the negro returned he tossed about on his sandy couch unheeding the warfare of the elements then overcome by fatigue he would close his eyes for an instant only to be awakened by some sudden thought meantime the night advanced and it was about two o'clock when pencroff was suddenly aroused from a deep sleep by finding himself vigorously shaken what's the matter he cried rousing and collecting himself with the quickness peculiar to sailors the reporter was bending over him and saying listen pencroff listen the sailor listened but could hear no sounds other than those caused by the gusts it is the wind he said no answered spilett listening again i think i heard what the barking of a dog a dog cried pencroff springing to his feet yes the barking impossible answered the sailor how in the roarings of the tempest wait listen said the reporter pencroff listened most attentively and at length during a lull he thought he caught the sound of distant barking is it asked the reporter squeezing the sailor's hand yes yes said pencroff it is top it is top cried herbert who had just wakened and the three rushed to the entrance of the chimneys they had great difficulty in getting out as the wind drove against them with fury but at last they succeeded and then they were obliged to steady themselves against the rocks they were unable to speak but they looked about them the darkness was absolute sea sky and earth were one intense blackness it seemed as if there was not one particle of light diffused in the atmosphere for some moments the reporter and the two companions stood in this place beset by gusts drenched by the rain blinded by the sand then again in the hush of the storm they heard far away the barking of a dog this must be top but was he alone or accompanied probably alone for if neb had been with him the negro would have hastened at once to the chimneys the sailor pressed the reporter's hand in a manner signifying that he was to remain without and then returning to the corridor emerged a moment later with a lighted fagot which he threw into the darkness at the same time whistling shrilly at this signal which seemed to have been looked for the answering barks came nearer and soon a dog bounded into the corridor followed by the three companions an armful of wood was thrown upon the coals brightly lighting up the passage it is top cried herbert it was indeed top a magnificent anglo-norman uniting in the cross of two breeds those qualities swiftness of food and keenness of scent indispensable in coursing dogs but he was alone neither his master nor neb accompanied him it seemed inexplicable how through the darkness and storm the dog's instinct had directed him to the chimneys a place he was unacquainted with but still more unaccountable was the fact that he was neither fatigued nor exhausted nor soiled with mud or sand herbert had drawn him towards him and the dog rubbed his neck against the lad's hands if the dog is found the master will be found also said the reporter god grant it responded herbert 
Come, let us set out. Tob will guide us. Pencroff made no objection. He saw that the dog's cunning had disproved his conjectures. Let us set out at once, he said, and covering the fire so that it could be relighted on their return, and preceded by the dog, who seemed to invite their departure, the sailor, having gathered up the remnants of the supper, followed by the reporter and Herbert, rushed into the darkness. The tempest, then, in all its violence, was perhaps at the maximum intensity. The new moon had not sufficient light to pierce the clouds. It was difficult to follow a straight course. The better way, therefore, was to trust to the instinct of Top, which was done. The reporter and the lad walked behind the dog, and the sailor followed after. To speak was impossible. The rain, dispersed by the wind, was not heavy, but the strength of the storm was terrible. Fortunately, as it came from the southeast, the wind was at the back of the party, and the sand, hurled from behind, did not prevent their march. Indeed, they were often blown along so rapidly as nearly to be overthrown. But they were sustained by a great hope. This time, at least, they were not wandering at random. They felt, no doubt, that Neb had found his master and had sent the faithful dog to them. But was the engineer living, or had Neb summoned his companions only to render the last services to the dead? After having passed the smooth face of rock, which they carefully avoided, the party stopped to take breath. The angle of the cliff sheltered them from the wind, and they could breathe freely after this tramp, or rather race, of a quarter of an hour. They were now able to hear themselves speak, and the lad, having pronounced the name of Smith, the dog seemed to say, by his glad barking, that his master was safe. "'Saved! He is saved! Isn't he top?' repeated the boy, and the dog barked his answer. It was half-past two when the march was resumed. The sea began to rise, and this, which was a spring-tide backed up by the wind, threatened to be very high. The tremendous breaker thundered against the reef, assailing it so violently as probably to pass completely over the islet, which was invisible. The coast was no longer sheltered by this long breakwater, but was exposed to the full fury of the open sea. After the party were clear of the precipice, the storm attacked them again with fury. Crouching, with back still to the wind, they followed Top, who never hesitated in his course. Mounting towards the north, they had upon their right the endless line of breakers deafening them with its thunders, and upon their left a region buried in darkness. One thing was certain, that they were upon an open plain, as the wind rushed over them without rebounding, as it had done from the granite cliffs. By four o'clock they estimated the distance travelled as eight miles. The clouds had risen a little, and the wind was drier and colder. Insufficiently clad, the three companions suffered cruelly, but no murmur passed their lips. They were determined to follow Top wherever he wished to lead them. Towards five o'clock the day began to break. At first overhead, where some grey shadows bordered the clouds, and presently, under a dark band, a bright streak of light sharply defined the sea horizon. The crests of the billows shone with a yellow light, and the foam revealed the whiteness. At the same time, on the left, the hilly parts of the shore were confusedly defined in great outlines upon the blackness of the night. At six o'clock it was daylight. The clouds sped rapidly overhead. The sailor and his companions were some six miles from the chimneys, following a very flat shore, bordered in the offing by a reef of rocks, whose surface only was visible above the high tide. On the left the country sloped up into downs bristling with thistles, giving a forbidding aspect to the vast sandy region. The shore was low, and offered no other resistance to the ocean than an irregular chain of hillocks. Here and there was a tree, leaning its trunks and branches towards the west. Far behind, to the southwest, extended the borders of the forest. At this moment Top gave unequivocal signs of excitement. He ran ahead, returned, and seemed to try to hurry them on. The dog had left the coast, and guided by his wonderful instinct, without any hesitation, had gone among the downs. They followed him through a region absolutely devoid of life. The border of the downs, itself large, was composed of hills and hillocks, unevenly scattered here and there. It was like a little Switzerland of sand, and nothing but a dog's astonishing instinct could find the way. Five minutes after leaving the shore, the reporter and his companions reached a sort of hollow, formed in the back of a high down, before which Top stopped with a loud bark. The three entered the cave. Neb was there, kneeling beside a the body. 
extended upon a bed of grass. It was the body of Cyrus Smith. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Eight. Is Cyrus Smith alive? Neb's story. Footprints. An insoluble question. The first words of Smith. Comparing the footprints. Return to the chimneys. Pencroff dejected. Neb did not move. The sailor uttered one word. Living! he cried. The negro did not answer. Spilett and Pencroff turned pale. Herbert, clasping his hands, stood motionless. But it was evident that the poor negro, overcome by grief, had neither seen his companions nor heard the voice of the sailor. The reporter knelt down beside the motionless body, and, having opened the clothing, pressed his ear to the chest of the engineer. A minute which seemed like an age passed during which he tried to detect some movement of the heart. Neb raised up a little and looked on as if in a trance. Overcome by exhaustion, prostrated by grief, the poor fellow was hardly recognizable. He believed his master dead. Gideon Spilett, after a long and attentive examination, rose up. He lives! he said. Pencroff, in his turn, knelt down beside Cyrus Smith. He also detected some heartbeats, and a slight breath issuing from the lips of the engineer. Herbert, at a word from the reporter, hurried in search of water. A hundred paces off he found a clear brook, swollen by the late rains and filtered by the sand. But there was nothing, not even a shell, in which to carry the water, so that the lad had to content himself with soaking his handkerchief in the stream, and hastened back with it to the cave. Happily the handkerchief held sufficient for Spilett's purpose, which was simply to moisten the lips of the engineer. The drops of fresh water produced an instantaneous effect. A sigh escaped from the breast of Smith, and it seemed as if he attempted to speak. "'We shall save him,' said the reporter." Neb took heart at these words. He removed the clothing from his master to see if the body was anywhere wounded. But neither on his head, nor body, nor limbs was there a bruise or even a scratch, an astonishing circumstance, since he must have been tossed about among the rocks, even his hands were uninjured, and it was difficult to explain how the engineer should exhibit no mark of the efforts which he must have made in getting over the reef. But the explanation of this circumstance would come later when Cyrus Smith could speak. At present it was necessary to restore his consciousness, and it was probable that this result could be accomplished by friction. For this purpose they made use of the sailor's pea-jacket. The engineer, warmed by this rude rubbing, moved his arms slightly, and his breathing began to be more regular. He was dying from exhaustion, and, doubtless, had not the reporter and his companions arrived, it would have been all over with Cyrus Smith. "'You thought he was dead?' said the sailor. "'Yes, I thought so,' answered Neb. "'And if Top had not found you and brought you back, I would have buried my master and died beside him.' The engineer had had a narrow escape. Then Neb told them what had happened. The day before, after having left the chimneys at daybreak, he had followed along the coast in a direction due north, until he reached that part of the beach which he had already visited. There, though, as he said, without hope of success, he searched the shore, the rocks, the sand, for any marks that could guide him, examining most carefully that part which was above high-water mark, as below that point the ebb and flow of the tide would have effaced all traces. He did not hope to find his master living. It was the discovery of the body which he sought, that he might bury it with its own hands. He searched a long time without success. It seemed as if nothing human had ever been upon that desolate shore. Of the millions of shellfish lying out of reach of the tide, not a shell was broken. There was no sign of a landing having ever been made there. The negro then decided to continue some miles further up the coast. It was possible that the currents had carried the body to some distant point. For Neb knew that a corpse, floating a little distance from a low shore, was almost certain, sooner or later, to be thrown upon the strand, and he was desirous to look upon his master one last time. 
i followed the shore two miles further looking at it at low and high water hardly hoping to find anything when yesterday evening about five o'clock i discovered footprints upon the sand footprints cried pencroff yes sir replied neb and did they begin at the water demanded the reporter no answered the negro above high water mark below that the tide had washed out the others go on neb said spilett the sight of these footprints made me wild with joy they were very plain and went towards the downs i followed them for a quarter of an hour running so as not to tread on them five minutes later as it was growing dark i heard a dog bark it was top and he brought me here to my master neb finished his recital by telling of his grief at the discovery of the inanimate body he had tried to discover some signs of life still remaining in it but all his efforts were in vain there was nothing therefore to do but to perform the last offices to him whom he had loved so well then he thought of his companions they too would wish to look once more upon their comrade top was there could he not rely upon the sagacity of that faithful animal so having pronounced several times the name of the reporter who of all the engineer's companions was best known to top and having at the same time motioned towards the south the dog bounded off in the direction indicated we have seen how guided by an almost a supernatural instinct the dog had arrived at the chimneys neb's companions listened to his story with the greatest attention how the engineer had been able to reach this cave in the midst of the downs more than a mile from the beach was as inexplicable as was his escape from the waves and rocks without a scratch so you neb said the reporter did not bring your master to this place no it was not i answered neb he certainly could not have come alone said pencroff but he must have done it though it does not seem credible said the reporter they must wait for the solution of the mystery until the engineer could speak fortunately the rubbing had re-established the circulation of the blood and life was returning smith moved his arm again then his head and a second time some incoherent words escaped his lips neb leaning over him spoke but the engineer seemed not to hear and his eyes remained close life was revealing itself by movement but consciousness had not yet returned pencroff had unfortunately forgotten to bring the burnt linen which could have been ignited with a couple of flints and without it they had no means of making a fire the pockets of the engineer were empty of everything but his watch it was therefore the unanimous opinion that cyrus smith must be carried to the chimneys as soon as possible meanwhile the attention lavished on the engineer restored him to consciousness sooner than could have been hoped the moistening of his lips had revived him and pencroff conceived the idea of mixing some of the juice of the tetras with water herbert ran to the shore and brought back two large shells and the sailor made a mixture which they introduced between the lips of the engineer who swallowed it with avidity his eyes opened neb and the reporter were leaning over him my master my master cried neb the engineer heard him he recognized neb and his companions and his hand gently pressed theirs again he spoke some words doubtless the same which he had before uttered and which indicated that some thoughts were troubling him this time the words were understood island or continent he muttered what the devil do we care cried pencroff unable to restrain the exclamation now that you are alive sir island or continent we will find that out later the engineer made a motion in the affirmative and then seemed to sleep taking care not to disturb him the reporter set to work to provide the most comfortable means of moving him neb herbert and pencroff left the cave and went towards the high down on which were some gnarled trees on the way the sailor kept repeating island or continent to think of that at his last gasp what a man having reached the top of the down pencroff and his companions tore off the main branches from a tree a sort of sea pine sickly and stunted and with these branches they constructed a litter which they covered with leaves and grass this work occupied some little time and it was ten o'clock when the three returned to smith and spilett the engineer had just wakened from the sleep or rather stupor in which they had found him the color had come back to his lips which had been as pale as death he raised himself slightly and looked about as if questioning where he was can you listen to me without being tired cyrus asked the reporter 
Yes, responded the engineer. I think, said the sailor, that Mr. Smith can listen better after having taken some more of this tetra jelly. It is really tetra, sir. He continued as he gave some of the mixture, to which he had this time added some of the meat of the bird. Cyrus Smith swallowed these bits of tetra, and the remainder was eaten by his companions, who were suffering from hunger, and who found the repast light enough. Well, said the sailor, there are victuals waiting for us at the chimneys, for you must know, Mr. Smith, that to the south of here we have a house with rooms and beds and fireplace, and in the pantry dozens of birds, which our Herbert calls Kurukus. Your litter is ready, and whenever you feel strong enough we will carry you to our house. Thanks, my friends, replied the engineer. In an hour or two we will go. And now, Spilett, continue. The reporter related everything that had happened, recounting the events unknown to Smith, the last plunge of the balloon, the landing upon this unknown shore, its deserted appearance, the discovery of the chimneys, and the search for the engineer, the devotion of Neb, and what they owed to Top's intelligence, etc. But, asked Smith in a feeble voice, you did not pick me up on the beach. No, replied the reporter, and it was not you who brought me to this hollow. No. How far is this place from the reef? At least half a mile, replied Pencroff, and if you are astonished, we are equally surprised to find you here. It is indeed singular, said the engineer, who was gradually reviving and taking interest in these details. But, asked the sailor, cannot you remember anything that happened after you were washed away by that heavy sea? Cyrus Smith tried to think, but he remembered little. The wave had swept him from the net of the balloon, and at first he had sunk several fathoms. Coming up to the surface, he was conscious, in the half-light, of something struggling beside him. It was Top who had sprung to his rescue. Looking up, he could see nothing of the balloon, which, lightened by his and the dog's weight, had sped away like an arrow. He found himself in the midst of the tumultuous sea, more than half a mile from shore. He swam vigorously against the waves, and Top sustained him by his garments, but a strong current seized him, carrying him to the north, and after struggling for half an hour he sank, dragging the dog with him into the abyss. From that moment to the instant of his finding himself in the arms of his friends he remembered nothing. Nevertheless, said Pencroff, you must have been cast upon the shore, and had strength enough to walk to this place, since Neb found your tracks. Yes, that must be so answered the engineer reflectively, and you have not seen any traces of inhabitants upon the shore? Not a sign, answered the reporter. Moreover, if by chance someone had rescued you from the waves, why should he then have abandoned you? You are right, my dear Spilett. Tell me, Neb, inquired the engineer, turning towards his servant, it was not you. You could not have been in a trance, during which— No, that's absurd. Do any of the footprints still remain? Yes, master replied neb there are some at the entrance back of this mound in a place sheltered from the wind and rain but the others have been obliterated by the storm pencroff said cyrus will you take my shoes and see if they fit those footprints exactly the sailor did as he had been asked he and herbert guided by neb went to where the marks were and in their absence smith said to the reporter that is a thing passing belief inexplicable indeed answered the other but do not dwell upon it at present my dear spilett we will talk of it hereafter at this moment the others returned all doubt was set at rest the shoes of the engineer fitted the tracks exactly therefore it must have been smith himself who had walked over the sand so he said i was the one in a trance and not neb i must have walked like a somnambulist without consciousness and top's instinct brought me here after he rescued me from the waves here top come here dog the splendid animal sprang barking to his master, and caresses were lavished upon him. It was agreed that there was no other way to account for the rescue than by giving Top the credit for it. Towards noon, Pencroff having asked Smith if he felt strong enough to be carried, the latter, for answer, by an effort which showed his strength of will, rose to his feet. But if he had not leaned upon the sailor, he would have fallen. Capital, said Pencroff, summon the engineer's carriage. The litter was brought. The cross branches had been covered with moss and grass, and when Smith was laid upon it, they walked towards the coast, Neb and the sailor carrying him. 
eight miles had to be travelled and as they could move but slowly and would probably have to make frequent rests it would take six hours or more to reach the chimneys the wind was still strong but fortunately it had ceased raining from his couch the engineer leaning upon his arm observed the coast especially the part opposite the sea he examined it without comment but undoubtedly the aspect of the country its contour its forests and diverse products were noted in his mind but after two hours fatigue overcame him and he slept upon the litter at half past five the little party reached the precipice and soon after were before the chimneys stopping here the litter was placed upon the sand without disturbing the slumber of the engineer pencroff saw to his surprise that the terrible storm of the day before had altered the aspect of the place rocks had been displaced great fragments were strewn over the sand and a thick carpet of several kinds of seaweed covered all the shore it was plain that the sea sweeping over the isle had reached to the base of the enormous granite curtain before the entrance to the chimneys the ground had been violently torn up by the action of the waves pencroff seized with a sudden fear rushed into the corridor returning a moment after he stood motionless looking at his comrades the fire had been extinguished the drowned cinders were nothing but mud the charred linen which was to serve them for tinder had gone the sea had penetrated every recess of the corridor and everything was overthrown everything was destroyed within the chimneys End of chapter eight chapter nine of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter nine cyrus is here pencroff's attempts rubbing wood island or continent the plans of the engineer whereabouts in the pacific in the depths of the forest the pistachio pine a pig chase a smoke of good omen in a few words the others were informed of what had happened this accident which portended serious results at least pencroff foresaw such affected each one differently neb overjoyed in having recovered his master did not listen or did not wish to think of what pencroff said herbert shared in a measure the apprehensions of the sailor as to the reporter he simply answered upon my word pencroff i don't think it matters much but i tell you again we have no fire pshaw nor any means of lighting one absurd but mr spilett is not cyrus here asked the reporter isn't he alive he will know well enough how to make fire and with what with nothing what could pencroff answer he had nothing to say as in his heart he shared his companion's confidence in cyrus smith's ability to them the engineer was a microcosm a compound of all science and all knowledge they were better off on a desert island with cyrus than without him in the busiest city of the union with him they could want for nothing with him they would have no fear if they had been told that the volcanic eruption would overwhelm the land sinking it into the depths of the pacific the imperturbable answer of these brave men would have been have we not cyrus meantime the engineer had sunk into a lethargy the result of the journey and his help could not be asked for just then the supper therefore would be very meagre all the tetras had been eaten there was no way to cook other birds and finally the kurukus which had been reserved had disappeared something therefore must be done first of all cyrus smith was carried into the main corridor there they were able to make for him a couch of seaweeds and doubtless the deep sleep in which he was plunged would strengthen him more than an abundant nourishment with night the temperature which the northwest wind had raised again became very cold and as the sea had washed away the partitions which pencroff had constructed droughts of air made the place scarcely habitable the engineer would therefore have been in a bad plight if his companions had not covered him with clothing which they took from themselves 
the supper this evening consisted of the inevitable lithodomes an ample supply of which herbert and neb had gathered from the beach to these the lad had added a quantity of edible seaweed which clung to the high rocks and were only washed by the highest tides these seaweeds belonging to the family of fucasi were a species of sargassum which when dry furnished a gelatinous substance full of nutritive energy much used by the natives of the asiatic coast after having eaten a quantity of lithodomes the reporter and his companions sucked some of the seaweed which they agreed was excellent nevertheless said the sailor it is time for mr smith to help us meantime the cold became intense and unfortunately they had no means of protecting themselves the sailor much worried tried every possible means of procuring a fire and by striking two stones together he obtained sparks but the moss was not sufficiently inflammable to catch fire nor had the sparks the strength of those struck by a steel the operation amounted to nothing then pencroff although he had no confidence in the result tried rubbing two pieces of dry wood together after the manner of the savages it is true that the motion of the man if it could have been turned into heat according to the new theory would have heated the boiler of a steamer but it resulted in nothing except putting him in a glow and making the wood hot after half an hour's work pencroff was in a perspiration and he threw away the wood in disgust when you can make me believe the savages make fire after that fashion said he it will be hot in winter i might as well try to light my arms by rubbing them together but the sailor was wrong to deny the feasibility of this method the savages frequently do light wood in this way but it requires particular kinds of wood and moreover the knack and pencroff had not this knack pencroff's ill-humour did not last long the bits of wood which he had thrown away had been picked up by herbert who exerted himself to rub them well the strong sailor could not help laughing at the boy's weak efforts to accomplish what he had failed in rub away my boy rub hard he cried i am rubbing them answered herbert laughing but only to take my turn at getting warm instead of sitting here shivering and pretty soon i will be as hot as you are pencroff this was the case and though it was necessary for this night to give up trying to make a fire spilett stretching himself upon the sand in one of the passages repeated for the twentieth time that smith could not be baffled by such a trifle the others followed his example and top slept at the feet of his master the next day the twenty eighth of march when the engineer awoke about eight o'clock he saw his companions beside him watching and as on the day before his first words were island or continent it was his one thought well mr smith answered pencroff we don't know you haven't found out yet but we will affirmed pencroff when you are able to guide us in this country i believe that i am able to do that now answered the engineer who without much effort rose up and stood erect that is good exclaimed the sailor i am dying of hunger responded smith give me some food my friend and i will feel better you fire haven't you this question met with no immediate answer but after some moments the sailor said no sir we have no fire at least not now and he related what had happened the day before he amused the engineer by recounting the history of their solitary match and their fruitless efforts to procure fire like the savages we will think about it answered the engineer and if we cannot find something like tinder well asked the sailor well we will make matches friction matches friction matches it's no more difficult than that cried the reporter slapping the sailor on the shoulder the latter did not see that it would be that easy but he said nothing and all went out of doors the day was beautiful a bright sun was rising above the sea horizon its rays sparkling and glistening on the granite wall after having cast a quick look about him the engineer seated himself upon a rock herbert offered him some handfuls of mussels and seaweed saying it is all that we have mr smith thank you my boy answered he it is enough for this morning at least and he ate with appetite this scanty meal washing it down with water brought from the river in a large shell his companions looked on without speaking 
then after having satisfied himself he crossed his arms and said then my friends you do not yet know whether we have been thrown upon an island or a continent no sir answered herbert we will find out to-morrow said the engineer until then there is nothing to do there is one thing suggested pencroff what is that some fire replied the sailor who thought of nothing else we will have it pencroff said smith but when you were carrying me here yesterday did i not see a mountain rising in the west yes said spilett quite a high one all right exclaimed the engineer to-morrow we will climb to its summit and determine whether this is an island or a continent until then i repeat there is nothing to do but there is we want fire cried the obstinate sailor again have a little patience pencroff and we will have the fire said spilett the other looked at the reporter as much as to say if there was only you to make it we would never taste roast meat but he kept silent smith had not spoken he seemed little concerned about this question of fire for some moments he remained absorbed in his own thoughts then he spoke as follows my friends our situation is doubtless deplorable nevertheless it is very simple either we are upon a continent and in that case at the expense of greater or less fatigue we will reach some inhabited place or else we are on an island in the latter case it is one of two things if the island is inhabited we will get out of our difficulty by the help of the inhabitants if it is deserted we will get out of it by ourselves nothing could be plainer than that said pencroff but asked spilett whether it is a continent or an island whereabouts do you think this storm has thrown us cyrus in truth i cannot say replied the engineer but the probability is that we are somewhere in the pacific when we left richmond the wind was northeast and its very violence proves that its direction did not vary much supposing it unchanged we crossed north and south carolina georgia the gulf of mexico and the narrow part of mexico and a portion of the pacific ocean i do not estimate the distance traversed by the balloon at less than six thousand or seven thousand miles and even if the wind had varied a half a quarter it would have carried us either to the marquesas island or to the low archipelago or if it was stronger than i suppose as far as new zealand if this last hypothesis is correct our return home will be easy english or maoris we shall always find somebody with whom to speak if on the other hand this coast belongs to some barren island in the micronesian archipelago perhaps we can reconnoiter it from the summit of this mountain and then we will consider how to establish ourselves here as if we were never going to leave it never cried the reporter do you say never my dear cyrus it is better to put things in their worst light at first answered the engineer and to reserve those which are better as a surprise well said replied pencroff and we hope that this island if it is an island will not be situated just outside of the route of ships for that would indeed be unlucky we will know how to act after having first ascended the mountain answered smith but will you be able mr smith to make the climb to-morrow asked herbert i hope so answered the engineer if pencroff and you my boy show yourselves to be good and ready hunters mr smith said the sailor since you are speaking of game if when i come back i am as sure of getting it roasted as i am of bringing it bring it nevertheless interrupted smith it was now agreed that the engineer and the reporter should spend the day at the chimneys in order to examine the shore and the plateau while neb herbert and the sailor were to return to the forest renew the supply of wood and lay hands on every bird and beast that should cross their path so at six o'clock the party left herbert confident neb happy and pencroff muttering to himself if when i get back i find a fire in the house it will have been the lightning that lit it the three climbed the bank and having reached the turn in the river the sailor stopped and said to his companions shall we begin as hunters or woodchoppers hunters answered herbert see top who is already at it let us hunt then replied the sailor and on our return here we will lay in our stock of wood this said the party made three clubs for themselves and followed top who was jumping about in the high grass 
This time the hunters, instead of following the course of the stream, struck at once into the depths of the forest. The trees were for the most part of the pine family, and in certain places, where they stood in small groups, they were of such a size as to indicate that this country was in a higher latitude than the engineer supposed. Some openings, bristling with stumps decayed by the weather, were covered with dead timber, which formed an inexhaustible reserve of firewood. Then, the opening passed, the underwood became so thick as to be nearly impenetrable. To guide oneself among these great trees without any beaten path was very difficult. So, the sailor from time to time blazed the route by breaking branches in a manner easily recognizable but perhaps they would have done better to have followed the water-course as in the first instance as after an hour's march no game had been taken top running under the low boughs only flashed birds that were unapproachable even the kurukus were invisible and it seemed likely that the sailor would be obliged to return to that swampy place where he had fished for tetras with such good luck well pencroff said neb sarcastically if this is all the game you promised to carry back to my master it won't take much fire to roast it wait a bit neb answered the sailor it won't be game that will be wanting on our return don't you believe in mr smith yes but you don't believe he will make a fire i will believe that when the wood is blazing in the fireplace it will blaze then for my master has said so well we'll see meanwhile the sun had not yet risen to its highest point above the horizon the exploration went on and was signalized by herbert's discovery of a tree bearing edible fruit it was the pistachio pine which bears an excellent fruit much liked in the temperate regions of america and europe these nuts were perfectly ripe and herbert showed them to his companions who feasted on them well said pencroff seaweed for bread raw mussels for meat and nuts for dessert that's the sort of dinner for men who haven't a match in their pocket. It's not worthwhile complaining, replied Herbert. I don't complain, my boy. I simply repeat that the meat is a little too scant in this sort of meal. Top has seen something, cried Neb, running towards a thicket into which the dog had disappeared barking. With the dog's barks were mingled singular gruntings. The sailor and Herbert had followed the negro. If it were game, this was not the time to discuss how to cook it, but rather how to secure it. The hunters, on entering the brush, saw Top struggling with an animal, which he held by the ear. This quadruped was a species of pig, about two feet and a half long, of a brownish-black color, somewhat lighter under the belly, having harsh and somewhat scanty hair, and its toes, at this time strongly grasping the soil, seemed joined together by membranes herbert thought that he had recognized in this animal a cabiai or water hog one of the largest specimens of the order of rodents the water hog did not fight the dog its great eyes deep sank in thick layers of fat rolled stupidly from side to side and neb grasping his club firmly was about to knock the beast down when the latter tore loose from top leaving a piece of his ear in the dog's mouth and uttering a vigorous grunt rushed against and overset herbert and disappeared in the wood the beggar cried pencroff as they all three darted after the hog but just as they had come up to it again the water hog disappeared under the surface of a large pond overshadowed by tall ancient pines the three companions stopped motionless top had plunged into the water but the cabiai hidden at the bottom of the pond did not appear wait said the boy he will have to come to the surface to breathe won't he drown asked neb no answered herbert since he is fin-toed and almost amphibious but watch for him top remained in the water and pencroff and his companions took stations upon the bank to cut off the animal's retreat while the dog swam to and fro looking for him herbert was not mistaken in a few minutes the animal came again to the surface top was upon him at once keeping him from diving again and a moment later the cabiai dragged to the shore was struck down by a blow from neb's club hurrah cried pencroff with all his heart nothing but a clear fire and this gnawer should be gnawed to the bone pencroff lifted the carcass to his shoulder and judging by the sun that it must be near two o'clock he gave the signal to return top's instinct was useful to the hunters as thanks to that intelligent animal they were enabled to return upon their steps 
In half an hour they had reached the bend of the river. There, as before, Pencroff quickly constructed a raft. Although, lacking fire, this seemed to him a useless job, and, with the raft keeping the current, they returned towards the chimneys. But the sailor had not gone fifty paces when he stopped and gave utterance anew to a tremendous hurrah, and extending his hands towards the angle of the cliff. "'Herbert! Neb! See!' he cried. Smoke was escaping and curling above the rocks. End of chapter 9「10 of Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter 10. The Engineer's Invention. Island or Continent. Departure for the Mountain. The Forest. Volcanic Soil. The Tragopans the mouflons the first plateau encamping for the night the summit of the cone a few minutes afterwards the three hunters were seated before a sparkling fire beside them sat cyrus smith and the reporter pencroff looked from one to the other without saying a word his cabiai in his hand yes my good fellow said the reporter a fire a real fire that will roast your game to a turn but who lighted it said the sailor the sun the sailor could not believe his eyes and was too stupefied to question the engineer had you a burning glass sir asked herbert of cyrus smith no my boy said he but i made one and he showed his extemporized lens it was simply the two glasses from his own watch and the reporter's which he had taken out filled with water and stuck together at the edges with a little clay thus he had made a veritable burning glass and by concentrating the solar rays on some dry moss had set it on fire the sailor examined the lens then he looked at the engineer without saying a word but his face spoke for him if smith was not a magician to him he was certainly more than a man at last his speech returned and he said put that down mr spilett put that down in your book i have it down said the reporter then with the help of neb the sailor arranged the spit and dressed the cabiai for roasting like a sucking pig before the sparkling fire by whose warmth and by the restoration of the partitions the chimneys had been rendered habitable the engineer and his companions had made good use of their day smith had almost entirely recovered his strength which he had tested by climbing the plateau above from thence his eye accustomed to measure heights and distances had attentively examined the cone whose summit he proposed to reach on the morrow the mountain situated about six miles to the northwest seemed to him to reach about three thousand five hundred feet above the level of the sea so that an observer posted at the summit could command a horizon of fifty miles at least he hoped therefore for an easy solution of the urgent question island or continent they had a pleasant supper and the meat of the cabiai was proclaimed excellent the sargassum and pistachio nuts completed the repast but the engineer said little he was planning for the next day once or twice pencroft talked of some project for the future but smith shook his head to-morrow he said we will know how we are situated and we can act accordingly after supper more armfuls of wood were thrown on the fire and the party lay down to sleep the morning found them fresh and eager for the expedition which was to settle their fate everything was ready enough was left of the cabiai for twenty-four hours provisions and they hoped to replenish their stock on the way they charred a little linen for tinder as the watch glasses had been replaced and flint abounded in this volcanic region at half past seven they left the chimneys each with a stout cudgel by pencroff's advice they took the route of the previous day which was the shortest way to the mountain they turned the southern angle and followed the left bank of the river leaving it where it bent to the southwest they took the beaten path under the evergreens and soon reached the northern border of the forest the soil flat and swampy then dry and sandy rose by a gradual slope towards the interior among the trees appeared a few shy animals which rapidly took flight before top the engineer called his dog back 
Later, perhaps, they might hunt, but now nothing could distract him from his great object. He observed neither the character of the ground nor the products. He was going straight for the top of the mountain. At ten o'clock they were clear of the forest, and they halted for a while to observe the country. The mountain was composed of two cones. The first was truncated about 2,500 feet up, and supported by fantastic spurs, branching out like the talons of an immense claw laid upon the ground. Between these spurs were narrow valleys, thick-set with trees, whose topmost foliage was level with the flat summit of the first cone. On the northern side of the mountain, vegetation was more scanty, and the ground was seamed here and there, apparently with currents of lava. On the first cone lay a second, slightly rounded towards the summit. It lay somewhat across the other, like a huge head cocked over the ear. The surface seemed utterly bare, with reddish rocks often protruding. The object of the expedition was to reach the top of this cone, and their best way was along the edge of the spurs. "'We are in a volcanic country,' said Cyrus Smith, as they began to climb little by little up the side of the spurs, whose winding summit would most readily bring them out upon the lower plateau. The ground was strewn with traces of igneous convulsion. Here and there lay blocks, debris of basalt, pumice stone, and obsidian. In isolated clumps rose some few of those conifers, which, hundreds of feet lower, in the narrow gorges, formed a gigantic thicket, impenetrable to the sun. As they climbed these lower slopes, Herbert called attention to the recent marks of huge paws and hoofs on the ground. "'These brutes will make a fight for their territory,' said Pencroff. "'Oh, well,' said the reporter, who had hunted tigers in India and lions in Africa, "'we shall contrive to get rid of them. In the meanwhile we must be on our guard.' While talking they were gradually ascending. The way was lengthened by detours around the obstacles which could not be directly surmounted. Sometimes, too, deep crevasses yawned across the ascent, and compelled them to return upon their tracks for a long distance, before they could find an available pathway. At noon, when the little company halted to dine at the foot of a great clump of firs, at whose foot bubbled a tiny brook, they were still halfway from the first plateau, and could hardly reach it before nightfall. From this point the sea stretched broad beneath their feet, but on the right their vision was arrested by the sharp promontory of the southeast which left them in doubt whether there was land beyond. On the left they could see directly north for several miles, but the northwest was concealed from them by the crest of a fantastic spur, which formed a massive abutment to the central cone. They could, therefore, make no approach as yet to the solving of the great question. At one o'clock the ascent was again begun. The easiest route slanted upward towards the southwest, through the thick copse. There, under the trees, were flying about a number of Gallinaceae, of the pheasant family. These were tragopans, adorned with a sort of fleshy wattles hanging over their necks, and with two little cylindrical horns behind their eyes. Of these birds, which were about the size of a hen, the female was invariably brown, while the male was resplendent in a coat of red, with little spots of white. With a well-aimed stone, Spilett killed one of the tragopans, which the hungry Pencroff looked at with longing eyes. Leaving the copse, the climbers, by mounting on each other's shoulders, ascended for a hundred feet up a very steep hill, and reached a terrace, almost bare of trees, whose soil was evidently volcanic. From hence their course was a zigzag towards the east, for the declivity was so steep that they had to take every point of vantage. Neb and Herbert led the way. Then came Smith and the reporter. Pencroff was last. The animals who lived among these heights, and whose traces were not wanting, must have the sure foot and the supple spine of a chamois or an izard. They saw some to whom Pencroff gave a name of his own. Sheep, he cried. They all had stopped fifty feet from half a dozen large animals, with thick horns curved backwards, hidden under long, silky, fawn-colored hair. They were not the common sheep, but a species widely distributed through the mountainous regions of the temperate zone. Their name, according to Herbert, was Mouflon. "'Have they legs and chops?' asked the sailor. "'Yes,' replied Herbert. "'Then they are sheep,' said Pencroff. The animals stood motionless and astonished at their first sight of man. Then, seized with a sudden fear, they fled, leaping away amongst the rocks. "'Good-bye, till next time!' 
cried Pencroff to them in a tone so comical that the others could not forbear laughing. As the ascension continued, the traces of lava were more frequent, and little sulphur springs intercepted their route. At some points sulphur had been deposited in crystals, in the midst of the sand and whitish cinders of feldspar, which generally precede the eruption of lava. As they neared the first plateau, formed by the truncation of the lower cone, the ascent became very difficult. By four o'clock the last belt of trees had been passed. Here and there stood a few dwarfed and distorted pines, which had survived the attacks of the furious winds. Fortunately for the engineer and his party, it was a pleasant, mild day, for a high wind at the altitude of three thousand feet would have interfered with them sadly. The sky overhead was extremely bright and clear. A perfect calm reigned around them. The sun was hidden by the upper mountain, which cast its shadow like a vast screen, westward to the edge of the sea. A thin haze began to appear in the east, colored with all the rays of the solar spectrum. There were only five hundred feet between the explorers and the plateau where they meant to encamp for the night, but these five hundred were increased to two thousand and more by the tortuous route. The ground, so to speak, gave way under their feet. The angle of ascent was often so obtuse that they slipped upon the smooth worn lava. Little by little the evening set in, and it was almost night when the party, tired out by a seven hours climb, arrived at the top of the first cone. Now they must pitch their camp and think of supper and sleep. The upper terrace of the mountain rose upon a base of rocks, amid which they could soon find a shelter. Firewood was not plenty, yet the moss and dry thistles so abundant on the plateau would serve their turn. The sailor built up a fireplace with huge stones, while Neb and Herbert went after the combustibles. They soon came back with a load of thistles and with flint and steel, and as Neb began to blow the fire, a bright blaze was soon sparkling behind the rocks. It was for warmth only, for they kept the pheasant for the next day, and supped of the rest of the cabiai and a few dozen pistachio nuts. It was only half-past six when the meal was ended. Cyrus Smith resolved to explore, in the semi-obscurity, the great circular pediment which upheld the topmost cone of the mountain. Before taking rest, he was anxious to know whether the base of the cone could be passed, in case the flanks should prove too steep for ascent. So, regardless of fatigue, he left Pencroff and Nab to make the sleeping arrangements, and Spilett to note down the incidents of the day, and, taking Herbert with him, began to walk around the base of the plateau towards the north. The night was beautiful and still, and not yet very dark. They walked together in silence. Sometimes the plateau was wide and easy, sometimes so encumbered with rubbish that the two could not walk abreast. Finally, after twenty minutes' tramp, they were brought to a halt. From this point the slant of the two cones was equal. To walk around the mountain upon the acclivity whose angle was nearly seventy-five degrees was impossible. But, though they had to give up their flank movement, the chance of a direct ascent was suddenly offered to them. Before them opened an immense chasm in the solid rock. It was the mouth of the upper crater, the gullet, so to speak, through which, when the volcano was active, the eruption took place. Inside, hardened lava and scoria formed a sort of natural staircase, with enormous steps, by which they might possibly reach the summit. Smith saw the opportunity at a glance, and, followed by the boy, he walked unhesitatingly into the huge crevasse, in the midst of the gathering darkness. There were yet one thousand feet to climb. Could they scale the interior wall of the crater? They would try at all events. Fortunately, the long and sinuous declivities described a winding staircase, and greatly helped their ascent. The crater was evidently exhausted. Not a puff of smoke, not a glimmer of fire escaped, not a sound or motion in the dark abyss, reaching down perhaps to the centre of the globe. The air within retained no taint of sulphur. The volcano was not only quiet, but extinct. Evidently, the attempt was to succeed. Gradually, as the two mounted the inner walls, they saw the crater grow larger over their heads. The light from the outer sky visibly increased. At each step, so to speak, which they made, new stars entered the field of their vision. The magnificent constellations of the southern sky shone resplendent. In the zenith glittered the splendid Antares of the Scorpion, and not far off that Beta of the Centaur, which is believed to be the nearest star to our terrestrial globe. Then, as the crater opened, appeared Fomalhot of the fish, 
the triangle and at last almost at the antarctic pole the glowing southern cross it was nearly eight o'clock when they set foot on the summit of the cone the darkness was by this time complete and they could hardly see a couple of miles around them was the land an island or the eastern extremity of a continent they could not yet discover towards the west a band of cloud clearly defined against the horizon deepened the obscurity and confounded sea with sky but at one point of the horizon suddenly appeared a vague light which slowly sank as the clouds mounted to the zenith it was the slender crescent of the moon just about to disappear but the line of the horizon was now cloudless and as the moon touched it the engineer could see her face mirrored for an instant on a liquid surface he seized the boy's hand an island said he as the lunar crescent disappeared behind the waves End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter eleven at the summit of the cone the interior of the crater sea everywhere no land in sight a bird's view of the coast hydrography and orography is the island inhabited a geographical baptism lincoln island a half hour later they walked back to the camp the engineer contented himself with saying to his comrades that the country was an island and that to-morrow they would consider what to do then each disposed himself to sleep and in this basalt cave two thousand five hundred feet above sea level they passed a quiet night in profound repose the next day march the thirtieth after a hurried breakfast on roast tragopan they started out for the summit of the volcano all desired to see the isle on which perhaps they were to spend their lives and to ascertain how far it lay from other land and how near the course of vessels bound for the archipelagos of the pacific it was about seven o'clock in the morning when they left the camp no one seemed dismayed by the situation they had faith in themselves no doubt but the source of that faith was not the same with smith as with his companions they trusted in him he in his ability to extort from the wilderness around them all the necessaries of life as for pencroff he would not have despaired since the rekindling of the fire by the engineer's lens if he had found himself upon a barren rock if only smith was with him bah said he we got out of richmond without the permission of the authorities and it would be strange if we can't get away some time from a place when no one wants to keep us they followed the route of the day before flanking the cone till they reached the enormous crevasse it was a superb day and the southern side of the mountain was bathed in sunlight the crater as the engineer had supposed was a huge shaft gradually opening to a height of one thousand feet above the plateau from the bottom of the crevasse large currents of lava meandered down the flanks of the mountain indicating the path of the eruptive matter down to the lower valleys which furrowed the north of the island the interior of the crater which had an inclination of thirty-five or forty degrees was easily scaled they saw on the way traces of ancient lava which had probably gushed from the summit of the cone before the lateral opening had given it a new way of escape as to the volcano chimney which communicated with the subterranean abyss its depth could not be estimated by the eye for it was lost in obscurity but there seemed no doubt that the volcano was completely extinct before eight o'clock the party were standing at the summit of the crater on a conical elevation of the northern side the sea the sea everywhere was the universal exclamation there it lay an immense sheet of water around them on every side perhaps smith had hoped that daylight would reveal some neighboring coast or island but nothing appeared to the horizon line a radius of more than fifty miles not a sail was in sight around the island stretched a desert infinity of ocean silent and motionless they surveyed every point of the horizon they strained their eyes to the uttermost limit of the ocean but even pencroff to whom nature had given a pair of telescopes instead of eyes and who could have detected land even in the faintest haze upon the sea-line could see nothing 
then they looked down upon their island and the silence was broken by spilett how large do you think the island is it seemed small enough in the midst of the infinite ocean smith thought a while noticed the circumference of the island and allowed for the elevation my friends he said if i'm not mistaken the coast of the island is more than one hundred miles around then its surface will be this is hard to estimate the outline is so irregular if smith was right the island would be about the size of malta or zante in the mediterranean but it was more irregular than they and at the same time had fewer capes promontories points bays and creeks its form was very striking when spilett drew it they declared it was like some fantastic sea beast some monstrous pteropod asleep on the surface of the pacific the exact configuration of the island may thus be described the eastern coast upon which the castaways had landed was a decided curve embracing a large bay terminating at the southeast in a sharp promontory which the shape of the land had hidden from pencroff on his first exploration on the northeast two other capes shut in the bay and between them lay a narrow gulf like the half-open jaws of some formidable dogfish from northeast to northwest the coast was round and flat like the skull of a wild beast then came a sort of indeterminate hump whose centre was occupied by the volcanic mountain from this point the coast ran directly north and south for two-thirds of its length it was bordered by a narrow creek then it finished in a long queue like a tail of a gigantic alligator this queue formed a veritable peninsula which extended more than thirty miles into the sea reckoning from the southeast cape before mentioned these thirty miles the south coast of the island described an open bay the narrowest part of the island between the chimneys and the creek on the west was ten miles wide but its greatest length from the jaw in the northeast to the extremity of the southwest peninsula was not less than thirty miles the general aspect of the interior was as follows the southern part from the shore to the mountain was covered with woods the northern part was arid and sandy between the volcano and the eastern coast the party were surprised to see a lake surrounded by evergreens whose existence they had not suspected viewed from such a height it seemed to be on the same level with the sea but on reflection the engineer explained to his companions that it must be at least three hundred feet higher for the plateau on which it lay was as high as that of the coast so then it is a freshwater lake asked pencroff yes said the engineer for it must be fed by the mountain streams i can see a little river flowing into it said herbert pointing to a narrow brook whose source was evidently in the spurs of the western cliff true said smith and since this brook flows into the lake there is probably some outlet towards the sea for the overflow we will see about that when we go back this little winding stream and the river so familiar to them were all the water courses they could see nevertheless it was possible that under those masses of trees which covered two-thirds of the island other streams flowed towards the sea this seemed the more probable from the fertility of the country and its magnificent display of the flora of the temperate zone in the northern section there was no indication of running water perhaps there might be stagnant pools in the swampy part of the northeast but that was all in the main this region was composed of arid sand hills and downs contrasting strongly with the fertility of the larger portion the volcano did not occupy the centre of the island it rose in the northwest and seemed to indicate the dividing line of those two zones on the southwest south and southeast the beginnings of the spurs were lost in masses of verdure to the north on the contrary these ramifications were plainly visible subsiding gradually to the level of the sandy plain on this side too when the volcano was active the eruptions had taken place and a great bed of lava existed as far as the narrow jaw which formed the northeastern gulf they remained for an hour at the summit of the mountain the island lay stretched before them like a plan in relief with its different tints green for the forest yellow for the sands blue for the water they understood the configuration of the entire land only the bottoms of the shady valleys and the depths of the narrow gorges between the spurs of the volcano concealed by the spreading foliage escaped their searching eye there remained a question of great moment 
whose answer would have a controlling influence upon the fortunes of the castaways was the island inhabited it was the reporter who put this question which seemed already to have been answered in the negative by the minute examination which they had just made of the different portions of the island nowhere could they perceive the handiwork of man no late settlement on the beach not even a lonely cabin or a fisherman's hut no smoke rising on the air betrayed a human presence it is true the observers were thirty miles from the long peninsula which extended to the southwest and upon which even pencroff's eye could hardly have discovered a dwelling nor could they raise the curtain of foliage which covered three-fourths of the island to see whether some village lay sheltered there but the natives of these little islands in the pacific usually live in the coast and the coast seemed absolutely deserted until they should make a more complex exploration they might assume that the island was uninhabited but was it ever frequented by the inhabitants of neighboring islands this question was difficult to answer no land appeared within a radius of fifty miles but fifty miles could easily be traversed by malay canoes or by the larger pirogues of the polynesians everything depended upon the situation of the island on its isolation in the pacific or its proximity to the archipelagos could smith succeed without his instruments in determining the latitude and longitude it would be difficult and in the uncertainty they must take precautions against an attack from savage neighbors the exploration of the island was finished its configuration determined a map of it drawn its size calculated and the distribution of its land and water ascertained the forests and the plains had been roughly sketched upon the reporter's map they had only now to descend the declivities of the mountain and to examine into the animal vegetable and mineral resources of the country but before giving the signal of departure cyrus smith in a calm grave voice addressed his companions look my friends upon this little corner of the earth on which the hand of the almighty had cast us here perhaps we may long dwell perhaps too unexpected help will arrive should some ship chance to pass i say chance because this island is of slight importance without even a harbour for ships i fear it is situated out of the usual course of vessels too far south for those which frequent the archipelagos of the pacific too far north for those bound to australia round cape horn i will not disguise from you our situation and you are right my dear cyrus said the reporter eagerly you are dealing with men they trust you and you can count on them can he not my friends i will obey you in everything mr smith said herbert taking the engineer's hand may i lose my name said the sailor if i shirk my part if you choose mr smith we will make a little america here we will build cities lay railroads establish telegraphs and some day when the island is transformed and civilized offer her to the united states but one thing i should like to ask what is that said the reporter that we should not consider ourselves any longer as castaways but as colonists cyrus smith could not help smiling and the motion was adopted then smith thanked his companions and added that he counted upon their energy and upon the help of heaven well let's start for the chimneys said pencroff one minute my friends answered the engineer would it not be well to name the islands as well as the capes promontories and watercourses which we see before us good said the reporter that will simplify for the future the instructions which we may have to give or to take yes added the sailor it will be something gained to be able to say whence we are coming and where we are going we shall seem to be somewhere at the chimneys for instance said herbert exactly said the sailor that name has been quite convenient already and i was the author of it shall we keep that name for our first encampment mr smith yes pencroff since you baptized it so good the others will be easy enough resumed the sailor who was now in the vein let us give them the names like those of the swiss family robinson whose story herbert had read me more than once providence bay cachalot point cape disappointment or rather mr smith's name mr spilett's or neb's said herbert my name cried neb showing his white teeth why not replied pencroff port neb would sound first-rate and cape gideon i would rather have names taken from our country said the reporter which will recall america to us yes said smith the principal features the bays and seas should be so named 
for instance let us call the great bay to the east union bay the southern indentation washington bay the mountain on which we are standing mount franklin the lake beneath our feet lake grant these names will recall our country and the great citizens who have honored it but for the smaller features let us choose names which will suggest their especial configuration these will remain in our memory and be more convenient at the same time the shape of the island is so peculiar that we shall have no trouble in finding appropriate names the streams the creeks and the forest regions yet to be discovered we will baptize as they come what say you my friends the engineer's proposal was unanimously applauded the inland bay unrolled like a map before their eyes and they had only to name the features of its contour and relief spilett would put down the names over the proper places and the geographical nomenclature of the island would be complete first they named the two bays and the mountain as the engineer had suggested now said the reporter to that peninsula projecting from the southwest i propose to give the name of serpentine peninsula and to call the twisted curve at the termination of it reptile land for it is just like a snake's tail motion carried said the engineer and the other extremity of the island said herbert the gulf so like an open pair of jaws let us call it shark gulf good enough said pencroff and we may complete the figure by calling the two sides of the gulf mandible cape but there are two capes observed the reporter well we will have them north mandible and south mandible i've put them down said spilett now we must name the southwestern extremity of the island said pencroff you mean the end of union bay asked herbert claw cape suggested neb who wished to have his turn as godfather and he had chosen an excellent name for this cape was very like the powerful claw of the fantastic animal to which they had compared the island pencroff was enchanted with the turn things were taking and their active imaginations soon supplied other names the river which furnished them with fresh water and near which the balloon had cast them on shore they called the mercy in gratitude to providence the islet on which they had first set foot was safety island the plateau at the top of the high granite wall above the chimneys from which the whole sweep of the bay was visible prospect plateau and finally that mass of impenetrable woods which covered serpentine peninsula the forests of the far west the engineer had approximately determined by the height and position of the sun the situation of the island with reference to the cardinal points and had put union bay and prospect plateau to the east but on the morrow by taking the exact time of the sun's rising and setting and noting its situation at the time exactly intermediate he expected to ascertain precisely the northern point of the island for on account of its situation on the southern hemisphere the sun at the moment of its culmination would pass to the north and not to the south as it does in the northern hemisphere all was settled and the colonists were about to descend the mountain when pencroff cried why what idiots are we why so said spilett who had gotten up and closed his notebook we have forgotten to baptize our island herbert was about to propose to give it the name of the engineer and his companions would have applauded the choice when cyrus smith said quietly let us give it the name of a great citizen my friends of the defender of american unity let us call it lincoln island they greeted the proposal with three hurrahs End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter twelve regulation of watches pencroff is satisfied a suspicious smoke the course of red creek the flora of the island its fauna mountain pheasants a kangaroo chase the agouti lake grant return to the chimneys the colonists of lincoln island cast a last look about them and walked once again around the verge of the crater half an hour afterwards they were again upon the lower plateau at their encampment of the previous night pencroff thought it was breakfast time and so came up the question of regulating the watches of smith and spilett the reporter's chronometer was uninjured by the sea-water 
as he had been cast high up on the sand beyond the reach of the waves. It was an admirable timepiece, a veritable pocket chronometer, and Spilett had wounded up regularly every day. The engineer's watch, of course, had stopped while he lay upon the downs. He now wounded up and set it at nine o'clock, estimating the time approximately by the height of the sun. Spilett was about to do the same when the engineer stopped him. "'Wait, my dear Spilett,' said he. "'You have the Richmond time, have you not?' "'Yes.' "'Your watch, then, is regulated by the meridian of that city, which is very nearly that of Washington?' certainly well keep it so wind it up carefully but do not touch the hands this may be of use to us what's the use of that thought the sailor they made such a hearty meal that little was left of the meat and pistachio nuts but pencroff did not trouble himself about that top who had not been forgotten in the feast would certainly find some new game in the thicket Besides, the sailor had made up his mind to ask Smith to make some powder and one or two shotguns, which he thought would be an easy matter. As they were leaving the plateau, Smith proposed to his companions to take a new road back to the chimneys. He wished to explore Lake Grant, which lay surrounded so beautifully with trees. They followed the crest of one of the spurs in which the creek which fed the lake probably had its source. The colonists employed in the conversation only the proper names which they had just devised, and found that they could express themselves much more easily. Herbert and Pencroff, one of whom was young and the other something of a child, were delighted, and the sailor said as they walked along, "'Well, Herbert, this is jolly. We can't lose ourselves now, my boy, since whether we follow Lake Grant or get to the Mercy through the woods of the far west, we must come to Prospect Plateau, and so to Union Bay. It had been agreed that, without marching in a squad, the colonists should not keep too far apart. Dangerous wild beasts surely inhabited the forest recesses, and they must be on their guard. Usually Pencroff, Herbert, and Neb walked in front, preceded by Top, who poked his nose into every corner. The reporter and engineer walked together, the former ready to note down every incident, the latter seldom speaking, and turning aside only to pick up sometimes one thing, sometimes another, vegetable or mineral, which he put in his pocket without saying a word. "'What the mischief is he picking up?' muttered Pencroff. "'There's no use in looking. I see nothing worth the trouble of stooping for.' About ten o'clock the little company descended the last declivities of Mount Franklin. A few bushes and trees were scattered over the ground. They were walking on a yellowish calcinated soil, forming a plain about a mile long, which extended to the border of the wood. Large fragments of that basalt, which, according to Bischoff's theory, had taken 350 million years to cool, strewn the uneven surface of the plain. Yet there was no trace of lava, which had especially found an exit down the northern declivities. Smith thought they should soon reach the creek, which he expected to find flowing under the trees by the plain, when he saw Herbert running back, and Neb and the sailor hiding themselves behind the rocks. "'What's the matter, my boy?' said Spilett. "'Smoke,' answered Herbert. "'We saw smoke ascending from among the rocks, a hundred steps in front.' "'Men, in this region,' cried the reporter. "'We must not show ourselves till we know with whom we have to deal.' answered smith i have more fear than hope of the natives if there are any such on the island where is top top is on ahead and has not barked no this is strange still let us try to call him back in a few moments the three had rejoined their companions and had hidden themselves like neb and pencroff behind the basalt rubbish thence they saw very evidently a yellowish smoke curling into the air Top was recalled by a low whistle from his master, who motioned to his comrades to wait, and stole forward under cover of the rocks. In perfect stillness the party awaited the result, when a call from Smith summoned them forward. In a moment they were by his side, and were struck at once by the disagreeable smell which pervaded the atmosphere. This odor, unmistakable as it was, had been sufficient to reassure the engineer. "'Nature is responsible for that fire,' he said, or rather for that smoke. It is nothing but a sulphur spring, which will be good for our sore throats. Good, said Pencroff. What a pity I have not a cold. The colonists walked towards the smoke. There they beheld a spring of sulphate of soda, 
which flowed in currents among the rocks, and whose waters, absorbing the oxygen of the air, gave off a lively odor of sulphahydric acid. Smith dipped his hand into the spring and found it oily. He tasted it, and perceived a sweetish odor. Its temperature he estimated at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and when Herbert asked him on what he based his estimate, simply my boy said he because when i put my hand into this water i have no sensation either of heat or of cold therefore it is at the same temperature as the human body that is about ninety five degrees then as the spring of sulphur could be put to no present use the colonists walked towards the thick border of the forest a few hundred paces distant there as they had thought the brook rolled its bright limpid waters between high reddish banks whose color betrayed the presence of oxide of iron. On account of this color, they instantly named the watercourse Red Creek. It was nothing but a large mountain brook, deep and clear, here flowing quietly over the lands, there gurgling amid rocks, or falling in a cascade, but always flowing towards the lake. It was a mile and a half long. Its breadth varied from thirty to forty feet. Its water was fresh, which argued that those of the lake would be found the same a fortunate occurrence in case they should find upon its banks a more comfortable dwelling than the chimneys the trees which a few hundred paces downstream overshadowed the banks of the creek belonged principally to the species which abound in the temperate zone of australia and tasmania and belonged to those conifers which clothed the portion of the island already explored some miles around prospect plateau it was now the beginning of april a month which corresponds in that hemisphere to our october yet their leaves had not begun to fall they were especially casuarine and eucalypti some of which in the ensuing spring would furnish a sweetish manna like that of the east clumps of australian cedars rose in the glades covered high with that sort of moss which the new hollanders called tassocks but the cocoa palm so abundant in the archipelagos of the pacific was conspicuous by its absence probably the latitude of the island was too low what a pity said herbert such a useful tree and such splendid nuts there were flocks of birds on the thin boughs of the eucalypti and the casuarine which gave fine play to their wings black white and gray cockatoos parrots and parroquets of all colors kingbirds birds of paradise of brilliant green with a crowd of red and blue lorries glowing with every prismatic color flew about with deafening clamor all at once a strange volley of discordant sounds seemed to come from the thicket the colonists heard one after another the song of birds the cries of four-footed beasts and the sort of clucking sound strangely human neb and herbert rushed towards the thicket forgetting the most elementary rules of prudence happily there was neither formidable wild beasts nor savage native but merely half a dozen of those mocking birds which they recognized as mountain pheasants a few skilfully aimed blows with a stick brought this parody to an end and gave them excellent game for dinner that evening herbert also pointed out superb pigeons with bronze-colored wings some with a magnificent crest others clad in green like their congeners at port macquarie but like the troops of crows and magpies which flew about they were beyond reach a load of small shot would have killed hosts of them but the colonists had nothing but stones and sticks very insufficient weapons they proved even more inadequate when a troop of quadrupeds leaped away through the underbrush with tremendous bounds thirty feet long so that they almost seemed to spring from tree to tree like squirrels kangaroos cried herbert can you eat them said pencroff they make a delicious stew said the reporter the words had hardly escaped his lips when the sailor with neb and herbert at his heels rushed after the kangaroos smith tried in vain to recall them but equally in vain did they pursue the game whose elastic leaps left them far behind after five minutes chase they gave it up out of breath you see mr smith said pencroff that guns are a necessity will it be possible to make them perhaps replied the engineer but we will begin by making bows and arrows and you will soon use them as skilfully as the australian hunters bows and arrows said pencroff with a contemptuous look they are for children don't be so proud my friend said the reporter bows and arrows were sufficient for many centuries for the warfare of mankind powder is an invention of yesterday while war unhappily is as old as the race 
that's true mr spilett said the sailor i always speak before i think forgive me meanwhile herbert with his natural history always uppermost in his thoughts returned to the subject of kangaroos those which escaped us he said belong to the species most difficult to capture very large with long gray hair but i'm sure there are black and red kangaroos rock kangaroos kangaroo rats herbert said the sailor for me there is only one kind the kangaroo on the spit and that is just what we haven't got they could not help laughing at professor spencroft's new classification he was much cast down at the prospect of dining on mountain pheasants but chance was once more kind to him top who felt his dinner at stake rushed hither and thither his instinct quickened by sharp appetite in fact he would have left very little of what he might catch or any one else had not neb watched him shrewdly about three o'clock he disappeared into the rushes from which came grunts and growls which indicated a deadly tussle neb rushed in and found top greedily devouring an animal which in ten seconds more would have totally disappeared but the dog had luckily fallen on a litter and two more rodents for to this species did the beast belong lay strangled on the ground neb reappeared in triumph with a rodent in each hand they had yellow hair with patches of green and the rudiments of a tail they were a sort of agouti a little larger than their tropical congenes true american hairs with long ears and five molar teeth on either side hurrah cried pencroff the roast is here now we can go back to the house the journey was resumed red creek still rolled its limped waters under the arching boughs of casuarens banksias and gigantic gum trees superb lilacee rose to a height of twenty feet and other arborescent trees of species unknown to the young naturalist bent over the brook which murmured gently beneath its leafy cradle it widened sensibly nevertheless and the mouth was evidently near as the party emerged from a massive thicket of fine trees the lake suddenly appeared before them they were now on its left bank and a picturesque region opened to their view the smooth sheet of water about seven miles in circumference and two hundred and fifty acres in extent lay sleeping among the trees towards the east across the intermittent screen of verdure appeared a shining horizon of sea to the north the curve of the lake was concave contrasting with the sharp outline of its lower extremity numerous aquatic birds frequented the banks of this little ontario in which the thousand isles of its american original were represented by a rock emerging from its surface some hundreds of feet from the southern bank there lived in harmony several couples of kingfishers perched upon rocks grave and motionless watching for fish then they would plunge into the water and dive with a shrill cry reappearing with the prey in their beaks upon the banks of the lake and the island were constantly strutting wild ducks pelicans water hens and red beaks the waters of the lake were fresh and limpid somewhat dark and from the concentric circles on its surface were evidently full of fish how beautiful this lake is said spilett we could live on its banks we will live there answered smith the colonists desiring to get back to the chimneys by the shortest route went down towards the angle formed at the south by the junction of the banks they broke the path with much labor through the thickets and brush wood hitherto untouched by the hand of man and walked towards the seashore so as to strike it to the north of prospect plateau after a two miles walk they came upon the thick turf of the plateau and saw before them the infinite ocean to get back to the chimneys they had to walk across the plateau for a mile to the elbow formed by the first bend of the mercy but the engineer was anxious to know how and where the overflow of the lake escaped it was probable that a river existed somewhere pouring through a gorge in the granite in fine the lake was an immense receptacle gradually filled at the expense of the creek and its overflow must somehow find a way down the ocean why should they not utilize this wasted store of water power so they walked up the plateau following the banks of lake grant but after a tramp of a mile they could find no outlet it was half past four and dinner had yet to be prepared the party returned upon its track and reached the chimneys by the left bank of the mercy then the fire was lighted and neb and pencroff on whom devolved the cooking 
in their respective characters of negro and sailor skilfully broiled the agouti to which the hungry explorers did great honour when the meal was over and just as they were settling themselves to sleep smith drew from his pocket little specimens of various kinds of minerals and said quietly my friends this is iron ore this pyrates this clay this limestone this charcoal nature gives us these as her part in the common task to-morrow we must do our share End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter thirteen top's contribution making bows and arrows a brick kiln a pottery different cooking utensils the first boiled meat mugwort the southern cross an important astronomical observation now then mr smith where shall we begin asked pencroff the next morning at the beginning answered the engineer and this indeed was necessary as the colonists did not even possess implements with which to make implements neither were they in that condition of nature which having time economizes effort the necessities of life must be provided for at once if profiting by experience they had nothing to invent at least they had everything to make their iron and steel was in the ore their pottery was in the clay their linen and clothes were still to be provided it must be remembered however that these colonists were men in the best sense of the word the engineer smith could not have been aided by comrades more intelligent or more devoted and zealous he had questioned them and knew their ability the reporter having learned everything so as to be able to speak of everything would contribute largely from his knowledge and skill towards the settlement of the island he would not shirk work and a thorough sportsman he would follow as a business what he had formerly indulged in as a pastime herbert a manly lad well versed in natural science would contribute his share to the common cause neb was devotion personified adroit intelligent indefatigable robust of iron constitution knowing something of the work in a smithy his assistance would be considerable as to pencroff he had sailed every sea had been a carpenter in the brooklyn yards an assistant tailor on board ship and during his leaves of absence a gardener farmer etc in short like every sailor he was a jack of all trades indeed it would have been hard to bring together five men more able to struggle against fate and more certain to triumph in the end at the beginning smith had said and this beginning was the construction of an apparatus which would serve to transform the natural substances every one knows what an important part heat plays in these transformations therefore as wood and coal were already provided it was only necessary to make an oven to utilize them what good is an oven asked pencroff to make the pottery that we want replied smith and how will we make an oven with bricks and how will we make the bricks with the clay come friends we will set up our factory at the place of production so as to avoid carriage neb will bring the provisions and we shall not lack fire to cook food no replied the reporter but suppose we lack food since we have no hunting implements if we only had a knife cried the sailor what then asked smith why i would make a bow and arrows and game would be plenty in the larder a knife something that will cut said the engineer as if talking to himself suddenly his face brightened come here top he called the dog bounded to his master and smith having taken off his collar which the animal had around his neck broke it into two halves saying here are two knives pencroff for all response the sailor gave a couple of cheers top's collar was made from a thin piece of tempered steel all that was therefore necessary was to rub it to an edge upon a sandstone and then to sharpen it upon one of finer grain these kind of stones were readily procurable upon the beach and in a couple of hours the implements of the colony consisted of two strong blades which it was necessary to fasten into solid handles the overcoming of this first difficulty was greeted as a triumph and it was indeed a fortunate event 
On setting out, it was the intention of the engineer to return to the western bank of the lake, where he had noticed the clay, of which he had secured a specimen. Following the bank of the Mercy, they crossed Prospect Plateau, and after a walk of about five miles, they arrived at a glade some two hundred paces distant from Lake Grant. On the way, Herbert had discovered a tree from which the South American Indians make boughs. It was the Krejimba, of the palm family. From it they cut long, straight branches, which they peeled and shaped into boughs. For cords they took the fibers of the Hibiscus heteroptilus, Indian hemp, a malvaceous plant, the fibers of which are as strong as the tendons of an animal. Pencroff, having thus provided boughs, only needed arrows. Those were easily made from straight, stiff branches, free from knots, but it was not so easy to arm them with a substitute for iron. But Pencroff said that he had accomplished this much, and that chance would do the rest. The party had reached the place discovered the day before. The ground was composed of that clay which is used in making bricks and tiles, and was therefore just the thing for their purpose. The labor was not difficult. It was only necessary to scour the clay with sand, mold the bricks, and then bake them before a wood fire. Usually bricks are pressed in molds, but the engineer contented himself with making these by hand. All this day and the next was employed in this work. The clay, soaked in water, was kneaded by the hands and feet of the manipulators, and then divided into blocks of equal size. A skilled workman can make, without machinery, as much as ten thousand bricks in twelve hours, but in the two days the bricksmen of Lincoln Island had made but three thousand, which were piled one upon the other to await the time when they would be dry enough to bake, which would be in three or four days. On the 2nd of April Smith occupied himself in determining the position of the island. The day before he had noted the precise minute at which the sun had set, allowing for the refraction. On this morning he ascertained with equal precision the time of its rising. The intervening time was twelve hours and twenty-four minutes. Therefore, six hours and twelve minutes after rising, the sun would pass the meridian, and the point in the sky which it would occupy at that instant would be north. At the proper hour Smith marked this point, and by getting two trees in line, obtained a meridian for his future operations. During the two days preceding the baking, they occupied themselves by lying in a supply of firewood. Branches were cut from the edge of the clearing, and all the dead wood under the trees was picked up, and now and then they hunted in the neighborhood, the more successfully as Pencroff had some dozens of arrows with very sharp points. It was Top who had provided these points by bringing in a porcupine, poor game enough, but of an undeniable value, thanks to the quills with which it bristled. These quills were firmly fastened to the ends of the arrows, and their flight was guided by feathering them with the cockatoo's feathers. The reporter and Herbert soon became expert marksmen, and all kinds of game, such as cabiais, pigeons, agoutis, heathcock, etc., abounded in the chimneys. Most of these were killed in that part of the forest upon the left bank of the Mercy, which they had called Jacamarwood, after the kingfisher which the Pencroff and Herbert had pursued there during their first exploration. The meat was eaten fresh, but they preserved the hams of the cabiai by smoking them before a fire of green wood, having made them aromatic with odorous leaves. Thus they had nothing but roast after roast, and they would have been glad to have heard a pot singing upon the hearth but first they must have the pot, and for this they must have the oven. During these excursions the hunters noticed the recent tracks of large animals, armed with strong claws, but they could not tell their species, and Smith cautioned them to be prudent, as doubtless there were dangerous beasts in the forest. He was right. For one day Spilett and Herbert saw an animal resembling a jaguar, but fortunately the beast did not attack them, as they could hardly have killed it without being themselves wounded but Spilett promised, if he should ever obtain a proper weapon, such as the one of the guns Pencroff begged for, that he would wage relentless war on all ferocious beasts, and rid the island of their presence. They did not do anything to the chimneys, as the engineer hoped to discover, or to build, if need be, a more convenient habitation, but contented themselves by spreading fresh quantities of moss and dry leaves upon the sand in the corridors, and upon these primitive beds the tired workmen slept soundly. 
they also reckoned the days already passed on lincoln island and began keeping a calendar on the fifth of april which was a wednesday they had been twelve days upon the island on the morning of the sixth the engineer with his companions met at the place where the bricks were to be baked of course the operation was to be conducted in the open air and not in an oven or rather the pile of bricks would in itself form a bake oven carefully prepared fagots were laid upon the ground surrounding the tires of dry bricks which formed a great cube in which air holes had been left the work occupied the whole day and it was not until evening that they lit the fire which all night long they kept supplied with fuel the work lasted forty-eight hours and succeeded perfectly then as it was necessary to let the smoking mass cool neb and pencroff directed by mr smith on a hurdle made of branches numerous loads of limestone which they found scattered in abundance to the north of the lake these stones decomposed by heat furnished a thick quicklime which increased in bulk by slacking as if it had been produced by the calcimination of chalk or marble mixed with sand in order to diminish its shrinkage while drying this lime made an excellent mortar by the ninth of april the engineer had at his disposal a quantity of lime all prepared and some thousands of bricks they therefore began at once the construction of an oven in which to bake their pottery this was accomplished without much difficulty and five days later the oven was supplied with coal from the open vein which the engineer had discovered near the mouth of red creek and the first smoke escaped from a chimney twenty feet high the glade was transformed into a manufactory and pencroff was ready to believe that all the products of modern industry would be produced from this oven meantime the colonists made a mixture of the clay with lime and quartz forming pipe clay from which they moulded pots and mugs plates and jars tubs to hold water and cooking vessels their form was rude and defective but after they had been baked at a high temperature the kitchen of the chimneys found itself provided with utensils as precious as if they were composed of the finest kaolin we must add that pencroff desirous of knowing whether this material deserved its name of pipe clay made some large pipes which he would have found perfect but for the want of tobacco and indeed this was a large privation to the sailor but the tobacco will come like everything else he would say in his hopeful moments the work lasted until the fifteenth of april and the time was well spent the colonists having become potters made nothing but pottery when it would suit the engineer to make them smiths they would be smiths but as the morrow would be sunday and moreover easter sunday all agreed to observe the day by rest these americans were religious men scrupulous observers of the precepts of the bible and their situation could only develop their trust in the author of all things on the evening of the fifteenth they returned permanently to the chimneys bringing the rest of the pottery back with them and putting out the oven fire until there should be use for it again this return was marked by the fortunate discovery by the engineer of a substance that would answer for tinder which we know is the spongy velvety pulp of a mushroom of the polyphore family properly prepared it is extremely inflammable especially when previously saturated with gunpowder or nitrate or chlorate of potash but until then they had found no polyphores nor any fungi that would answer instead now the engineer having found a certain plant belonging to the mackworth family to which belong wormwood mint etc broke off some tufts and handing them to the sailor said here pencroff is something for you pencroff examined the plant with its long silky threads and leaves covered with a cotton-like down what is it mr smith he asked ah i know it's tobacco no answered smith it is artemisia wormwood known to science as chinese mugwort but to us it will be tinder this mugwort properly dried furnished a very inflammable substance especially after the engineer had impregnated it with nitrate of potash which is the same as saltipeter a mineral very plenty on the island this evening the colonists seated in the central chamber supped with comfort neb had prepared some agouti soup a spiced ham and the boiled corns of the caladium macrohizum an herbaceous plant of the arad family which under the tropics takes a tree form these corns which are very nutritious had an excellent flavour something like that of a portland sago and measurably supplied the place of bread which the colonists were still without 
Supper finished, before going to sleep, the party took a stroll upon the beach. It was eight o'clock, and the night was magnificent. The moon, which had been full five days before, was about rising, and in the zenith, shining resplendent above the circumpolar constellations, rode the southern cross. For some moments the engineer gazed at it attentively. At its summit and base were two stars of the first magnitude, and on the left arm and the right stars, respectively, of the second magnitude and the third. Then, after some reflection, he said, "'Herbert, is not today the 15th of April?' yes sir answered the lad then if i'm not mistaken to-morrow will be one of the four days in the year when the mean and real time are the same that is to say my boy that to-morrow within some seconds of noon by the clocks the sun will pass the meridian if therefore the weather is clear i think i will be able to obtain the longitude of the island within a few degrees without a sextant or instruments asked spilett yes replied the engineer and since it is so clear, I will try to-night to find our latitude by calculating the height of the cross, that is, of the southern pole, above the horizon. You see, my friends, before settling down it will not do to be content with determining this land to be an island. We must find out our locality. Indeed, instead of building a house, it will be better to build a ship if we are within a hundred miles of an inhabited land that is why i am now going to try to get the latitude of the place and to-morrow noon to calculate the longitude if the engineer had possessed a sextant the work would have been easy as this evening by taking the height of the pole and to-morrow by the sun's passage of the meridian he would have the coordinates of the island but having no instruments he must devise something so returning to the chimneys he made by the light of the fire two little flat sticks which he fastened together with a form in a way that they could be opened and shut like the compasses and returned with them to the beach but as the sea horizon was hidden from this point by claw cape the engineer determined to make his observations from prospect plateau leaving until the next day the computation of the height of the latter which could easily be done by elementary geometry the colonists therefore went to the edge of the plateau which faced the southwest overlooking the fantastic rocks bordering the shore the place rose some fifty feet above the right bank of the mercy which descended by a double slope to the end of claw cape and to the southern boundary of the island nothing obstructed the vision which extended over half the horizon from the cape to reptile promontory to the south this horizon lit by the first rays of the moon was sharply defined against the sky the cross was at this time reversed the star alpha being nearest the pole this constellation is not situated as near to the southern as the polar star is to the northern pole alpha is about twenty seven degrees from it but smith knew this and could calculate accordingly he took care also to observe it at the instant when it passed the meridian under the pole thus simplifying the operation the engineer opened the arms of his compass so that one pointed to the horizon and the other to the star and thus obtained the angle of distance which separated them and in order to fix this distance immovably he fastened these arms respectively by means of thorns to a cross piece of wood this done it was only necessary to calculate the angle obtained bringing the observation to the level of the sea so as to allow for the depression of the horizon caused by the height of the plateau the measurement of this angle would thus give the height of alpha or the pole above the horizon or since the latitude of a point on the globe is always equal to the height of the pole above the horizon at that point the latitude of the island this calculation was postponed until the next day and by ten o'clock everybody slept profoundly End of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Fourteen. The Measure of the Granite Wall. An application of the theorem of similar triangles. The Latitude of the Island. An excursion to the North an oyster bed plans for the future the sun's passage of the meridian the coordinates of the lincoln island
at daybreak the next day easter sunday the colonists left the chimneys and went to wash their linen and clean their clothing the engineer intended to make some soap as soon as he could obtain some soda or potash and grease or oil the important question of renewing their wardrobes would be considered in due time at present they were strong and able to stand hard wear for at least six months longer but everything depended on the situation of the island as regarded inhabited countries and that would be determined this day providing the weather permitted the sun rising above the horizon ushered in one of those glorious days which seem like the farewell of summer the first thing to be done was to measure the height of prospect plateau above the sea do you not need another pair of compasses asked herbert of the engineer no my boy responded the latter this time we will try another and nearly as precise a method pencroff neb and the reporter were busy at other things but herbert who desired to learn followed the engineer who proceeded along the beach to the base of the granite wall smith was provided with a pole twelve feet long carefully measured off from his own height which he knew to a hair herbert carried a plumb line made from a flexible fibre tied to a stone having reached a point twenty feet from the shore and five hundred feet from the perpendicular granite wall smith sunk the pole two feet in the sand and steadying it carefully proceeded to make it plumb with the horizon then moving back to a spot where stretched upon the sand he could sight over the top of the pole to the edge of the cliff bringing the two points in line he carefully marked this place with a stone then addressing herbert do you know the first principles of geometry he said slightly sir answered herbert not wishing to seem forward then you remember the relation of similar triangles yes sir answered herbert their like sides are proportional right my boy and i have just constructed two similar right angled triangles the smaller has for its sides the perpendicular pole and the distances from its base and top to the stake the second has the wall which we are about to measure and the distances from its base and summit to the stake which are only the prolongation of the base and hypotenuse of the first triangle i understand cried herbert as the distance from the stake to the pole is proportional to the distance from the stake to the base of the wall so the height of the wall is proportional to the height of the rod exactly replied the engineer and after measuring the first two distances as we know the height of the pole we have only to calculate the proportion in order to find the height of the wall the measurements were made with the pole and resulted in determining the distances from the stake to the foot of the pole and the base of the wall to be fifteen and five hundred feet respectively the engineer and herbert then returned to the chimneys where the former using a flat stone and a bit of shell to figure with determined the height of the wall to be three hundred and thirty three point thirty three feet then taking the compasses and carefully measuring the angle which he had obtained the night before upon a circle which he had divided into three hundred and sixty parts the engineer found that this angle allowing for the differences already explained was fifty-three degrees which subtracted from ninety degrees the distance of the pole from the equator gave thirty-seven degrees as the latitude of lincoln island and making an allowance of five degrees for the imperfections of the observations smith concluded it to be situated between thirty-fifth and the fortieth parallel of south latitude but in order to establish the coordinates of the island the longitude also must be taken and this the engineer determined to do when the sun passed the meridian at noon they therefore resolved to spend the morning in a walk or rather an exploration of that part of the island situated to the north of shark gulf and the lake and if they should have time to push on as far as the western side of south mandible cape they would dine on the downs and not return until evening at half past eight the little party set out following the edge of the channel opposite upon safety islet a number of birds of the sphemiscus family strutted gravely about there were divers easily recognizable by their disagreeable cry which resembled the braying of an ass pencroff regarding them with gastronomic intent was pleased to learn that their flesh though dark colored was good to eat they could also see amphibious animals which probably were seals crawling over the sand it was not possible to think of these as food as their oily flesh is detestable 
Nevertheless, Smith observed them carefully, and without disclosing his plans to the others, he announced that they would very soon make a visit to the island. The shore followed by the colonists was strewn with mollusks, which would have delighted a malacologist. But, what was more important, Neb discovered, about four miles from the chimneys, among the rocks, a bed of oysters, left bare by the tide. "'Neb hasn't lost his day,' said Pencroff, who saw that the bed extended some distance. "'It is indeed a happy discovery,' remarked the reporter, "'and when we remember that each oyster produces fifty or sixty thousand eggs a year, the supply is evidently inexhaustible.' "'But I don't think the oyster is very nourishing,' said Herbert. No, answered Smith, oysters contain very little azote, and it would be necessary for a man living on them alone to eat at least fifteen or sixteen dozen every day. Well, said Pencroff, we could swallow dozens and dozens of these and not exhaust the bed. Shall we have some for breakfast? And without waiting for an answer, which he well knew would be affirmative, the sailor and Neb detached a quantity of these mollusks from the rocks, and placed them with the other provisions for breakfast, in a basket which Neb had made from the hibiscus fibres. Then they continued along the shore between the downs and the sea. From time to time Smith looked at his watch so as to be ready for the noon observation. All this portion of the island, as far as the South Mandible Cape, was desert, composed of nothing but sand and shells, mixed with the debris of lava. A few seabirds, such as the seagulls and albatross, frequented the shore, and some wild ducks excited the covetousness of Pencroff. He tried to shoot some, but unsuccessfully, as they seldom lit, and he could not hit them flying. This made the sailor say to the engineer, "'You see, Mr. Smith, how much we need guns.' "'Doubtless, Pencroff,' answered the reporter, "'but it rests with you. You find iron for the barrels, steel for the locks, saltpetre, charcoal, and sulphur for the powder, mercury and nitric acid for the fulminate, and, last of all, lead for the balls, and Mr. Smith will make us guns of the best quality.' "'Oh, we could probably find all these substances on the island,' said the engineer. "'But it requires fine tools to make such a delicate instrument as a firearm. However, we will see after a while.' why why did we throw the arms and everything else even our penknives out of the balloon cried pencroff if we hadn't the balloon would have thrown us into the sea answered herbert so it would my boy answered the sailor and then another idea occurring to him i wonder what mr forster and his friends thought he said the next day when they found their balloon had escaped i don't care what they thought said the reporter it was my plan cried pencroff with a satisfied air and a good plan it was pencroff interrupted the reporter laughing to drop us here i had rather be here than in the hands of the southerners exclaimed the sailor especially since mr smith has been kind enough to rejoin us and i too cried the reporter after all what do we lack here nothing that means everything answered the sailor laughing and shrugging his shoulders but some day we will get away from this place "'Sooner, perhaps, than you think, my friend,' said the engineer, "'if Lincoln Island is not very far from an inhabited archipelago or a continent, "'and we will find that out within an hour. "'I had no map of the Pacific, but I have a distinct recollection of its southern portion. "'Yesterday's observation placed the island in the latitude of New Zealand and Chile, "'but the distance between these two countries is at least six thousand miles. "'We must, therefore, determine what point in this space the island occupies.' and that I hope to get pretty soon from the longitude. Is not the low archipelago nearest us in latitude? asked Herbert. Yes, replied the engineer, but it is more than twelve hundred miles distant. And that way? inquired Neb, who followed the conversation with great interest, pointing towards the south. Nothing, answered Pencroff. Nothing indeed, added the engineer. Well, Cyrus, demanded the reporter if we find lincoln island to be only two hundred or three hundred miles from new zealand and chile we will build a ship instead of a house and pencroff shall command it all right mr smith cried the sailor i am all ready to be captain provided you build something seaworthy we will if it is necessary answered smith while these men whom nothing could discourage were talking the hour for taking the observations approached Herbert could not imagine how Mr. Smith would be able to ascertain the time of the sun's passage of the meridian of the island without a single instrument. 
It was eleven o'clock, and the party, halting about six miles from the chimneys, not far from the place where they had found the engineer after his inexplicable escape, set about preparing breakfast. Herbert found fresh water in a neighboring brook, and brought some back in a vessel which Neb had with him. Meantime the engineer made ready for his astronomical observation. He chose a smooth dry place upon the sand, which the sea had left perfectly level. It was no more necessary, however, for it to be horizontal than for the rod which he stuck in the sand to be perpendicular. Indeed, the engineer inclined the rod towards the south and away from the sun, as it must not be forgotten that the colonists of Lincoln Island, being in the southern hemisphere, saw the orb of day describe his diurnal arc above the northern horizon. Then Herbert understood how, by means of the shadow of the rod on the sand, the engineer would be able to ascertain the culmination of the sun. That is to say, the passage of the meridian of the island, or, in other words, the time of the place. For the moment that the shadow obtained its minimum length, it would be noon, and all they had to do was watch carefully the end of the shadow. By inclining the rod from the sun, Smith had made the shadow longer, and therefore its changes could be more readily noted. When he thought it was time, the engineer knelt down upon the sand and began marking the decrease in the length of the shadow by means of little wooden pegs. His companions, bending over him, watched the operation with the utmost interest. The reporter, chronometer in hand, stood ready to mark the minute when the shadow would be shortest. Now, as the 16th of April was a day when the true and mean time are the same, Spilett's watch would give the true time of Washington, and greatly simplify the calculation. Meantime the shadow diminished little by little, and as soon as Smith perceived it begin to lengthen, he exclaimed, Now! One minute past five, answered the reporter. Nothing then remained but the easy work of summing up the result. There was, as we have seen, five hours difference between the meridian of Washington and that of the island. Now the sun passes around the earth at the rate of fifteen degrees an hour. Fifteen multiplied by five gives seventy-five and as washington is in seventy seven degrees three minutes eleven seconds from the meridian of greenwich it follows that the island was in the neighborhood of longitude one hundred and fifty two degrees west smith announced this result to his companions and making the same allowances as before he was able to affirm that the bearing of the island was between the thirty five degrees and thirty seven degrees of south latitude and between the one hundred and fifty degrees and one hundred and fifty five degrees of west longitude the difference in this calculation attributable to errors in observation was placed as we have seen at five degrees or three hundred miles in each direction but this error did not influence the conclusion that lincoln island was so far from any continent or archipelago that they could not attempt to accomplish the distance in a small boat in fact, according to the engineer, they were at least 1,200 miles from Tahiti and from the low archipelago, fully 1,800 miles from New Zealand, and more than 4,500 miles from the coast of America. And when Cyrus Smith searched his memory, he could not remember any island in the Pacific occupying the position of Lincoln Island. End of chapter 14「the eye, the Catalonian method, making iron and steel. The first words of the sailor on the morning on the 17th of April were, well, what are we going to do today? Whatever Mr. Smith chooses, answered the reporter. The companions of the engineer, having been brickmasters and potters, were about to become metal workers. The previous day, after lunch, the party had explored as far as the extremity of Mandible Cape, some seven miles from the chimneys. The extensive downs here came to an end, and the soil appeared volcanic. There were no longer high walls, as at Prospect Plateau, but the narrow gulf between the two capes was enframed by a fantastic border of the mineral matter discharged from the volcano. 
having reached this point the colonists retraced their steps to the chimneys but they could not sleep until the question whether they should look forward to leaving lincoln island had been definitely settled the one thousand and two hundred miles to the low archipelago was a long distance and now at the beginning of the stormy season a small boat would certainly not be able to accomplish it the building of a boat even when the proper tools are provided is a difficult task and as the colonists had none of these the first thing to do was to make hammers hatchets adzes saws augers planes etc which would take some time it was therefore decided to winter on lincoln island and to search for a more comfortable dwelling than the chimneys in which to live during the inclement weather the first thing was to utilize the iron ore which the engineer had discovered by transforming it into iron and steel iron ore is usually found in combination with oxygen or sulphur and it was so in this instance as of the two specimens brought back by cyrus smith one was magnetic iron and the other pyrites or sulphuret of iron of these it was the first kind the magnetic ore or oxide of iron which must be reduced by coal that is to say freed from the oxygen in order to obtain the pure metal this reduction is performed by submitting the ore to a great heat either by the catalonian method which has the advantage of producing the metal at one operation or by means of blast furnaces which first smelt the ore and then the iron carrying off the three or four per cent of coal combined with it the engineer wanted to obtain ore in the shortest way possible the ore he had found was in itself very pure and rich such ore is found in rich gray masses yielding a black dust crystallized in regular octahedrons highly magnetic and in europe the best quality of iron is made from it not far from this vein was the coal field previously explored by the colonists so that every facility existed for the treatment of the ore then sir are we going to work the iron questioned pencroff yes my friend answered the engineer but first we will do something i think you will enjoy have a seal hunt on the island a seal hunt cried the sailor addressing spilett do we need seals to make iron it seems so since cyrus has said it replied the reporter but as the engineer had already left the chimneys pencroff prepared for the chase without gaining an explanation soon the whole party were gathered upon the beach at a point where the channel could be forded at low water without wading deeper than the knees this was smith's first visit to the islet upon which his companions had been thrown by the balloon on their landing hundreds of penguins looked fearlessly at them and the colonists armed with clubs could have killed numbers of these birds but it would have been useless slaughter and it would not do to frighten the seals which were lying on the sand some cable lengths away they respected also certain innocent-looking sphemiscus with flattened side appendages mere apologies for wings and covered with scale-like vestiges of feathers the colonists marched stealthily forward over ground riddled with holes which formed the nests of aquatic birds towards the end of the island black objects like moving rocks appeared above the surface of the water they were the seals the hunters wished to capture it was necessary to allow them to land as owing to their shape these animals although capital swimmers and difficult to seize in the sea can move but slowly on the shore pencroff who knew their habits counselled waiting until the seals were sunning themselves asleep on the sand then the party could manage so as to cut off their retreat and despatch them with a blow on the muzzle the hunters therefore hid themselves behind the rocks and waited quietly in about an hour half a dozen seals crawled on to the sand and pencroff and herbert went off round the point of the island so as to cut off their retreat while the three others hidden by the rocks crept forward to the place of encounter suddenly the tall form of the sailor was seen he gave a shout and the engineer and his companions hurriedly threw themselves between the seals and the sea they succeeded in beating two of the animals to death but the others escaped here are your seals mr smith cried the sailor coming forward and now we will make bellows replied the engineer bellows exclaimed the sailor these seals are in luck it was in effect a huge pair of bellows necessary in the reduction of the ore which the engineer expected to make from the skins of the seals they were medium-sized about six feet long and had heads resembling those of dogs as it was useless to burden themselves with the whole carcasses neb and pencroff resolved to skin them on the spot while smith and the reporter made the exploration of the island the sailor and the negro acquitted themselves well 
and three hours later smith had at his disposal two seal skins which he intended to use just as they were without tanning the colonists waiting until low water recrossed the channel and returned to the chimneys it was no easy matter to stretch the skins upon the wooden frames and to sew them so as to make them sufficiently airtight smith had nothing but the two knives to work with yet he was so ingenious and his companions aided him so intelligently that three days later the number of implements of the little colony was increased by a bellows intended to inject air into the midst of the ore during its treatment by heat a requisite to the success of the operation it was on the morning of the twentieth of april that what the reporter called in his notes the iron age began the engineer had decided to work near the deposits of coal and iron which were situated at the base of the northeasterly spurs of mount franklin six miles from the chimneys and as it would not be possible to go back and forth each day it was decided to camp upon the ground in a temporary hut so that they could attend to the important work night and day this settled they left in the morning neb and pencroff carrying the bellows and the stock of provisions which later they would add to on the way the road led through the thickest part of jacamar wood in a northwesterly direction it was as well to break a path which would henceforth be the most direct route between prospect plateau and mount franklin the trees belonging to the species already recognized were magnificent and herbert discovered another the dragon tree which pencroff designated as an overgrown onion which notwithstanding its height belongs to the same family of lilaceous plants as the onion the civet the shallot or the asparagus these dragon trees have ligneous roots which cooked are excellent and which fermented yield a very agreeable liquor they therefore gathered some it took the entire day to traverse the wood but the party were thus able to observe its fauna and flora top specially charged to look after the fauna run about in the grass and bushes flashing all kinds of game herbert and spilett shot two kangaroos and an animal which was like a hedgehog in that it rolled itself into a bow and erected its quills and like an anteater in that it was provided with claws for digging a long and thin snout terminating in a beak and an extensile tongue furnished with little points which enabled it to hold insects and what does it look like boiling in a pot asked pencroff naturally like an excellent piece of beef answered herbert we don't want to know any more than that said the sailor during the march they saw some wild boars but they did not attempt to attack the little troop and it seemed that they were not going to have any encounter with savage beasts when the reporter saw in a dense thicket among the lower branches of a tree an animal which he took to be a bear and which he began tranquilly to sketch fortunately for spilett the animal in question did not belong to that redoubtable family of plantigrades it was an eye better known as a sloth which has a body like that of a large dog a rough and dirty colored skin and feet armed with strong claws which enable it to grasp the branches of trees and feed upon the leaves having identified the animal without disturbing it spilett struck out bear and wrote eye under his drawing and the route was resumed at five o'clock smith called a halt they were past the forest and at the beginning of the massive spurs which buttressed mount franklin towards the east a few hundred paces distant was red creek so drinking water was not wanting the camp was made in less than an hour a hut constructed from the branches of the tropical bindweed and stopped with loam was erected under the trees on the edge of the forest they deferred the geological work until the next day supper was prepared a good fire blazed before the hut the spit turned and at eight o'clock while one of the party kept the fire going in case some dangerous beast should prowl around the others slept soundly the next morning smith accompanied by herbert went to look for the place where they had found the specimen of ore they found the deposit on the surface near the sources of the creek close to the base of one of the northeast buttresses this mineral very rich in iron enclosed in its fusible veinstone was perfectly suited to the method of reduction which the engineer intended to employ which was the simplified catalonian process practised in corsica this method properly required the construction of ovens and crucibles in which the ore and the coal placed in alternate layers were transformed and reduced but smith proposed to simplify matters by simply making a huge cube of coal and ore into the centre of which the air from the bellows would be introduced this was probably what tubal cain did and the process which gave such good results to adam's grandson would doubtless succeed with the colonists of lincoln island 
the coal was collected with the same facility as the ore and the latter was broken into little pieces and the impurities picked from it then the coal and ore were heaped together in successive layers just as a charcoal burner arranges his wood thus arranged under the influence of the air from the bellows the coal would change into carbonic acid then into oxide of carbon which would release the oxygen from the oxide of iron the engineer proceeded in this manner the sealskin bellows furnished with a pipe of refractory earth an earth difficult of fusion which had previously been prepared at the pottery was set up close to the heap of ore and moved by a mechanism consisting of a frame fibre cords and a balance weight it injected into the mass a supply of air which by raising the temperature assisted the chemical transformation which would give the pure metal the operation was difficult it took all the patience and ingenuity of the colonists to conduct it properly but finally it succeeded and the result was a pig of iron in a spongy state which must be cut and forged in order to expel the liquefied gang it was evident that these self-constituted smiths wanted a hammer but they were no worse off than the first metallurgist and they did as he must have done the first pig fastened to a wooden handle served as a hammer with which to forge the second upon the anvil of granite and they thus obtained a coarse metal but one which could be utilized at length after much trouble and labor on the twenty fifth of april many bars of iron had been forged and turned into crowbars pincers pickaxes mattocks etc which pencroff and nab declared to be real jewels but in order to be in its most serviceable state iron must be turned into steel now steel which is a combination of iron and carbon is made in two ways first from cast iron by the carburating the molten metal which gives natural or puddled steel and second by the method of cementation which consists in carburating valuable iron as the engineer had iron in a pure state he chose the latter method and heated the metal with powdered charcoal in a crucible made from a refractory earth this steel which was malleable hot and cold he worked with the hammer and neb and pencroff skilfully directed made axe-heads which heated red-hot and quickly plunged in cold water took an excellent temper other instruments such as planes and hatchets were rudely fashioned and bands of steel were made into saws and chisels and from the iron mattocks shovels pickaxes hammers nails etc were manufactured by the fifth of may the first metallurgic period was ended the smiths returned to the chimneys and new work would soon authorize their assumption of a new title End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter sixteen the question of a dwelling discussed again pencroff's ideas an exploration to the north of the lake the western boundary of the plateau the serpents the outlet of the lake top's alarm top swimming a fight under water the dugong it was the sixth of may corresponding to the sixth of november in the northern hemisphere for some days the sky had been cloudy and it was important to make provision against winter however the temperature had not lessened much and a centigrade thermometer transported to lincoln island would have averaged ten or twelve degrees above zero this would not be surprising since lincoln island from its probable situation in the southern hemisphere was subject to the same climatic influences as greece or sicily in the northern but just as the intense cold in greece and sicily sometimes produces snow and ice so in the height of winter this island would probably experience sudden changes in the temperature against which it would be well to provide at any rate if the cold was not threatening the rainy season was at hand and upon this desolate island in the wide pacific exposed to the all inclemency of the elements the storms would be frequent and probably terrible the question of a more comfortable habitation than the chimneys ought therefore to be seriously considered and promptly acted upon pencroff having discovered the chimneys naturally had a predilection for them but he understood very well that another place must be found this refuge had already been visited by the sea and it would not do to expose themselves to a like accident moreover added smith who was discussing these things with his companions there are some precautions to take 
why the island is not inhabited said the reporter probably not answered the engineer although we have not yet explored the whole of it but if there are no human beings i believe dangerous beasts are numerous it will be better to provide a shelter against a possible attack than for one of us to be tending the fire every night and then my friends we must foresee everything we are here in a part of the pacific often frequented by malay pirates what at this distance from land exclaimed herbert yes my boy these pirates are hardy sailors as well as formidable villains and we must provide for them accordingly well said pencroff we will fortify ourselves against two and four-footed savages but sir wouldn't it be as well to explore the island thoroughly before doing anything else it would be better added spilett who knows but we may find on the opposite coast one or more of those caves which we have looked for here in vain very true answered the engineer but you forget my friends that we must be somewhere near running water and that from mount franklin we were unable to see either brook or river in that direction here on the contrary we are between the mercy and lake grant which is an advantage not to be neglected and moreover as this coast faces the east it is not as exposed to the trade winds which blow from the northwest in this hemisphere well then mr smith replied the sailor let us build a house on the edge of the lake we are no longer without bricks and tools after having been brickmasters potters founders and smiths we ought to be masons easily enough yes my friend but before deciding it will be well to look about a habitation already made would save us a great deal of work and would doubtless offer a surer retreat in which we would be safe from enemies native as well as foreign but cyrus answered the reporter have we not already examined the whole of this granite wall without finding even a hole no not one added pencroff if we could only dig a place in it high out of reach that would be the thing i can see it now on the part overlooking the sea five or six chambers with windows said herbert laughing and a staircase added neb why do you laugh cried the sailor haven't we picks and mattocks cannot mr smith make powder to blow up the mine you will be able won't you sir to make powder when we want it the engineer had listened to the enthusiastic sailor developing these imaginative projects to attack this mass of granite either by mining was an herculean task and it was truly vexing that nature had not helped them in their necessity but he answered pencroff by simply proposing to examine the wall more attentively from the mouth of the river to the angle which ended it to the north they therefore went out and examined it most carefully for about two miles but everywhere it rose uniform and upright without any visible cavity the rock pigeons flying about its summit had their nests in holes drilled in the very crest or upon the irregularly cut edges of the granite to attempt to make a sufficient excavation in such a massive wall even with the pickaxe and powder was not to be thought of it was vexatious enough by chance pencroff had discovered in the chimneys which must now be abandoned the only temporary habitable shelter on this part of the coast when the survey was ended the colonists found themselves at the northern angle of the wall where it sunk by long declivities to the shore from this point to its western extremity it was nothing more than a sort of talus composed of stones earth and sand bound together by plants shrubs and grass in a slope of about forty five degrees here and there the granite thrust its sharp points out from the cliff groups of trees grew over these slopes and there was a thin carpet of grass but the vegetation extended but a short distance and then the long stretch of sand beginning at the foot of the talus merged into the beach smith naturally thought that the overflow of the lake fell in this direction as the excess of water from red creek must be discharged somewhere and this point had not been found less on the site already explored that is to say from the mouth of the creek westward as far as prospect plateau the engineer proposed to his companions that they clamber up the talus and return to the chimneys by the heights exploring the eastern and western shores of the lake the proposition was accepted and in a few minutes herbert and neb had climbed to the plateau the others following more leisurely two hundred feet distant the beautiful sheet of water shone through the leaves in the sunlight the landscape was charming the trees in autumn tints were harmoniously grouped some huge old weather-beaten trunks stood out in sharp relief against the green turf which covered the ground and brilliant cockatoos like moving prisms glanced among the branches uttering their shrill screams 
the colonists instead of proceeding directly to the north bank of the lake bore along the edge of the plateau so as to come back to the mouth of the creek on its left bank it was a circuit of about a mile and a half the walk was easy as the trees set wide apart left free passage between them they could see that the fertile zone stopped at this point and that the vegetation here was less vigorous than anywhere between the creek and the mercy smith and his companions moved cautiously over this unexplored neighborhood bows and arrows and iron-pointed sticks were their sole weapons but no beast showed itself and it was probable that the animals kept to the thicker forests in the north the colonists however experienced a disagreeable sensation in seeing top stop before a huge serpent fourteen or fifteen feet long neb killed it at a blow smith examined the reptile and pronounced it to belong to the species of diamond serpent eaten by the natives of new south wales and not venomous but it was possible others existed whose bite was mortal such as the forked tail deaf viper which rise up under the foot or the winged serpents furnished with two ear-like appendages which enabled them to shoot forward with extreme rapidity top having gotten over his surprise pursued these reptiles with reckless fierceness and his master was constantly obliged to call him in the mouth of red creek where it emptied into the lake was soon reached the party recognized on the opposite bank the point visited on their descent from mount franklin smith asserted that the supply of water from the creek was considerable there therefore must be an outlet for the overflow somewhere it was this place which must be found as doubtless it made a fall which could be utilized as a motive power the colonists strolling along without however straying too far from each other began to follow round the bank of the lake which was very abrupt the water was full of fishes and pencroff promised himself soon to manufacture some apparatus with which to capture them it was necessary first to double the point at the northeast they had thought that the discharge would be here as the water flowed close to the edge of the plateau but as it was not here the colonists continued along the bank which after a slight curve followed parallel with the seashore on this side the bank was less wooded but clumps of trees here and there made a picturesque landscape the whole extent of the lake unmoved by a single ripple was visible before them top beating the bush flushed many conveys of birds which spilett and herbert saluted with their arrows one of these birds cleverly hit by the lad dropped in the rushes top rushing after it brought back a beautiful slate-colored waterfowl it was a coot as large as a big partridge belonging to the group of machiodactyls which formed the division between the waders and the palmipedes poor game and bad tasting but as top was not as difficult to please as his masters it was agreed that the bird would answer for his supper then the colonists following the southern bank of the lake soon came to the place they had previously visited the engineer was very much surprised as he had not seen any indication of an outlet to the surplus water in talking with the reporter and the sailor he did not conceal his astonishment at the moment top who had been behaving himself quietly showed signs of alarm the intelligent animal running along the bank suddenly stopped with one foot raised and looked into the water as if pointing some invisible game then he barked furiously questioning it as it were and again was suddenly silent at first neither smith nor his companions paid any attention to the dog's actions but his barking became so incessant that the engineer noticed it what is it top he called the dog bounded towards his master and showing a real anxiety rushed back to the bank then suddenly he threw himself into the lake come back here top cried the engineer not wishing his dog to venture into those suspicious waters what's going on under there asked the sailor examining the surface of the lake top has smelt something amphibious answered herbert it must be an alligator said the reporter i don't think so answered smith alligators are not met with in this latitude meanwhile top came ashore at the call of his master but he could not be quiet he rushed along the bank through the tall grass and guided by instinct seemed to be following some object invisible under the water which was hugging the shore nevertheless the surface was calmed and undisturbed by a ripple often the colonists stood still on the bank and watched the water but they could discover nothing there certainly was some mystery here and the engineer was much perplexed we will follow out this exploration he said in half an hour all had arrived at the southeast angle of the lake and were again under prospect plateau 
they had made the circle of the bank without the engineer having discovered either where or how the surplus water was discharged nevertheless this outlet exists he repeated and since it is not outside it must penetrate the massive granite of the coast and why do you want to find that out asked spilett because answered the engineer if the outlet is through the solid rock it is possible that there is some cavity which could be easily rendered habitable after having turned the water in another direction but may not the water flow into the sea through a subterranean outlet at the bottom of the lake asked herbert perhaps so answered smith and in that case since nature has not aided us we must build our house ourselves as it was five o'clock the colonists were thinking of returning to the chimneys across the plateau when top again became excited and barking with rage before his master could hold him he sprang a second time into the lake every one ran to the bank the dog was already twenty feet off and smith called to him to come back when suddenly an enormous head emerged from the water herbert instantly recognized it the comical face with huge eyes and long silky mustaches a manatee he cried although not a manatee it was a dugong which belongs to the same species the huge monster threw himself upon the dog his master could do nothing to save him and before spilett and herbert could draw their bows top seized by the dugong had disappeared under the water neb spear in hand would have sprung to the rescue of the dog and attacked the formidable monster in its own element had he not been held back by his master meanwhile a struggle was going on under the water a struggle which owing to the powerlessness of the dog was inexplicable a struggle which they could see by the agitation of the surface was becoming more terrible each moment in short a struggle which could only be terminated by the death of the dog but suddenly through the midst of a circle of foam top appeared shot upward by some unknown force rising ten feet in the air and falling again into the tumultuous waters from which he escaped to shore without any serious wound miraculously saved cyrus smith and his companions looked on amazed still more inexplicable it seemed as if the struggle under water continued doubtless the dugong after having seized the dog had been attacked by some more formidable animal and had been obliged to defend itself but this did not last much longer the water grew red with blood and the body of the dugong emerging from the waves floated on to a little shoal at the southern angle of the lake the colonists ran to where the animal lay and found it dead its body was enormous measuring between fifteen and sixteen feet long and weighing between three thousand and four thousand pounds on its neck yawned a wound which seemed to have been made by some sharp instrument what was it that had been able by this terrible cut to kill the formidable dugong none of them could imagine and preoccupied with these incidents they returned to the chimneys End of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter Seventeen. A visit to the lake. The direction of the current. The prospects of Cyrus Smith. The dugong fat the use of the schistous limestone the sulphate of iron how glycerine is made soap saltpeter sulphuric acid nitric acid the new outlet the next day the seventh of may smith and spilett leaving neb to prepare the breakfast climbed the plateau while herbert and pencroff went after a fresh supply of food the engineer and the reporter soon arrived at the little beach where the dugong lay stranded already flocks of birds had gathered about the carcass and it was necessary to drive them off with stones as the engineer wished to preserve the fat for the use of the colony as to the flesh of the dugong it would undoubtedly furnish excellent food as in certain portions of the malay archipelago it is reserved for the table of the native princes but it was neb's affair to look after that just now cyrus smith was thinking of other things the incident of the day before was constantly presenting itself he wanted to solve the mystery of that unseen combat and to know what congener of the mastodons or other marine monster had given the dugong this strange wound 
he stood upon the border of the lake looking upon its tranquil surface sparkling under the rays of the rising sun from the little beach where the dugong lay the waters deepened slowly towards the centre and the lake might be likened to a large basin filled by the supply from red creek well cyrus questioned the reporter i don't see anything suspicious in this no my dear fellow but i'm at a loss how to explain yesterday's affair the wound on this beast is strange enough and i can't understand how top could have been thrown out of the air in that way one would suppose that it had been done by a strong arm and that the same arm wielding a poignard had given the dugong his death wound it would seem so answered the engineer who had become thoughtful there is something here which i cannot understand but neither can we explain how i myself was saved how i was snatched from the waves and borne to the downs therefore i am sure there is some mystery which we will some day discover in the meantime let us take care not to discuss these singular incidents before our companions but keep our thoughts for each other and continue our work it will be remembered that smith had not yet discovered what became of the surplus water of the lake and as there was no indication of its ever overflowing an outlet must exist somewhere he was surprised therefore on noticing a slight current just at this place throwing in some leaves and bits of wood and observing their drift he followed this current which brought him to the southern end of the lake here he detected a slight depression in the waters as if they were suddenly lost in some opening below smith listened placing his ear to the surface of the lake and distinctly heard the sound of a subterranean fall it is there said he rising there that the water is discharged there doubtless through a passage in the massive granite that it goes to join the sea through cavities which we will be able to utilize to our profit well i will find out the engineer cut a long branch stripped off its leaves and plunging it down at the angle of the two banks he found that there was a large open hole a foot below the surface this was the long sought for outlet and such was the force of the current that the branch was snatched from his hands and disappeared there can be no doubt of it now repeated the engineer it is the mouth of the outlet and i am going to work to uncover it how inquired spilett by lowering the lake three feet and how will you do that by opening another vent larger than this whereabouts cyrus where the bank is nearest the coast but it's a granite wall exclaimed spilett very well replied smith i will blow up the wall and the waters escaping will subside so as to discover the orifice and will make a waterfall at the cliff added the reporter a fall that we will make use of answered cyrus come come the engineer hurried off his companion whose confidence in smith was such that he doubted not the success of the undertaking and yet this wall of granite how would they begin how without powder with but imperfect tools could they blast the rock had not the engineer undertaken a work beyond his skill to accomplish when smith and the reporter re-entered the chimneys they found herbert and pencroff occupied in unloading their raft the wood-choppers have finished sir said the sailor laughing and when you want masons not masons but chemists interrupted the engineer yes added spilett we are going to blow up the island blow up the island cried the sailor a part of it at least answered the reporter listen to me my friends said the engineer who thereupon made known the result of his observations his theory was that a cavity more or less considerable existed in the mass of granite which upheld prospect plateau and he undertook to penetrate it to do this it was first necessary to free the present opening in other words to lower the level of the lake by giving the water a larger issue to do this they must manufacture an explosive with which to make a drain in another part of the bank it was this smith was going to attempt to do with the minerals nature had placed at his disposal all entered into the proposal with enthusiasm neb and pencroff were at once detailed to extract the fat from the dugong and to preserve the flesh for food and soon after their departure the others carrying the hurdle went up the shore to the vein of coal 
where were to be found the schistous pirates of which smith had procured a specimen the whole day was employed in bringing a quantity of these pirates to the chimneys and by evening they had several tons on the next day the eighth of may the engineer began his manipulations the schistous pirates were principally composed of carbon of silica of alumina and of sulphuret of iron these were in excess and it was necessary to separate the sulphuret and change it into sulphate by the quickest means the sulphate obtained they would extract the sulphuric acid which was what they wanted sulphuric acid is one of the agents in most general use and the industrial importance of a nation can be measured by its consumption in the future this acid will be of use to the colonists in making candles tanning skins etc but at present the engineer reserved it for another purpose smith chose behind the chimneys a place upon which the earth was carefully levelled on this he made a pile of branches and cut wood on which were placed pieces of schistous pirates leaning against each other and then all was covered over with a thin layer of pirates previously reduced to the size of nuts this done they set the wood on fire which in turn inflamed the schist as it contained carbon and sulphur then new layers of pirates were arranged so as to form an immense heap surrounded with earth and grass with air holes left here and there just as is done in reducing a pile of wood to charcoal then they left the transformation to complete itself it would take ten or twelve days for the sulphuret of iron and the alumina to change into sulphates which substances were equally soluble the others silica burnt carbon and cinders were not so while this chemical process was accomplishing itself smith employed his companions upon other branches of the work which they undertook with the utmost zeal neb and pencroff had taken the fat from the dugong which had been placed in large earthen jars it was necessary to separate the glycerine from this fat by saponifying it it was sufficient in order to do this to treat it with chalk or soda chalk was not wanting but by this treatment the soap would be calcareous and useless while by using soda a soluble soap which could be employed for domestic purposes would be the result cyrus smith being a practical man preferred to try to get the soda was this difficult no since many kinds of marine plants abounded on the shore and all those fucaceae which form rock they therefore gathered a great quantity of these seaweed which were first dried and afterwards burnt in trenches in the open air the combustion of these plants was continued for many days so that the heat penetrated throughout and the result was the greyish compact mass long known as natural soda this accomplished the engineer treated the fat with the soda which gave both a soluble soap and the neutral substance glycerine but this was not all smith wanted in view of his future operations another substance nitrate of potash better known as saltpetre he could make this by treating carbonate of potash which is easily extracted from vegetable ashes with nitric acid but this acid which was precisely what he wanted in order to complete his undertaking successfully he did not have fortunately in this emergency nature furnished him with saltpetre without any labor other than picking it up herbert had found a vein of this mineral at the foot of mount franklin and all they had to do was to purify the salt these different undertakings which occupied eight days were finished before the sulphate of iron was ready during the interval the colonists made some refractory pottery in plastic clay and constructed a brick furnace of a peculiar shape in which to distill the sulphate of iron all was finished on the eighteenth of may the very day the chemical work was completed the result of this latter operation consisting of sulphate of iron sulphate of alumina silica and a residue of charcoal and cinders was placed in a basin full of water having stirred up the mixture they let it settle and at length poured off a clear liquid holding the sulphates of iron and alumina in solution finally this liquid was partly evaporated the sulphate of iron crystallized and the mother water was thrown away smith had now a quantity of crystals from which the sulphuric acid was to be extracted 
in commerce this acid is manufactured in large quantities and by elaborate processes the engineer had no such means at his command but he knew that in bohemia an acid known as nordhausen is made by simpler means which has moreover the advantage of being non-concentrated for obtaining the acid in this way all the engineer had to do was to calcinize the crystals in a closed jar in such a manner that the sulphuric acid distilled in vapor which would in turn produce the acid by condensation it was for this that the refractory jars and the furnace had been made the operation was a success and on the twentieth of may twelve days after having begun smith was the possessor of the agent which he expected to use later in different ways what did he want with it now simply to produce nitric acid which was perfectly easy since the saltpetre attacked by the sulphuric acid would give it by distillation but how would he use this acid none of the others knew as he had spoken no words on the subject the work approached completion and one more operation would procure the substance which had required all this labor the engineer mixed the nitric acid with the glycerine which latter had been previously concentrated by evaporation in a water bath and without employing any freezing mixture obtained many pints of an oily yellowy liquid this last operation smith had conducted alone at some distance from the chimneys as he feared an explosion and when he returned with a flagon of this liquid to his friends he simply said here is some nitroglycerin it was in truth that terrible product whose explosive power is perhaps ten times as great as that of gunpowder and which has caused so many accidents although since means have been found of transforming it into dynamite that is of mixing it with clay or sugar or some solid substance sufficiently porous to hold it the dangerous liquid can be used with more safety but dynamite was not known when the colonists were at work on lincoln island and is that stuff going to blow up the rocks asked pencroff incredulously yes my friend answered the engineer and it will do all the better since the granite is very hard and will oppose more resistance to the explosion and when will we see all this sir to-morrow when we have drilled a hole answered the engineer early the next morning the twenty first of may the miners betook themselves to a point which formed the east bank of lake grant not more than five hundred feet from the coast at this place the plateau was lower than the lake which was upheld by the coping of granite it was plain that could they break this the waters would escape by this vent and forming a stream flow over the inclined surface of the plateau and be precipitated in a waterfall over the cliff on to the shore consequently there would be a general lowering of the lake and the orifice of the water would be uncovered this was to be the result the coping must be broken pencroff directed by the engineer attacked its outer facing vigorously the hole which he made with his pick began under a horizontal edge of the bank and penetrated obliquely so as to reach a level lower than the lake's surface thus the blowing up of the rocks would permit the water to escape freely and consequently lower the lake sufficiently the work was tedious as the engineer wishing to produce a violent shock had determined to use not less than two gallons of nitroglycerine in the operation but pencroff and neb taking turns at the work did so well that by four o'clock in the afternoon it was achieved now came the question of igniting the explosive ordinarily nitroglycerin is ignited by the explosion of fulminated cups as if lighted without percussion this substance burns and does not explode smith could doubtless make a cup lacking fulminate he could easily obtain a substance analogous to gun cotton since he had nitric acid at hand this substance pressed in a cartridge and introduced into the nitroglycerine could be lighted with a slow match and produce the explosion but smith knew that their liquid had the property of exploding under a blow he determined therefore to make use of this property reserving the other means in case this experiment failed the blow of a hammer upon some drops of the substance spread on a hard stone suffices to provoke an explosion but no one could give those blows without being a victim to the operation 
smith's idea was to suspend a heavy mass of iron by means of a vegetable fibre to an upright post so as to have the iron hang directly over the hole another long fibre previously soaked in sulphur was to be fastened to the middle of the first and laid along the ground many feet from this excavation the fire was to be applied to this second fibre it would burn till it reached the first and set it on fire then the latter would break and the iron be precipitated upon the nitroglycerine this apparatus was fixed in place then the engineer after having made his companions go away filled the hole so that the fluid overflowed the opening and spread some drops underneath the mass of suspended iron this done smith lit the end of the sulphured fibre and leaving the place returned with his companions to the chimneys twenty-five minutes after a tremendous explosion was heard it seemed as if the whole island trembled to its base a volley of stones rose into the air as if they had been vomited from a volcano the concussion was such that it shook the chimneys the colonists though two miles away were thrown to the ground rising again they clambered up to the plateau and hurried towards the place a large opening had been torn into the granite coping a rapid stream of water escaped through it leaping and foaming across the plateau and reaching the brink fell a distance of three hundred feet to the shore below. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of the Mysterious Island。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne translated by stephen w white chapter eighteen pencroff doubts no more the old outlet of the lake a subterranean descent the way through the granite top has disappeared the central cavern the lower well mystery the blows with the pick the return smith's project had succeeded but as was his manner he stood motionless absorbed his lips closed giving no sign of satisfaction herbert was all enthusiasm neb jumped with joy pencroff shaking his head murmured indeed our engineer does wonders the nitroglycerine had worked powerfully the opening was so great that at least a three times greater volume of water escaped by it than by the former outlet in a little while therefore the level of the lake would be lowered two feet or more the colonists returned to the chimneys and collecting some picks spears ropes a steel and tinder returned to the plateau top went with them on the way the sailor could not resist saying to the engineer but do you really think mr smith that one could blow up the whole island with this beautiful liquid of yours doubtless replied the other island continents the world itself it is only a question of quantity couldn't you use this nitroglycerine to load firearms no pencroff because it is too shattering but it would be easy to make gun cotton or even common powder as we have the material unfortunately the guns themselves are wanting but with a little ingenuity pencroff had erased impossible from his vocabulary the colonists having reached prospect plateau hastened at once to the old outlet of the lake which ought now to be uncovered and when the water no longer poured through it it would doubtless be easy to explore its interior arrangement in a few moments they reached the lower angle of the lake and saw at a glance what the result was there in the granite wall of the lake above the water level appeared the long looked for opening a narrow ledge left bare by the subsistence of water gave them access to it the opening was twenty feet wide though only two feet high it was like the gutter mouth in a pavement it was not open enough for the party to get in but neb and pencroff with their picks in less than an hour had given it a sufficient height the engineer looked in and saw that the walls of the opening in its upper part showed a slope of from thirty to thirty-five degrees and therefore unless they became much steeper it would be easy to descend perhaps to the level of the sea 
and if as was probable some vast cavern existed in the interior of the massive granite it was possible that they could make use of it what are we wanting for mr smith cried the sailor all impatience to begin the exploration top you see has gone ahead we must have some light said the engineer go nap and cut some resinous branches the negro and herbert ran to some pine and evergreens growing upon the bank and soon returned with branches which were made into torches having lit them the colonists with smith leading entered the dark passage but recently filled with water contrary to their expectation the passage grew higher as they advanced until soon they were able to walk upright the granite walls worn by the water were very slippery and the party had to look out for falls they therefore fastened themselves together with a cord like mountain climbers fortunately some granite steps had made the descent less perilous drops of water still clinging to the rocks glistened like stalactites in the torchlight the engineer looked carefully at this black granite he could not see a stratum or a flaw the mass was compact and of fine grain and the passage must have been coeval with the island it had not been worn little by little by the constant action of water pluto and not neptune had shaped it and the traces of igneous action were still visible upon its surface the colonists descended but slowly they experienced some emotion in thus adventuring into the depths of the earth in being its first human visitants no one spoke but each was busied with his own reflections and the thought occurred to more than one that perhaps some pulp or other gigantic cephalopod might inhabit the interior cavities which communicated with the sea it was therefore necessary to advance cautiously top was ahead of the little troop and they could rely on the dog's sagacity to give the alarm on occasion after having descended one hundred feet smith halted and the others came up with him they were standing in a cavern of moderate size drops of water fell from the roof but they did not ooze through the rocks they were simply the last traces of the torrent which had so long roared through this place and the air though humid emitted no mephitic vapour well cyrus said spilett here is a retreat sufficiently unknown and hidden in the depths but it's uninhabitable how uninhabitable asked the sailor why it is too small and too dark cannot we make it bigger blast it out and make openings for the light and air asked pencroff who now thought nothing impracticable let us push on said smith perhaps lower down nature will have spared us this work we are only a third of the way down observed herbert but one hundred feet responded cyrus and it is possible that one hundred feet lower where is top asked neb interrupting his master they looked about the cavern the dog was not there let us overtake him said smith resuming the march the engineer noted carefully all the deviations of the route and easily kept a general idea of their direction which was towards the sea the party had not descended more than fifty feet further when their attention was arrested by distant sounds coming from the depths of the rock they stopped and listened these sounds borne along the passage as the voice through an acoustic tube were distinctly heard it stops barking cried herbert yes and the brave dog is barking furiously added pencroff we have our spears said smith come on and be ready it is becoming more and more interesting whispered spilett to the sailor who nodded assent they hurried to the rescue of the dog his barks grew more distinct they could hear that he was in a strange rage had he been captured by some animal whom he had disturbed without thinking of the danger the colonists felt themselves drawn on by an irresistible curiosity and slipped rather than ran down the passage sixteen feet lower they came up with the dog there the corridor opened out into a vast and magnificent cavern top rushing about was barking furiously pencroff and neb shaking their torches lit up all the inequalities of the granite and the others with their spears ready held themselves prepared for any emergency but the enormous cavern was empty the colonists searched everywhere they could find no living thing 
Nevertheless, Top continued barking, and neither threats nor caresses could stop him. "'There must be some place where the water escaped to the sea,' said the engineer. "'Yes, and look out for a hole,' answered Pencroff. "'On, Top, on!' cried Smith, and the dog, encouraged by his master, ran towards the end of the cavern and redoubled his barking. Following him, they saw by the light of the torches the opening of what looked like a well in the granite. Here undoubtedly was the place where the water had found its way out of the cavern. Instead of being a corridor sloping and accessible, it was a perpendicular well, impossible to descend. The torches were waved above the opening. They saw nothing. Smith broke off a burning branch and dropped it into the abyss. The resin, fanned by the wind of its fall, burned brightly and illuminated the interior of the pit, but showed nothing else. Then the flame was extinguished with a slight hiss, which indicated that it had reached the water, which must be the sea level. The engineer calculated, from the time taken in this fall, that the depth was about ninety feet. The floor of the cavern was therefore that distance above the sea. "'Here is our house,' said Smith. "'But it was preoccupied,' said Spilett, whose curiosity was unsatisfied. "'Well, the thing that had it, whether amphibious or not, had fled by this outlet and vacated in our favor," replied the engineer. "'Anyhow, I should like to have been top a quarter of an hour ago,' said the sailor, "'for he does not bark at nothing.' Smith looked at his dog, and those who were near him heard him murmur, Yes, I am convinced that Top knows more than we do about many things. However, the wishes of the colonists had been in a great measure realized. Chance, aided by the marvelous acuteness of their chief, had done them good service. Here they had at their disposal a vast cavern, whose extent could not be estimated in the insufficient light of the torches, but which could certainly be easily partitioned off with bricks into chambers, and arranged, if not as a house, at least as a spacious suite of rooms. The water, having left it, could not return. The place was free. But two difficulties remained. The possibility of lighting the cavern, and the necessity of rendering it easier of access. The first could not be done from above, as the enormous mass of granite was over them but perhaps they would be able to pierce the outer wall which faced the sea. Smith, who during the descent had kept account of the slope, and therefore of the length of the passage, believed that this part of the wall could not be very thick. If light could be thus obtained, so could entrance, as it was as easy to pierce a door as windows, and to fix a ladder on the outside. Smith communicated his ideas to his companions. Then let us set to work answered Pencroff. I have my pick, and will I soon make daylight in the granite? Where shall I begin? Here, answered the engineer, showing the strong sailor a considerable hollow in the wall, which greatly diminished its thickness. Pencroff attacked the granite, and for half an hour, by the light of the torches, made the splinters fly about him. Then Neb took his place, and Spilett after Neb. The work continued two hours longer, and, when it seemed as if the wall could not be thicker than the length of the pick, at the last stroke of spillet, the implement, passing through, fell on the outside. "'Hurrah for ever!' cried Pencroff. The wall was but three feet thick. Smith looked through the opening, which was eighty feet above the ground. Before him extended the coast, the islet, and beyond the boundless sea. Through the hole the light entered in floods, inundating the splendid cavern and producing a magical effect. While on the left hand it measured only thirty feet in height and one hundred in length, to the right it was enormous, and its vault rose to a height of more than eighty feet. In some places granite pillars, irregularly disposed, supported the arches as in the nave of a cathedral. Resting upon a sort of lateral pyres, here sinking into elliptic arches, there rising in ogive mouldings, losing itself in the dark bays, half seen in the shadows through the fantastic arches, ornamented by a profusion of projections which seemed like pendants, this vaulted roof afforded a picturesque blending of all the architectures, Byzantine, Roman, Gothic, that the hand of man had produced. And this was the work of nature she alone had constructed this magic alhambra in a granite rock 
The colonists were overcome with admiration. Expecting to find but a narrow cavern, they found themselves in a sort of marvellous palace, and Neb had taken off his hat as if he had been transported into a temple. Exclamations of pleasure escaped from their lips, and the hurrahs echoed and re-echoed from the depths of dark nave. "'My friends,' cried Smith, "'when we shall have lighted the interior of this place, when we shall have arranged our chambers, our storerooms, our offices in the left-hand portion, we will still have this splendid cavern, which shall be our study and our museum.' "'And we will call it?' asked Herbert. "'Granite House.' answered Smith, and his companions saluted the name with their cheers. By this time the torches were nearly consumed, and as, in order to return, it was necessary to regain the summit of the plateau and to remount the corridor, it was decided to postpone until the morrow the work of arranging their new house. Before leaving, Smith leaned over the dark pit once more and listened attentively, but there was no sound from these depths save that of the water agitated by the undulations of the surge. A resinous torch was again thrown in, lighting up anew for an instant the walls of the well, but nothing suspicious was revealed. If any marine monster had been inopportunely surprised by the retreat of the waters, he had already regained the open sea by the subterranean passage, which extended under the shore. Nevertheless, the engineer stood motionless, listening attentively, his gaze plunged in the abyss, without speaking. Then the sailor approached him, and, touching his arm, "'Mr. Smith,' he said. "'What is it, my friend?' responded the engineer, like one returning from the land of dreams. "'The torches are nearly out.' "'Forward,' said Smith, and the little troop left the cavern and began the ascent through the dark weir. Top walked behind, still growling in an odd way. The ascension was sufficiently laborious, and the colonists stopped for a few minutes at the upper grotto, which formed a sort of landing halfway up the long granite stairway. Then they began again to mount, and pretty soon they felt the fresh air. The drops, already evaporated, no longer shone on the walls. The light of the torches diminished, naps went out, and they had to hasten, in order to avoid having to grope their way through the profound darkness. A little before four o'clock, just as the torch of the sailor was burned out, Smith and his companions emerged from the mouth of the passage. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter 19. Smith's Plan. The Front of Granite House. The Rope Ladder. Pencroft's Ideas. The Aromatic Herbs. A Natural Warren. Getting Water. The View from the Windows of Granite House. On the next day, the 22nd of May, the colonists proceeded to take possession of their new abode. They longed to exchange their insufficient shelter for the vast retreat in the rock, impenetrable to wind and wave. Still they did not intend altogether to abandon the chimneys, but to make a workshop of it. Smith's first care was to ascertain exactly over what point rose the face of Granite House. He went down on the shore to the foot of the immense wall, and, as the pickaxe which slipped from the reporter's hand must have fallen perpendicularly, he could ascertain, by finding this pickaxe, the place where the granite had been pierced. And, in fact, when the implement was found half buried in the sand, the hole in the rock could be seen eighty feet above it, in a straight line. Rock pigeons were already fluttering in and out by this narrow opening. They evidently thought Granite House had been discovered for their benefit. The engineer intended to divide the right portion of the cavern into several chambers, opening upon an entrance corridor, and lighted by five windows, and a door cut in the face of the rock. Pencroff agreed with him as to the window, but could not understand the use of the door, since the old weir furnished a natural staircase to Granite House. "'My friend,' said Smith, "'if we could get to our abode by the weir, so can others.' 
I want to block up this passage at its mouth, to seal it hermetically, and even, if necessary, to conceal the entrance by damming up the lake. And how shall we get in? said the sailor. By a rope ladder from the outside, answered Smith, which we can pull up after us. But why take so many precautions? said Pencroff. So far the animals we have found here have not been formidable, and there are certainly no natives. Are you so sure, Pencroff? said the engineer, looking steadily at the sailor. Of course we shall not be perfectly sure till we have explored every part. Yes, said Smith, for we know as yet only a small portion. But even if there are no enemies upon the island, they may come from the outside, for this part of the Pacific is a dangerous region. We must take every precaution. So the façade of Granite House was lighted with five windows, and with a door opening upon the apartments, and admitting plenty of light into that wonderful nave which was to serve as their principal hall-room. This façade, eighty feet above the ground, was turned to east, and caught the first rays of the morning sun. It was protected by the slope of the rock from the piercing northeast wind. In the meantime, while the sashes of the windows were being made, the engineer meant to close the openings with thick shutters, which would keep out wind and rain, and which could be readily concealed. The first work was to hollow out these windows, but the pickaxe was at a disadvantage among these hard rocks, and Smith again had recourse to the nitroglycerine, which, used in small quantities, had the desired effect. Then the work was finished by the pick and mattock, the five ogive windows, the bay, the bull's eye, and the door and some days after the work was begun the sun shone in upon the innermost recesses of granite house according to smith's plan the space had been divided into five compartments looking out upon the sea upon the right was the hall opposite to the door from which the ladder was to hang then a kitchen thirty feet long a dining room forty feet long a sleeping room of the same size and last a guest chamber claimed by pencroff and bordering on the great hall these rooms or rather this suite of rooms in which they were to live did not occupy the full depth of the cave they opened upon a corridor which ran between them and a long storehouse where were kept their utensils and provisions all the products of the island animal and vegetable could be kept there in good condition and free from damp they had room enough and there was a place for everything Moreover, the colonists still had at their disposal the little grotto above the large cavern, which would serve them as a sort of attic. This plan agreed upon, they became brickmasters again, and brought their bricks to the foot of Granite House. Until that time the colonists had had access to the cavern only by the old weir. This mode of communication compelled them first to climb up Prospect Plateau, going round by the river, to descend two hundred feet through the passage, and then to ascend the same distance when they wanted to regain the plateau. This involved fatigue and loss of time. Smith resolved to begin at once the construction of a strong rope ladder, which, once drawn up after them, would render the entrance to Granite House absolutely inaccessible. This ladder was made with the greatest care, and its sides were twisted of fibres by means of a shuttle. Thus constructed, it had the strength of a cable. The ranks were made of a kind of red cedar, with light and durable branches, and the whole was put together by the practised hand of Pencroff. Another kind of tackle was made of vegetable fibre, and a sort of derrick was set up at the foot of Granite House. In this way the bricks could easily be carried to the level of Granite House, and when some thousands of them were on the spot, with abundance of lime, they began work on the interior. They easily set up the wood partitions, and in a short time the space was divided into chambers and a storehouse, according to the plan agreed upon. These labors went on quickly under the direction of the engineer, who himself wielded hammer and trowel. They worked confidently and gaily. Pencroff, whether carpenter, rope-maker, or mason, always had a joke ready, and all shared in his good humor. His confidence in the engineer was absolute. All their wants would be supplied in Smith's own time. He dreamed of canals, of quarries, of mines, of machinery, even of railroads one day to cover the island. The engineer let Pencroff talk. He knew how contagious is confidence. He smiled to hear him, and said nothing of his own inquietude. 
but in his heart he feared that no help could come from the outside in that part of the pacific out of the track of ships and at such a distance from other lands that no boat could dare put out to sea they had only themselves to rely upon but as the sailor said they were far ahead of the swiss family robinson for whom miracles were always being wrought in truth they knew nature and he who knows nature will succeed when others would lie down to die herbert especially distinguished himself in the work he understood at a word and was prompt in execution smith grew fonder of him every day and herbert was devoted to the engineer pencroff saw the growing friendship but the honest sailor was not jealous neb was courage zeal and self-denial in person he relied on his master as absolutely as pencroff but his enthusiasm was not so noisy the sailor and he were great friends as to spilett his skill and efficiency were a daily wonder to pencroff he was the model of a newspaper man quick alike to understand and to perform the ladder was put in place on the twenty eighth of may it was eighty feet high and consisted of one hundred rungs and profiting by a projection in the face of the cliff about forty feet up smith had divided it into two parts this projection served as a sort of landing place for the head of the lower ladder shortening it and thus lessening its swing they fastened it with a cord so that it could easily be raised to the level of granite house the upper ladder they fastened at top and bottom in this way the ascent was much more easy besides smith counted upon putting up at some future time a hydraulic elevator which would save his companions much fatigue and loss of time the colonists rapidly accustomed themselves to the use of this ladder the sailor who was used to shrouds and ratlines was their teacher the great trouble was with top whose four feet were not intended for ladders but pencroff was persevering and top at last learned to run up and down as nimbly as his brothers of the circus we cannot say whether the sailor was proud of this pupil but he sometimes carried top up on his back and top made no complaints all this time the question of provisions was not neglected every day herbert and the reporter spent some hours in the chase they hunted only through jacamar woods on the left of the river for in the absence of boat or bridge they had not yet crossed the mercy the immense woody tracts which they had named the forests of the far west were entirely unexplored this important excursion was set apart for the first five days of the coming spring but jacamar woods were not wanting in game kangaroos and boars were plenty there and the iron-tipped spears the bows and arrows of the hunters did wonders more than this herbert discovered at the southwest corner of the lagoon a natural warren a sort of moist meadow covered with willows and aromatic herbs which perfumed the air such as thyme basil and all sorts of mint of which rabbits are so fond the reporter said that when the feast was spread for them it would be strange if the rabbits did not come and the hunters explored the warren carefully at all events it produced an abundance of useful plants and would give a naturalist plenty of work herbert gathered a quantity of plants possessing different medicinal properties pectoral astringent febrifuge anti-rheumatic when pencroff asked of what good were all this collection of herbs to cure us when we are sick answered the boy why should we be sick since there are no doctors on the island said pencroff quite seriously to this no reply could be made but the lad went on gathering his bundle which was warmly welcomed at granite house especially as he had found some mountain mint known in north america as oswego tea which produces a pleasant beverage that day the hunters in their search reached the site of the warren the ground was perforated with little holes like a colander barrows cried herbert but are they inhabited this is the question a question which was quickly resolved almost immediately hundreds of little animals like rabbits took to flight in every direction with such rapidity that top himself was distanced but the reporter was determined not to quit the place till he had captured half a dozen of the little beasts he wanted them now for the kitchen domestication would come later with a few snares laid at the mouth of the barrows the affair would be easy 
but there were no snares nor materials for snares so they patiently rummaged every form with their sticks until four rodents were taken they were rabbits much like their european congeners and commonly known as american hares they were brought back to granite house and figured in that evening's meal delicious eating they were and the warren bade fair to be a most valuable reserve for the colonists on the thirty first of may the partitions were finished and nothing remained but to furnish the rooms which would occupy the long days of winter a chimney was built in the room which served as a kitchen the construction of the stove-pipe gave them a good deal of trouble the simplest material was clay and as they did not wish to have any outlet on the upper plateau they pierced a hole above the kitchen window and conducted the pipe obliquely to this hole no doubt during an eastern gale the pipe would smoke but the wind rarely blew from that quarter and head cook neb was not particular when these domestic arrangements had been made the engineer proceeded to block up the mouth of the old weir by the lake so as to prevent any approach from that quarter great square blocks were rolled to the opening and strongly cemented together smith did not yet attempt to put in execution his project of damming up the waters of the lake so as to conceal this weir he was satisfied with concealing the obstruction he had placed there by means of grass shrubs and thistles which were planted in the interstices of the rocks and which by the next spring would sprout up luxuriantly meanwhile he utilized the weir in conducting to their new abode a little stream of fresh water from the lake a little drain constructed just below its level had the effect of supplying them with twenty-five or thirty gallons a day so there was likely to be no want of water at granite house at last all was finished just in time for the tempestuous season they closed the windows with thick shutters till smith should have time to make glass from the sand in the rocky projections around the windows spilett had arranged very artistically plants of various kinds and long floating grasses and thus the windows were framed picturesquely in green the denizens of this safe and solid dwelling could but be delighted with their work the windows opened upon a limitless horizon shut in only by the two mandible capes on the north and by claw cape at the south union bay spread magnificently before them they had reasons enough to be satisfied and pencroff did not spare his praises of what he called his suite on the fifth floor End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter twenty the rainy season what to wear a seal hunt candle making work in the granite house the two causeways return from a visit to the oyster bed what herbert found in his pocket the winter season began in earnest with the month of june which corresponded with december in our northern hemisphere showers and storms succeeded each other without an intermission and the inmates of the granite house could appreciate the advantages of a dwelling impervious to the weather the chimneys would indeed have proved a miserable shelter against the inclemency of the winter they feared even lest the high tides driven by the sea wind should pour in and destroy their furnaces and their foundry all this month of june was occupied with various labors which left plenty of time for hunting and fishing so that the reserve stock of food was constantly kept up pencroff intended as soon as he had time to set traps from which he expected great results he had made snares of ligneous fibre and not a day passed but some rodent was captured from the warren neb spent all his time in smoking and salting meat the question of clothes now came up for serious discussion the colonists had no other garments than those which they wore when the balloon cast them on shore these fortunately were warm and substantial and by dint of extreme care even their linen had been kept clean and whole but everything would soon wear out and moreover during a vigorous winter they would suffer severely from cold 
Here Smith was fairly baffled. He had been occupied in providing for their most urgent wants, food and shelter, and the winter was upon them before the clothes problem could be solved. They must resign themselves to bear the cold with fortitude, and when the dry season returned would undertake a great hunt of the mouflons which they had seen on Mount Franklin, and whose wool the engineer could surely make into warm thick cloth. He would think over the method. "'Well, we must toast ourselves before the fire,' said Pencroff. "'There's plenty of firewood, no reason for sparing it.' "'Besides,' added Spilett, "'Lincoln Island is not in very high latitude, and the winters are probably mild. Did you not say, Cyrus, that the thirty-fifth parallel corresponded with that of Spain in the other hemisphere?' "'Yes,' said the engineer, "'but the winter in Spain is sometimes very cold, with snow and ice, and we may have a hard time of it.' Still we are on an island, and have a good chance for more moderate winter. Why, Mr. Smith, said Herbert, because the sea, my boy, may be considered as an immense reservoir in which the summer heat lies stored. At the coming of winter this heat is again given out, so that the neighboring regions have always a medium temperature, cooler in summer and warmer in winter. We shall see, said Pencroff, I am not going to bother myself about the weather. One thing is certain, the days are getting short already, and the evenings long. Suppose we talk a little about candles. Nothing is easier, said Smith. To talk about? asked the sailor. To make. And when shall we begin? Tomorrow, by a seal hunt. What, to make dips? No, indeed, Pencroff, candles. Such was the engineer's project, which was feasible enough, as he had lime and sulfuric acid, and as the amphibia of the island would furnish the necessary fat. It was now the 4th of June, the Pentecost Sunday, which they kept as a day of rest and thanksgiving. They were no longer miserable castaways, they were colonists. On the next day, the 5th of June, they started for the islet. They had to choose the time of low tide to ford the channel, and all determined that, somehow or other, they must build a boat which would give them easy communication with all parts of the island, and would enable them to go up the Mercy, when they should undertake that grand exploration of the southeastern district which they had reserved for the first good weather. Seals were numerous, and the hunters, armed with their iron-spiked spears, easily killed half a dozen of them, which Neb and Pencroff skinned. Only the hides and fat were carried back to Granite House, the former to be made into shoes. The result of the hunt was about three hundred pounds of fat, every pound of which could be used in making candles. The operation was simple enough, and the product, if not the best of its kind, was all they needed. Had Smith had at his disposition nothing but sulfuric acid, by heating this acid with neutral fats, such as the fat of the seal, separate the glycerine, which again could be resolved by means of boiling water, into olein, margarine, and stearine. But to simplify the operation, he preferred to saponify the fat by lime. He thus obtained a calcareous soap, easily decomposed by sulfuric acid, which precipitated the lime as a sulphate, and freed the fatty acids. The first of these three acids, olein, margarine, and stearine, was a liquid which he expelled by pressure. The other two formed the raw material of the candles. In twenty-four hours the work was done. Wicks were made, after some unsuccessful attempts, from vegetable fiber, and were steeped in the liquefied compound. They were real stearine candles, made by hand, white and smooth. During all this month work was going on inside their new abode. There was plenty of carpenter's work to do. They improved and completed their tools, which were very rudimentary. Scissors were made, among other things, so that they were able to cut their hair, and, if not actually to shave their beards, at least to trim them to their liking. Herbert had no beard, and Neb none to speak of, but the others found ample employment for the scissors. They had infinite trouble in making a handsaw, but at last succeeded in shaping an instrument which would cut wood by a rigorous application. Then they made tables, chairs, and cupboards to finish the principal rooms, and the frames of beds, whose only bedding was mattresses of rag grass. The kitchen, with its shelves, on which lay the terracotta utensils, its brick furnace, and its washing stone, looked very comfortable, and Neb cooked with the gravity of a chemist in his laboratory. 
but joiner's work had to give place to carpentry the new weir created by the explosion rendered necessary the construction of two causeways one upon prospect plateau the other on the shore itself now the plateau and the coast were transversely cut by a water course which the colonists had to cross whenever they wished to reach the northern part of the island to avoid this they had to make a considerable detour and to walk westward as far as the sources of red creek their best plan therefore was to build two causeways one on the plateau and one on the shore twenty to twenty-five feet long simply constructed of trees squared by the axe this was the work of some days when these bridges had been built neb and pencroff profited by them to go to the oyster bed which had been discovered off the down they dragged after them a sort of rough cart which had taken the place of the inconvenient hurdle and they brought back several thousand oysters which were readily acclimated among the rocks and formed a natural preserve at the mouth of the mercy they were excellent of their kind and formed an almost daily article of diet in fact lincoln island though the colonists had explored but a small portion of it already supplied nearly all their wants while it seemed likely that a minute exploration of the western forest would reveal a world of new treasures only one privation still distressed the colonists azotic foods they had in plenty and the vegetables which corrected it from the ligneous roots of the dragon trees submitted to fermentation they obtained a sort of acidulated beer they had even made sugar without sugar cane or beetroot by collecting the juice which distills from the acer saccharinum a sort of maple which flourishes in all parts of the temperate zone and which abounded on the island they made a very pleasant tea from the plant brought from the warren and finally they had plenty of salt the only mineral component necessary to food but bread was still to seek perhaps at some future time they would have been able to replace this aliment by some equivalent sago flower or the breadfruit tree which they might possibly have discovered in the woods of the southwest but so far they had not met with them just at this time a little incident occurred which brought about what smith with all his ingenuity could not have achieved one rainy day the colonists were together in the large hall of granite house when herbert suddenly cried see mr smith a grain of corn and he showed his companions a single grain which had got into the lining of his waistcoat through a hole in his pocket pencroff had given him some ring doves in richmond and in feeding them one of the grains had remained in his pocket a grain of corn said the engineer quickly yes sir but only one that's a wonderful help said pencroff laughing the bread that grain will make will never choke us herbert was about to throw away the grain when cyrus smith took it examined it found that it was in good condition and said quietly to the sailor pencroff do you know how many ears of corn will spring from one grain one i suppose said the sailor surprised at the question ten pencroff and how many grains are there to an ear faith i don't know eighty on an average said smith so then if we plant this grain we shall get from it a harvest of eight hundred grains from them in the second year six hundred and forty thousands in the third five hundred and twelve millions in the fourth more than four hundred billions that is the proportion his companions listened in silence the figures stupefied them yes my friend resumed the engineer such is the increase of nature and what is even this multiplication of a grain of corn whose ears have only eight hundred grains compared with the poppy plant which has thirty-two thousand seeds or the tobacco plant which has three hundred and sixty thousands in a few years but for the numerous enemies which destroy them these plants would cover the earth and now pencroff he resumed do you know how many bushels there are in four hundred billion grains no answered the sailor i only know that i am an idiot well there will be more than three millions at one hundred and thirty thousand the bushel three millions cried pencroff three millions in four years yes said smith and even in two if as i hope we can get two harvests a year in this latitude pencroff answered with a tremendous hurrah so herbert 
added the engineer your discovery is of immense importance remember my friends that everything may be of use to us in our present situation indeed mr smith i will remember it said pencroff and if ever i find one of those grains of tobacco which increase three hundred and sixty thousand times i will take care not to throw it away and now what must we do we must plant this grain said herbert yes added spilett and with the greatest care for upon it depend our future harvests provided that it grows said the sailor it will grow answered smith it was the twentieth of june a good time for planting the precious grain they thought at first of planting it in a pot but upon consideration they determined to trust it frankly to the soil the same day it was planted with the greatest precaution the weather clearing a little they walked up to the plateau above granite house and chose there a spot well sheltered from the wind and exposed to the midday fervor of the sun this spot was cleared weeded and even dug so as to destroy insects and worms it was covered with a layer of fresh earth enriched with a little lime a palisade was built around it and then the grain was covered up in its moist bed they seemed to be laying the cornerstone of an edifice pencroff was reminded of the extreme care with which they had lighted their only match but this was a more serious matter the castaways could always have succeeded in obtaining fire by some means or other but no earthly power could restore that grain of corn if by ill fortune it should perish End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the mysterious island this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by piotr natter the mysterious island by jules verne translated by stephen w white chapter twenty one several degrees below zero exploration of the swamp region to the southeast the view of the sea a conversation concerning the future of the pacific ocean the incessant labor of the infusoria what will become of this globe the chase the swamp of the tadorns from this moment pencroff did not let a day pass without visiting what he called with perfect gravity his cornfield and alas for any insect that ventured there no mercy would be shown them near the end of the month of june after the interminable rains the weather became decidedly cold and on the twenty ninth a fahrenheit thermometer would continually have stood at only twenty degrees above zero the next day the thirtieth of june the day which corresponds to the thirty-first of december in the northern hemisphere was a friday neb said the year ended on an unlucky day but pencroff answered that consequently the new year began on a lucky one which was more important at all events it began with a very cold snap ice accumulated at the mouth of the mercy and the whole surface of the lake was soon frozen over fresh firewood had continually to be procured pencroff had not waited for the river to freeze to convey enormous loads of wood to their destination the current was a tireless motor and conveyed the floating wood until the ice froze around it to the fuel which the forest so plentifully furnished were added several cartloads of coal which they found at the foot of the spurs of mount franklin the powerful heat from the coal was thoroughly appreciated in a temperature which on the fourth of july fell to eight degrees above zero a second chimney had to be set up in the dining-room where they all worked together during this cold spell cyrus smith could not be thankful enough that he had conducted to the granite house a small stream of water from lake grant taken below the frozen surface then conducted through the old weir it arrived unfrozen at the interior reservoir which had been dug at an angle of the storehouse and which when too full emptied itself into the sea about this time the weather being very dry the colonists dressing as warmly as possible determined to devote a day to the exploration of that part of the island situated to the southeast between the mercy and claw cape it was a large swampy district and might offer good hunting as aquatic birds must abound there they would have eight or nine miles to go and as far to return consequently the whole day must be given up 
as it concerned the exploration of an unknown portion of the island every one had to take part therefore on the fifth of july at six o'clock in the morning before the sun had fairly risen the whole party armed with spears snares bows and arrows and furnished with enough provisions for the day started from granite house preceded by top who gambled before them they took the shortest route which was to cross the mercy on the blocks of ice which then obstructed it but as the reporter very truly observed this cannot supply the place of a real bridge so the construction of a real bridge was set down as work for the future this was the first time that the colonists had set foot on the right bank of the mercy and had plunged into the forest of large and magnificent firs then covered with snow but they had not gone half a mile when the barking of top frightened from a dense thicket where they had taken up their abode a whole family of quadrupeds why they look like foxes said herbert when he saw them scampering quickly away and they were foxes but foxes of enormous size they made a sort of bark which seemed to astonish top for he stopped in his chase and gave these swift animals time to escape the dog had a right to be surprised for he knew nothing of natural history but by this barking the grayish red color of their hair and their black tails which ended in a white tuft these foxes had betrayed their origin so herbert gave them without hesitation their true name of culpeux these culpeux are often met with in chile in the saint malo group and in all those parts of america lying between the thirtieth and the fortieth parallel herbert was very sorry that top had not caught one of these carnivora can we eat them asked pencroff who always considered the fauna of the island from that special point of view no said herbert but zoologists have not yet ascertained whether the pupil of the eye of this fox is diurnal or nocturnal or whether the animal would come under the genus canine smith could not help smiling at this remark of the boy which showed thoughtfulness beyond his ears as for the sailor from the moment these foxes ceased to belong to the edible species they ceased to interest him ever since the kitchen had been established at granite house he had been saying that precautions ought to be taken against these four-footed plunderers a fact which no one denied having turned jetsam point the party came upon a long reach washed by the sea it was then eight o'clock in the morning the sky was very clear as is usual in the prolonged cold winter but warmed by their work smith and his companions did not suffer from the sharpness of the atmosphere besides there was no wind the absence of which always renders a low temperature more endurable the sun bright but cold rose from the ocean and his enormous disk was poised in the horizon the sea was a calm blue sheet of water like a landlocked sea under a clear sky claw cape bent in the shape of an atagan was clearly defined about four miles to the southeast to the left the border of the swamp was abruptly intercepted by a little point which shone brightly against the sun certainly in that part of union bay which was not protected from the open sea even by a sandbank ships beaten by an east wind could not have found shelter by the perfect calm of the sea with no shoals to disturb its waters by its uniform color with no tinge of yellow and finally by the entire absence of reefs they knew that this side was steep and that here the ocean was fathoms deep behind them in the west at a distance of about four miles they saw the beginning of the forest of the far west they could almost have believed themselves upon some desolate island in the antarctic regions surrounded by ice the party halted here for breakfast a fire of brushwood and seaweed was lighted and neb prepared the meal of cold meat to which he added some cups of oswego tea while eating they looked around them this side of lincoln island was indeed barren and presented a strong contrast to the western part the reporter thought that if the castaways had been thrown upon this coast they would have had a very melancholy impression of their future home i do not believe we could even have reached it said the engineer for the sea is very deep here and there is not even a rock which would have served as a refuge before granite house there were shoals at least and a little island which multiplied our chances of safety here is only the bottomless sea it is curious enough said spilett that this island relatively so small presents so varied a soil 
this diversity of appearance belongs logically only to continents of a considerable area one would really think that the western side of lincoln island so rich and fertile was washed by the warm waters of the gulf of mexico and that the northern and southern coasts extended into a sort of arctic sea you are right my dear spilett replied the engineer i have observed the same thing i have found this island curious both in its shape and in its character it has all the peculiarities of a continent and i would not be surprised if it had been a continent formerly what a continent in the middle of the pacific cried pencroff why not answered smith why should not australia new ireland all that the english geographers called australasia joined to the archipelagos of the pacific ocean have formed in times past a sixth part of the world as important as europe or asia africa or the two americas my mind does not refuse to admit that all the islands rising from this vast ocean are the mountains of a continent now engulfed but which formerly rose majestically from these waters like atlantis asked herbert yes my boy if that ever existed and lincoln island may have been a part of this continent asked pencroff it is probable replied smith and that would explain the diversity of products upon the surface and the number of animals which still live here added herbert yes my boy answered the engineer and that gives me a new argument in support of my theory it is certain after what we have seen that the animals in the island are numerous and what is more curious is that the species are extremely varied there must be a reason for this and mine is that lincoln island was formerly a part of some vast continent which has little by little sunk beneath the surface of the pacific then said pencroff who did not seem entirely convinced what remains of this old continent may disappear in its turn and leave nothing between america and asia yes said smith there will be new continents which millions upon millions of animalculae are building at the moment and who are these masons inquired pencroff the coral insects answered smith it is these who have built by their constant labor the island of clermont tonnerre the atolls and many other coral islands which abound in the pacific it takes forty-seven million of these insects to deposit one particle and yet with the marine salt which they absorb and the solid elements of the water which they assimilate these animalculae produce limestone and limestone forms those enormous submarine structures whose hardness and solidity is equal to that of granite formerly during the first epochs of creation nature employed heat to produce land by upheaval but now she lets those microscopic insects replace this agent whose dynamic power at the interior of the globe has evidently diminished this fact is sufficiently proved by the great number of volcanoes actually extinct on the surface of the earth i verily believe that century after century and infusoria after infusoria will change the pacific some day into a vast continent which new generations will in their turn inhabit and civilize it will take a long time said pencroff nature has time on her side replied the engineer but what is the good of new continents asked herbert it seems to me that the present extent of habitable countries is enough for mankind now nature does nothing in vain nothing in vain indeed replied the engineer but let us see how we can explain the necessity of new continents in the future and precisely in these tropical regions occupied by these coral islands here is an explanation which seems to me at least plausible we are listening mr smith replied herbert this is my idea scientists generally admit that some day the globe must come to an end or rather the animal and vegetable life will be no longer possible on account of the intense cold which will prevail what they cannot agree upon is the cause of this cold some think that it will be produced by the cooling of the sun in the course of millions of years others by the gradual extinction of the internal fires of our own globe which have a more decided influence than is generally supposed i hold to this last hypothesis based upon the fact that the moon is without doubt a refrigerated planet which is no longer habitable although the sun continues to pour upon its surface the same amount of heat if then the moon is refrigerated it is because these internal fires 
to which like all the stellar world it owes its origin are entirely extinct in short whatever be the cause our world will certainly some day cool but this cooling will take place gradually what will happen then why the temperate zones at a time more or less distant will be no more habitable than are the polar regions now then human as well as animal life will be driven to latitudes more directly under the influence of the solar rays an immense immigration will take place europe central asia and north america will little by little be abandoned as well as australasia and the lower parts of south america vegetation will follow the human immigration the flora will move towards the equator at the same time with the fauna the central parts of south america and africa will become the inhabited continent the laplanders and the samoyeds will find the climate of the polar sea on the banks of the mediterranean who can tell but that at this epoch the equatorial regions will not be too small to contain and nourish the population of the globe now why should not a provident nature in order from this time to provide a refuge for this animal and vegetable immigration lay the foundation under the equator of a new continent and charge these infusoria with the building of it i have often thought of this my friends and i seriously believe that some day the aspect of our globe will be completely transformed that after the upheaval of new continents the seas will cover the old ones and that in future ages some columbus will discover in the islands of chimborazo or the himalaya or mount blanc all the remains of an america an asia and a europe then at last these new continents in their turn will become uninhabitable the heat will die out as does the heat from a body whose soul has departed and life will disappear from the globe if not for ever at least for a time perhaps then our sphere will rest from its changes and will prepare in death to live again under nobler conditions but all this my friends is with the creator of all things from the talking of the work of these infusoria i have been led into too deep a scrutiny of the secrets of the future my dear cyrus said the reporter these theories are to me prophecies some day they will be accomplished it is a secret with the almighty replied smith all this is well and good said pencroff who had listened with all his ears but will you tell me mr smith if lincoln island has been constructed by these infusoria no replied smith it is of purely volcanic origin then it will probably disappear some day i hope sincerely we won't be here no be easy pencroff we will get away in the meantime said spilett let us settle ourselves as if forever it is never worth while to do anything by halves this ended the conversation breakfast was over the exploration continued and the party soon arrived at the beginning of the swampy district it was indeed a marsh which extended as far as the rounded side forming the southeastern termination of the island and measuring twenty square miles the soil was formed of a siliceous clay mixed with decayed vegetation it was covered by conferve rushes sedges and here and there by beds of herbage thick as a velvet carpet in many places frozen pools glistened under the sun's rays neither rains nor any river swollen by a sudden increase could have produced this water one would naturally conclude that this swamp was fed by the infiltration of water through the soil and this was the fact it was even to be feared that the air here during hot weather was laden with that miasma which engendered the marsh fever above the aquatic herbs on the surface of the stagnant waters a swarm of birds were flying a hunter would not have lost a single shot wild ducks teal and snipe lived there in flocks and it was easy to approach these fearless creatures so thick were these birds that a charge of shot would certainly have brought down a dozen of them but our friends had to content themselves with their bows and arrows a slaughter was less but the quiet arrow had the advantage of not frightening the birds while the sound of the firearms would have scattered them to every corner of the swamp the hunters contented themselves this time with a dozen ducks with white bodies cinnamon colored belts green heads wings black white and red and feathered beaks these herbert recognized as the tadorns top did his share well in the capture of these birds whose name was given this swampy district the colonists now had an abundant reserve of aquatic game 
when the time should come the only question would be how to make a proper use of them and it was probable that several species of these birds would be if not domesticated at least acclimated upon the borders of the lake which would bring them nearer to the place of consumption about five o'clock in the afternoon smith and his companions turned their faces homewards they crossed tadorn's fence and recrossed the mercy upon the ice arriving at granite house at eight o'clock in the evening End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of the Mysterious Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. Translated by Stephen W. White. Chapter 22. The traps. The foxes. The peccaries, the wind veers to the northwest, the snowstorm, the basket makers, the coldest snap of winter, crystallization of the sugar maple, the mysterious shafts, the projected exploration, the pellet of lead. The intense cold lasted until the fifteenth of August, the thermometer never rising above the point hitherto observed. When the atmosphere was calm, this low temperature could be easily borne, but when the wind blew, the poor fellows suffered much for want of warmer clothing. Pencroff regretted that Lincoln Island, instead of harboring so many foxes and seals, with no fur to speak of, did not shelter some families of bears. Bears, said he, are generally well dressed, and I would ask nothing better for the winter than the loan of their warm cloaks. But perhaps, said Neb, laughing, these bears would not consent to give you their cloak pencroff these fellows are no st martins we would make them nap we would make them answered pencroff in a tone of authority but these formidable carnivora did not dwell on the island or if they did had not yet shown themselves herbert pencroff and the reporter were constantly at work getting traps on prospect plateau and on the borders of the forest in the sailor's opinion, any animal whatever would be a prize, and rodents or carnivora, whichever these new traps should entice, would be well received at Granite House. These traps were very simple. They were pits dug in the ground and covered with branches and grass, which hid the openings. At the bottom they placed some bait, whose odor would attract the animals. They used their discretion about the position of their traps, choosing places where numerous footprints indicated the frequent passage of quadrupeds. Every day they went to look at them, and at three different times during the first few days they found in them specimens of those foxes which had been already seen on the right bank of the Mercy. Pshaw! There are nothing but foxes in this part of the world, said Pencroff, as for the third time he drew one of these animals out of the pit. Good for nothing beasts! Stop, said Spilett, they are good for something. For what? To serve as bait to attract others. The reporter was right, and from this time the traps were baited with the dead bodies of foxes. The sailor had made snares out of the threads of carry junk, and these snares were more profitable than the traps. It was a rare thing for a day to pass without some rabbit from the warren being captured. It was always a rabbit, but Neb knew how to vary his sauces, and his companions did not complain. However, once or twice, in the second week of August, the traps contained other and more useful animals than the foxes. There were some of those wild boars which had already been noticed at the north of the lake. Pencroff had no need to ask if these animals were edible. That was evident from their resemblance to the hog of America and Europe. But these are not hogs, let me tell you, said Herbert. My boy, replied the sailor, handing over the trap and drawing out one of these representatives of the swine family by the little appendage which served for a tail. Do let me believe them to be hogs. Why? Because it pleases me. You're fond of hogs, then, Pencroff? I'm very fond of them, replied the sailor, especially of their feet, and if any had eight instead of four, I would like them twice as much. These animals were peccaries, belonging to one of the four genera which make up that family. This particular species were the Tajasans, known by their dark color and the absence of those long fangs which belong to the others of their race. Peccaries generally live in herds, 
and it was likely that these animals abounded in the woody parts of the island. At all events they were edible from head to foot, and Pencroff asked nothing more. About the 15th of August the weather moderated suddenly by a change of wind to the northwest. The temperature rose several degrees higher, and the vapors accumulated in the air were soon resolved into snow. The whole island was covered with a white mantle, and presented a new aspect to its inhabitants. It snowed hard for several days, and the ground was covered two feet deep. The wind soon rose with great violence, and from the top of Granite House they could hear the sea roaring against the reefs. At certain angles the wind made eddies in the air, and the snow, forming itself into high, whirling columns, looked like those twisting water sprouts which vessels attack with cannon. The hurricane, coming steadily from the northwest, spent its force on the other side of the island, and the eastern lookout of Granite House preserved it from a direct attack. During this snowstorm, as terrible as those of the polar regions, neither Smith nor his companions could venture outside. They were completely housed for five days, from the 20th to the 25th of August. They heard the tempest roar through Jacamar Woods, which must have suffered sadly. Doubtless numbers of trees were uprooted, but Pencroff comforted himself with the reflection that there would be fewer to cut down. The wind will be woodcutter, let it alone, said he. How fervently now the inhabitants of Granite House must have thanked heaven for having given to them this solid and impenetrable shelter. Smith had his share of their gratitude, but after all it was nature which had hollowed out this enormous cave, and he had only discovered it. Here all were in safety. The violence of the tempest could not reach them. If they had built a house of brick and wood on Prospect Plateau, it could not have resisted the fury of this hurricane and for the chimneys they heard the billows strike them with such violence that they knew they must be uninhabitable for the sea having entirely covered their islet beat upon them with all its force but here at granite house between these solid walls which neither wind nor water could effect they had nothing to fear during this confinement the colonists were not idle there was plenty of wood in the storehouse cut into planks and little by little they completed their stock of furniture. As far as tables and chairs went, they were certainly solid enough, for the material was not spared. This furniture was a little too heavy to fulfill its essential purpose of being easily moved, but it was the pride of Neb and Pencroff, who would not have exchanged it for the handsomest bull. Then the carpenters turned basket-makers, and succeeded remarkably well at this new occupation. They had discovered at the northern part of the lake a thick growth of purple osiers. Before the rainy season, Pencroff and Herbert had gathered a good many of these useful shrubs, and their branches, being now well seasoned, could be used to advantage. Their first specimens were rough, but thanks to the skill and intelligence of the workmen consulting together, recalling the models they had seen, and rivaling each other in their efforts, hampers and baskets of different sizes have soon added to the stock of the colony. The storehouse was filled with them, and Neb set away in special baskets his stock of pistachio nuts and roots of the dragon tree. During the last week in August the weather changed again, the temperature fell a little, and the storm was over. The colonists at once started out. There must have been at least two feet of snow on the shore, but it was frozen over the top, which made it easy to walk over. Smith and his companions climbed up Prospect Plateau. What a change they beheld! The woods which they had left in bloom, especially the part nearest to them, where the conifers were plenty, were now one uniform color. Everything was white, from the top of Mount Franklin to the coast, forests, prairie, lake, river, beach. The water of the Mercy ran under a vault of ice, which cracked and broke with a loud noise at every change of tide. Thousands of birds, ducks, and woodpeckers flew over the surface of the lake. The rocks between which the cascade plunged to the borders of the plateau were blocked up with ice. One would have said that the water leaped out of a huge gargoyle, cut by some fantastic artist of the Renaissance. To calculate the damage done to the forest by this hurricane would be impossible until the snow had entirely disappeared. Spilett, Pencroff, and Herbert took this opportunity to look after their traps, and had hard work finding them under their bed of snow. 
There was danger of their falling in themselves, a humiliating thing to be caught in one's own trap. They were spared this annoyance, however, and found the traps had been untouched. Not an animal had been caught, although there were a great many footprints in the neighborhood, among others very clearly impressed marks of claws. Herbert at once classified these carnivora among the cat tribe, a circumstance which justified the engineer's belief in the existence of dangerous beasts on Lincoln Island. Doubtless these beasts dwelt in the dense forests of the far west, but driven by hunger they had ventured as far as Prospect Plateau. Perhaps they scented the inhabitants of Granite House. "'What exactly are these carnivora?' asked Pencroff. "'They are tigers,' replied Herbert. "'I thought those animals were only found in warm countries.' "'In the New World,' replied the lad, "'they are to be found from Mexico to the Pampas of Buenos Aires. Now, as Lincoln Island is in almost the same latitude as La Plata, it is not surprising that tigers are found here.' "'All right, we will be on our guard,' replied Pencroff. In the meantime, the temperature rising, the snow began to melt. It came on to rain, and gradually the white mantle disappeared. Notwithstanding the bad weather, the colonists renewed their stock of provisions, both animal and vegetable. This necessitated excursions into the forest, and thus they discovered how many trees had been beaten down by the hurricane. The sailor and Neb pushed forward with their wagon as far as the coal deposit, in order to carry back some fuel. They saw on their way that the chimney of the pottery oven had been much damaged by the storm, at least six feet had been blown down. They also renewed their stock of wood, as well as that of coal, and the mercy having become free once more, they employed the current to draw several loads to Granite House. It might be that the cold season was not yet over. A visit had been made to the chimneys also, and the colonists could not be sufficiently grateful that this had not been their home during the tempest. The sea had left undoubted signs of its ravages. Lashed by the fury of the wind from the offing, and rushing over Safety Island, it spent its full force upon these passages, leaving them half full of sand and the rocks thickly covered with seaweed. While Neb, Herbert, and Pencroff spent their time in hunting and renewing their supply of fuel, Smith and Spilett set to work to clear out the chimneys. They found the forge and furnaces almost unhurt, so carefully protected had they been by the banks of sand which the colonists had built around them. It was a fortunate thing that they laid in a fresh supply of fuel, for the colonists had not yet seen the end of the intense cold. It is well known that in the northern hemisphere the month of February is noted for its low temperature. The same rule held good in the southern hemisphere, and the end of August, which is the February of North America, did not escape from this climatic law. About the 25th, after another snow and rainstorm, the wind veered to the southeast, and suddenly the cold became intense. In the engineer's opinion, a Fahrenheit thermometer would have indicated about eight degrees below zero, and the cold was rendered more severe by a cutting wind which lasted for several days. The colonists were completely housed again, and as they were obliged to block up all their windows, only leaving one narrow opening for ventilation, the consumption of candles was considerable. In order to economize them, the colonists often contented themselves with only the light from the fire, for fuel was plenty. Once or twice some of them ventured to the beach, among the blocks of ice which were heaped up there by every fresh tide. But they soon climbed up to the granite house again. This ascent was very painful, as their hands were frostbitten by holding on to the frozen sides of the ladder. There were still many leisure hours to be filled up during this long confinement, so Smith undertook another indoor occupation. The only sugar which they had had up to this time was a liquid substance which they had procured by making deep cuts in the bark of the maple tree. They collected this liquid in jars and used it in this condition for cooking purposes. It improved with age, becoming white and more like a syrup in consistency. But they could do better than this and one day Cyrus Smith announced to his companions that he was going to turn them into refiners. "'Refiners! I believe that's a warm trade,' said Pencroff. "'Very warm,' replied the engineer. "'Then it will suit the season,' 
answered the sailor. Refining did not necessitate a stock of complicated tools or skilled workmen. It was a very simple operation. To crystallize this liquid, they first clarified it, by putting it on the fire in earthenware jars, and submitting it to evaporation. Soon a scum rose to the surface, which, when it began to thicken, Neb removed carefully with a wooden ladle. This hastened the evaporation, and at the same time prevented it from scorching. After several hours boiling over a good fire, which did as much good to the cooks as it did to the boiling liquid, it turned into a thick syrup. This syrup was poured into clay moulds, which they had made beforehand, in various shapes in the same kitchen furnace. The next day the syrup hardened, forming cakes and loaves. It was sugar of a reddish color, but almost transparent, and of a most delicious taste. The cold continued until the middle of September, and the inmates of Granite House began to find their captivity rather tedious. Almost every day they took a run outdoors, but they always soon returned. They were constantly at work over their household duties, and talked while they worked. Smith instructed his companions in everything, and especially explained to them the practical applications of science. The colonists had no library at their disposal, but the engineer was a book, always ready at the wished-for page. A book which answered their every question, and one which they often read. Thus the time passed, and these brave men had no fear for the future. However, they were all anxious for the end of their captivity, and longed to see, if not fine weather, at least a cessation of the intense cold. If they had only had warmer clothing, they would have attempted excursions to the downs and to the Tadorn's fence, for game would have been easy to approach, and the hunt would assuredly have been fruitful. But Smith insisted that no one should compromise his health, as he had need of every hand, and his advice was taken. The most impatient of the prisoners, after Pencroff, was Top. The poor dog found himself in close quarters in Granite House, and ran from room to room, showing plainly the uneasiness he felt at this confinement. Smith often noticed that whenever he approached the dark well communicating with the sea, which had its opening in the rear of the storehouse, Top whined in a most curious manner, and ran around and around the opening, which had been covered over with planks of wood. Sometimes he even tried to slip his paws under the planks, as if trying to raise them up, and yelped in a way which indicated at the same time anger and uneasiness. The engineer several times noticed this strange behavior, and wondered what there could be in the abyss to have such a peculiar effect upon this intelligent dog. This well, of course, communicated with the sea. Did it then branch off into narrow passages through the rockwork of the island? Was it in communication with other caves? Did any sea monsters come into it from time to time from the bottom of the pits? The engineer did not know what to think, and strange thoughts passed through his mind. Accustomed to investigate scientific truths, he could not pardon himself for being drawn into the region of the mysterious and supernatural, but how explain why Top, the most sensible of dogs, who never lost his time in barking at the moon, should insist upon exploring this abyss with nose and ear, if there were nothing there to arouse his suspicion? Top's conduct perplexed Smith more than he cared to own to himself. However, the engineer did not mention this to anyone but Spilett, thinking it useless to worry his companions over what might be, after all, only a freak of the dog. At last the cold spell was over. They had rain, snow squalls, hailstorms, and gales of wind, but none of these lasted long. The ice thawed and the snow melted. The beach, plateau, banks of the Mercy, and the forest were again accessible. The return of spring rejoiced the inmates of Granite House, and they soon passed all their time in the open air, only returning to eat and sleep. They hunted a good deal during the latter parts of September, which led Pencroft to make fresh demands for those firearms which he declared Smith had promised them. Smith always put him off, knowing that without a special stock of tools it would be almost impossible to make a gun which would be of any use to them. Besides, he noticed that Herbert and Spilett had become very clever archers, that all sorts of excellent game, both feathered and furred, agoutis, kangaroos, cabais, pigeons, bastards, wild ducks and snipe, fell under their arrows. Consequently, the firearms could wait. 
but the stubborn sailor did not see it in this light and constantly reminded the engineer that he had not provided them with guns and gideon spilett supported pencroff if said he the island contains as we suppose wild beasts we must consider how to encounter and exterminate them the time may come when this will be our first duty but just now it was not the question of firearms which occupied smith's mind but that of clothes those which the colonists were wearing had lasted through the winter but could not hold out till another what they must have at any price was skins of the carnivora or wool of the ruminants and as mouflons mountain goats were plenty they must consider how to collect a flock of them which they could keep for the benefit of the colony they would also lay out a farmyard in a favorable part of the island where they could have an enclosure for domestic animals and a poultry yard these important projects must be carried out during the good weather consequently in view of these future arrangements it was important to undertake a reconnaissance into the unexplored part of lincoln island to wit the high forests which extended along the right bank of the mercy from its mouth to the end of the serpentine peninsula but they must be sure of their weather and a month must yet elapse before it would be worth while to undertake this exploration while they were waiting impatiently an incident occurred which redoubled their anxiety to examine the whole island it was now the twenty-fourth of october on this day pencroff went to look after his traps which he always kept duly baited in one of them he found three animals of a sort welcome to the kitchen it was a female peccary with her two little ones pencroff returned to granite house delighted with his prize and as usual made a great talk about it now we will have a good meal mr smith cried he and you too mr smilett must have some i shall be delighted said the reporter but what is it you want me to eat sucking pig said pencroff oh a sucking pig to hear you talk one would think you had brought back a stuffed partridge oh said pencroff so you turn up your nose at my sucking pig no answered spilett coolly provided one does not get too much of them very well mr reporter returned the sailor who did not like to hear his game disparaged you are getting fastidious seven months ago when we were cast upon this island you would have been only too glad to have come across such game well well said the reporter men are never satisfied and now continued pencroff i hope neb will distinguish himself let us see these little peccaries are only three months old they will be as tender as quail come neb i will superintend the cooking of them myself the sailor followed by neb hastened to the kitchen and was soon absorbed over the oven the two prepared a magnificent repast the two little peccaries kangaroo soup smoked ham pistachio nuts dragon tree wine oswego tea in a word everything of the best but the favorite dish of all was the savory peccaries made into a stew at five o'clock dinner was served in the dining-room of granite house the kangaroo soup smoked upon the table it was pronounced excellent after the soup came the peccaries which pencroff begged to be allowed to carve and of which he gave huge pieces to every one these sucking pigs were indeed delicious and pencroff plied his knife and fork with intense earnestness when suddenly a cry and an oath escaped him what's the matter said smith the matter is that i have just lost a tooth replied the sailor are there pebbles in your peccaries then said spilett it seems so said the sailor taking out of his mouth the object which had cost him a grinder it was not a pebble it was a leaden pellet end of volume one